Okay, the live has started. Sergeants, will you start your recording? Oh. Sergeant Jones, if you can just okay. uh, pause for one second, please. Thank you. Okay. PC recording has been paused. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We are experiencing some technical difficulties. Please stand by. We should be starting shortly. Thank you so much for your patience. Hey, Ter, you want to try your audio again? Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, clear. Yes. Okay. Sound good. All right. Okay. Chairman, uh, we, go ahead, sir. Sorry, sir. We, Chairman, we are live. The sergeants will start it off and then they'll kick it over to you. Great. All right. Okay. Sergeant Jones, please uh, go ahead with your uh, opening statements. Okay. Um, will all sergeants start with their recordings? You see, recording is underway. Okay. Cloud has started. Backup is rolling. And Sergeant Pedro, would you start with the opening statement, please? Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's fiscal year 2022 preliminary budget hearing of the Committee on General Welfare. 
At this time, would all panelists please turn on your video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices to vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chair Levin, we are ready to begin. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Gaveling in. Uh, top of the morning uh, to everybody. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, and I want to thank you all for joining the Committee on General Welfare's preliminary budget hearing today. Um, I want to acknowledge my colleagues who are here uh, this morning. House members um, Salamanca, uh, Rosenthal, and uh, who am I missing? And Gridenchik. Um, and I will uh, read my opening statement right now for the ACS portion of this hearing. Um, as you all know, there will be um, uh, three agencies testifying today. Um, uh, ACS will be going first, uh, then we'll be joined by uh, 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 HRA and uh, DHS as combined testimony as uh, DSS. Um, and then we will have testimony from the public. Um, so I am uh, going to begin this morning um, with uh, the statement, opening statement on uh, the ACS portion. Um, and I apologize, I've, I've pulled over to the side of the road to do this and I will then uh, set myself up during Commissioner Hansel's testimony. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Councilmember Stephen Levin, Chair of the Committee on General Welfare. I will begin today's hearing on the fiscal 22 preliminary budget and the 2021 preliminary mayor's management report or PMMR with the Administration for Children's Services or ACS. After ACS, we will hear from the Department of Social Services and finish with public testimony around one o'clock. I wanna welcome all the advocates and community members watching this live stream. And I wanna welcome back Commissioner Hansel, uh, Commissioner of ACS. It is a pleasure to continue to work with you, sir, and your staff. Uh, we have a relatively short amount of time today to review ACS's operations during COVID-19 and its budget plans for the future of children's services. Accordingly, I'll keep my comments here brief and request the commissioner keep his oral testimony to around 10 minutes so that we can move on to, uh, to council member question. ACS's fiscal 2022 preliminary budget is $2.65 billion, which does not reflect anticipated federal stimulus from the American Rescue Plan. There is much in flux as we move towards the adopted budget. And in general, I look forward to hearing from ACS about how they are planning for the future in the following ways. First, child welfare investigations, which is the core of ACS's operations. Uh, staffing is, is, the question is, is staffing appropriate given the administration's three out, one in attrition policy? And what does ACS expect when more of New York reopens, including schools that may potentially generate more calls to the SCR? Um, second, foster care. According to the PMMR, closures of family court have slowed the pace of reunifications and adoptions. Additionally, there is no funding for fair, fear, for fair futures in the preliminary budget, a key advocacy priority of mine and, uh, and the many young people in care seeking a fair chance at success. I would like to know how the administration will preserve fair futures and if it will be baseline in this year's adopted budget. Third, uh, child care vouchers, which ACS administers. New York State expects $1.8 billion in child care block grants, or CCBG, from the American Rescue Plan. I want to learn about where this money is going, the status of child care providers in the city, and how the budget supports child care providers safe and full reopening. This is a critical question as more and more New Yorkers return to in-person work, especially women. It is actually, it's a key component to our economic recovery is allowing for in-person child care so that people can get back to work. Fourth, preventive services, which also saw utilization drop during the pandemic. I'd like to know how ACS plans to get the preventive service programs back on track 
and what is budgeted to meet the health and financial needs of families resulting from COVID-19. I hope the fiscal 2022 budget includes more funding for family enrichment centers. Finally, we will discuss juvenile justice issues, which came under the jurisdiction of this committee late last year. ACS has seen its census of youth in secure detention rise by 56% from July of 2020 to March of 2021. ACS cannot release these young, these youth people, these, these youth on their own, but I would expect to know what the strategy is to stabilize the system and ensure trauma-informed community-based treatment whenever possible. I also want to ensure, or I also want to learn when construction will be finished at the two secure detention facilities, Horizon and Crossroads. The capital commitment plan includes $264.5 million between fiscal 21 and fiscal 25. I'd like to thank the committee staff who have helped prepare for this hearing, Daniel Krupp, Senior Financial Analyst, Dohini Sampora, Unit Head, Aminta Kilowan, Senior Counsel, Crystal Pond and Natalie Omery, Policy Analyst, and my own staff, my Chief of Staff, Jonathan Boucher, and my Legislative Director, Nicole Hunt. Um, Again, I want to uh, acknowledge my colleagues that are here, Councilmember Salamanca, um, Councilmember Rosenthal, Councilmember Prudential. We expect more council members to join the course of the hearing. And with that, uh, I'll turn it back over um, to the Sergeant and uh, Committee Council um, to swear in uh, administration officials. And I want to thank you all and, and welcome. Nice to see you. Thank you, Chair Levin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Aminta Kilowan, Senior Counsel to the Committee on General Welfare at the New York City Council. Today, I'm going to be moderating our hearing and calling on panelists to testify. Before we begin, please rem remember to everyone on the Zoom that we will be on mute until I call on you to testify. After you're called on, you will be unmuted by a member of our staff. Please note that there is a delay of a few seconds before you are unmuted and we can actually hear you. For public testimony, I'll be calling up individuals and panels. At that point, please listen for your name. I'll periodically announce the next few panelists. Once I call on your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. The Sergeant at Arms will set a clock and give you the go ahead to begin your testimony. Once we get there, all public testimony will be limited to three minutes. After I call your name, again, please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before you start your testimony. Now for today's hearing, the first panel will include representatives from the Administration for Children's Services, followed by council member questions and then testimony by the Department of Social Services. In order of speaking, we will have Commissioner David Hansel and joined for question and answers, Michael Moiseyev, Wynette Saunders, Dr. Jacqueline Martin, Julie Farber, and William Fletcher. I'm now going to administer the oath to the administration. When you hear your name, please respond once a member of our staff unmutes you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Commissioner Hansel. I do. Thank you, Commissioner. Deputy Commissioner Moiseyev. I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Saunders. I do. Thank you. Dr. Martin. I do. Thank you. Deputy Commissioner Farber. I do. And finally, Deputy Commissioner Fletcher. I do. Thank you. I will now call on Commissioner Hansel to begin testimony for ACS. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Levin, and please drive safely. Um, good morning, members of the Committee on General Welfare. Um, as I think all the members know by now, I am David Hansel, Commissioner of the New York City Administration for Children's Services, and I am delighted uh, to again appear before this committee as I begin my fifth year as ACS Commissioner. Um, with me today, as you've heard, are Michael Moiseyev, who is our Deputy Commissioner for Finance, William Fletcher, Deputy Commissioner for Child Protection, Dr. Jacqueline Martin, Deputy Commissioner for Prevention Services, um, and Julie Farber, Deputy Commissioner for Family Permanency Services, um, and also our soon-to-be first Deputy Commissioner, Wynette Saunders. Um, as you may know, after a 54-year career in child welfare, including seven in his current tenure at ACS, Eric Bretschneider, our current first Deputy Commissioner, is retiring. And we will all miss his wisdom, his insight, and his support, but I'm truly delighted that Wynette will become ACS's first Deputy Commissioner um, as of April 6th. We're very grateful for the opportunity to testify before the committee to reflect on how ACS has adapted over the past year 
to unprecedented cha challenges. Today, I will explain how ACS has continually met the needs of children and families, and how we're building on the lessons learned from the pandemic and from our national racial and social justice reckoning in order to transform and improve our work. I'm incredibly proud of the staff at ACS and our partner agencies who are true first responders carrying out the essential work of strengthening and supporting families, all while facing the uncertainty and fear that have been a constant part of managing the pandemic response. From the moment this crisis hit, ACS implemented targeted public health measures based on guidance from federal, state, and city health agencies and our own chief medical officer. We've provided tens of thousands of pieces of PPE to ACS frontline staff, to our contracted provider agency staff, and to children and families. And we've disseminated critical safety information to families. We've provided regularly updated guidance to our staff and providers. We've equipped staff and provider agencies and families with technology to work remotely uh, where possible. And we've ensured that essential child welfare staff and foster parents are eligible for emergency childcare. As soon as vaccines became available to New Yorkers, we successfully advocated for vaccine eligibility for our essential direct service staff at ACS and our contracted provider agencies. We are currently operating a designated vaccine pod for eligible ACS staff and their eligible family members. And now that youth ages 16 and older, if they are either living in congregate settings or have comorbidities or underlying health conditions are also eligible to be vaccinated, we and our provider agencies are obtaining the necessary consents and vaccine appointments for these youth. We are continuing to advocate to the state for all foster parents to become eligible for the vaccine. I'll now give a brief overview of the impact of COVID-19 on our core programs, uh, some updates on how we're addressing equity and racial disparities, and on major developments in our core program area, areas, and then we'll end by reviewing our current budget status. While 2020 was a year like no other, our core mission of keeping children safe and supporting families has not wavered. When we compare our 2020 data to prior years, we can see the dramatic impact of COVID-19. Overall, as compared with calendar year 2019, ACS conducted 24% fewer investigations in calendar year 2020, and the number of children who were placed in foster care decreased by 24%. The foster care census continued to decline to fewer than 7,700 children in December 2020. We've continued to emphasize earlier, more effective, and less intrusive interventions to keep children safe. Throughout the pandemic, we've prioritized our full continuum of successful prevention efforts, and we think this is where we should continue to invest as we emerge from the pandemic. Now, more than ever, families need concrete resources, access to supportive services, and stronger social connections. Early in the pandemic, we launched child safety campaigns to communicate a variety of information and resources to all New Yorkers. Coping Through COVID is aimed at supporting families through the pandemic, and Teens Take on COVID is targeted to providing resources to teens. As so many families and children have remained home for extended periods of time, our educational safety campaigns have focused on helping parents avoid tragic accidents and create safer home environments. We also provided concrete resources to help families in need, including food, clothing, diapers, formula, pack and plays, and many, many more things. In 2020, New Yorkers for Children and ACS established the COVID-19 Emergency Response Fund to address urgent family needs arising from the pandemic. We've intensified our efforts to make sure that families are connected with necessary supports in the least intrusive way possible. While ACS does not control the child abuse and neglect reports to the statewide central register, and we are legally mandated to respond once the SCR assigns a case to us, we are taking bold steps to avoid unnecessary investigations. We feel strongly that our collaborative assessment, response, engagement, and support, or our CARES differential response, where we are diverting lower risk cases from the traditional investigative path has enormous potential to provide families with support 
without the intrusion of an investigation. And despite the increase, the, I'm sorry, the decrease in overall reports, ACS increased the number of referrals to CARES by 6% from calendar year 19 to calendar year 20. We recently expanded CARES to every borough and we are now working to double the number of CARES units across the city. We must continue to do everything we can to make sure that children do not linger in foster care through regular and consistent family time between parents and children, through comprehensive service planning, through collaboration with attorneys for parents and children, and by expediting legal proceedings as family court operations more fully resume. While 2,482 children left foster care in calendar year 2020, and the vast majority of these were children returned home with their families, the foster care RFP that we will, will release this spring will further our goal to have more children in foster care achieve reunification more quickly. ACS continues to provide community-based services to youth and families that help minimize juvenile justice involvement. And to that end, in calendar year 2020, we served more than 900 youth through our evidence-based prevention models. While again, ACS is not directly involved in the court process that determines when youth come to prevention, come to detention, sorry, or how long they remain with us, we are concerned about the slowdown in case processing during the pandemic. Overall admissions to detention declined by 40% from calendar year 19 to 20, but we have seen average length of stay increase from 25 days in 2019 to 33 days in 2020. And so we continue to advocate for accelerated movement of court, court proceedings for youth. Our national experiences over the last year have brought the racial and social inequities in our communities into sharp focus. And they've highlighted the need for urgent attention to long present disparities in child welfare and juvenile justice, something I prioritized since becoming ACS commissioner. In 2017, I created our Office of Equity Strategies, which continues to drive forward our key strategies to reduce racial disproportionality and move forward as an anti-racist organization. The office holds every ACS division accountable to achieve more equitable outcomes for the children and families that they serve. And I'll discuss these agency-wide efforts in more detail shortly. We've worked to support both the viability of and access to the childcare continuum throughout the pandemic. From the very beginning, we secured monthly state waivers to ensure continued payments to childcare providers while children were absent or programs were closed, and to suspend family share fees and defer recertification requirements for families. More recently, we obtained a waiver from the state that prevents extra income that a family might receive due to COVID-19, such as hazard pay or overtime hours from counting against the family's income eligibility. We're maximizing our use of state and federal resources to expand childcare. Specifically, we're working to enroll more families who are eligible for federal child care block grants, block grant supported child care. While the city's FY 2021 budget did not allocate the same funding levels for special child care funded vouchers as in the previous year due to fiscal challenges, we have been able to move many families to federally supported vouchers to maintain their child care. Last year, we also coordinated with the Department of Education on a plan to restructure and lower fees for our lowest income families, including non-working families with no income. This resulted in lowering fees for families across the board. While parent fees are currently waived on an emergency basis during COVID-19, we know this will be important to families as a long-term measure as our communities and our economy recover. As of July, 2020, we were able to restore post-transitional childcare which allows eligible low-income families to continue their childcare once other public assistance benefits have ended. And we're currently working with our partners at DOE and DSS to streamline the application and eligibility determination process to expand access to childcare for families who are experiencing homelessness. We've also worked closely with DOE to ensure that the children of our essential workforce within ACS and our provider agencies, as well as foster parents, were eligible for DOE's regional enrichment centers when schools were fully remote and those families are now eligible for learning bridges. 
As families experience the prolonged social isolation and other challenges from COVID-19, we took steps to promote community connections and make sure that families knew where to turn for resources. We recently announced the results of our re-procurement of the three family enrichment centers and all three existing providers were selected. Good Shepherd in East New York, Graham Wyndham in Hunts Point Longwood and Children's Village Bridge Builders in Highbridge. The FECs overlap with three of our 11 community partnerships, which are community-based planning groups that emphasize connections to local services. With this strong community infrastructure in place, we've continued to empower families by offering support and concrete resources. For example, the FECs and the partnerships have provided food to families in need. They've offered technology and other assistance to support remote learning, and they're maintaining a strong online social presence with virtual offerings. All of this keeps families connected during a, a very challenging time and supports child safety and well being at home. The over reporting of Black and Latinx families to the SCR is an area of great concern to us because it introduces significant racial disproportionality at the front door of our child protective system. The SCR is a lifeline for children at risk, but all New Yorkers have a collective duty to make sure child protective investigations are sought and used only when there is a true concern for the safety of a child. The majority of SCI reports come from mandated reporters such as educators and health professionals. Since the start of the pandemic, we've collaborated with DOE to develop guidance that makes clear that if a family is struggling with technology or other COVID-19 related challenges unrelated to child safety, schools should work with the family to provide the assistance necessary to facilitate the child's attendance without calling the SCR. And similarly, we've been working very closely with DOHMH and health and hospitals so that hospital and medical staff understand the impact SCR reporting has on families and to clarify that reports should be made only when there is a concern about a child's safety. We and our sister agencies have been reiterating to health professionals that if a parent or child tests positive for a substance when the child is born, hospital staff should not call the SCR solely based on a positive test and that medical professionals can and should make service referrals without contacting the SCR. We're continuing to advocate for additional reforms that we believe are necessary to reduce unnecessary investigative involvement for families, including a proposal that our own CPS have called for, requiring implicit bias training for mandated reporters like teachers, doctors, and social workers. This training is already in place for our staff, and we're currently pursuing state legislation to help make sure all mandated reporters are trained to reflect on and guard against implicit biases. At the height of the pandemic, we completed our first re-procurement of prevention services in over a decade, with 119 new contracts in place on time by July 1st, 2020. I wanna thank everyone who worked tirelessly to make that happen. Prevention services belong to all New York City families who may need support. So we're dedicated to establishing universal family access to every service model we provide when they need help and wherever they live. We've also infused more uh, parent feedback into the prevention services array and into services themselves. The service offerings were designed with input from parents and providers are expected to work collaboratively with families to set goals and develop service plans so that services reflect what families want and need. The new system explicitly addresses racial equity by requiring providers to incorporate efforts to address racial disparity in their organization and service provision, and by including racial equity committees that include all levels of staff representation. Through the procurement of new foster care contracts that will begin with the release of the RFP this spring, will scale best practices and proven strategies to improve safety, permanency, and well-being outcomes for New York City children and families. We and our foster care provider agencies have continually adapted to support children and families throughout the pandemic while also developing new partnerships and innovative approaches. For example, due to significant limitations in access to the family courts during the pandemic, we took steps outside of the normal court process to move towards more family reunifications from foster care. We launched proactive reviews of the cases 
of more than 3,350 children in foster care who have a goal of reunification to determine if these cases could move forward to increase visiting with birth families, predisposition release, trial discharge, or final discharge. In those cases that could move forward, our Division of Family Court Legal Services attorneys worked with the parents and children's attorneys to secure court approval as needed. In fall 2020, we launched a new parent advocate pilot called Parents Supporting Parents to improve reunification and race equity outcomes. The parent advocates will be on staff at Graham Wyndham and Rising Ground as central members of case planning teams where they'll receive training, coaching, and professional development from both RISE and in collaboration with their foster care agencies to fully empower these parent advocates to leverage their lived experience as credible messengers when working with families and agencies. This initiative builds on our work to incorporate parent advocates into decision-making processes across the child welfare system. The new foster care parent advocates will be crucial allies to help dismantle bias, strengthen parents' self-advocacy and voice within the foster care process, and help foster care agencies shift their organizational culture to more authentic parent engagement approaches. The pilot supported with funds from major national and local foundations, and the lessons we learn will lay the groundwork for full implementation through the forthcoming RFP with a parent advocate assigned to every parent with a goal of reunification. As the council and Chair Levin have championed, we've provided funding to implement Fair Futures, which includes coaches, tutors, and education, employment, and housing specialists, among, among other supports for older youth. The Fair, through Fair Futures, our goal is to help youth prepare for major transitions, including the transitions for, between middle school and high school, as well as the transition from high school to college, vocational training, and or a fulfilling career. Through Fair Futures, we support young people in the achievement of key milestones that put them on a path to success while we continue to work aggressively towards permanency. As we testified to this committee just last month, ACS and our partners in juvenile justice are fully committed to strengthening New York City's ability to work with at-risk and justice-involved youth in ways that are trauma-informed and youth-centered. Our juvenile justice system safely serves youth in the community whenever possible, and with appropriate structure and supports in place. We oversee services and programs for youth at every stage of the juvenile justice continuum, including community-based services, secure and non-secure detention services, and close to home programs. We're preparing to procure new close to home contracts, starting with a concept paper to be issued this fall. And we look forward to input from the council and other stakeholders and partners in this work. And now to our budget. Our fiscal year 2022 budget is $2.65 billion, including $851.8 million in city tax level levy funding. Given the city's fiscal concerns, our January savings plan is $36.3 million in city tax levy for FY 2021. And we have an additional $9 million in savings for FY 2022. Reflecting ACS's and the city's commitment to the critical ACS functions that keep children safe and support families, there are no program cuts to ACS in the FY22 preliminary budget. We met our FY21 January savings plan targets without significant program reductions, although some reductions will require modifications to program operations. Our adjustments were achieved through overtime savings, through the citywide hiring and attrition plan, which will be implemented to minimize impact on frontline staff and through the use of prior year revenue. While we are tremendously, tremendously heartened by an action, enactment of the Federal American Rescue Plan, we do remain concerned about proposed state cuts that hurt, hurt the most vulnerable children and families in New York City. Over the past few years, ACS has seen the state consistently pull back its support of the children, youth, and families that we serve in the child welfare and juvenile justice system. And on top of this previous disinvestment, the proposed state budget would lead to an additional annualized cut of over $38 million to ACS at a time when children and families are already struggling. The state is proposing cuts that would effectively shift costs to the city for our portfolio of services. The budget proposes to cut the reimbursement rate 
for the Child Welfare Services funding stream that supports our prevention work from 62% to 59%, and to cut the rates for adoption subsidies and detention. There's also a proposal to cut the foster care black block grant by $11.2 million statewide, which would be a $5.7 million annualized cut to New York City. The last year has shown that New York City and New Yorkers are resilient, creative, and able to adapt to ever-changing conditions while maintaining and enhancing our standing as a national progressive leader. At ACS, we adhere to those same values. We thank the council for the opportunity to testify and we are happy to take your questions. Thank you, Commissioner Hansel, for your testimony. Before I turn to Chair Levin for questions, I'd like to remind council members to use the raise hand function in Zoom to indicate whether you have a question for this panel. And please remember council members to keep your questions and the answers to five minutes. Now I'm going to turn it over to Chair Levin. Thank you very much, uh, Council Kilowan, and thank you, Commissioner Hansel. Um, I, I appreciate um, the thoroughness of your of your testimony. Um, first question I have is kind of a it's uh, not necessarily a, a budget question, but um, you can speak to it in the budget context. Um, I, you know, can you give us a picture of um, the number of, of child protective services during COVID, um, particularly as it relates to the amount of SCR calls that have come in, how CPS staff has been um, a, functioning, doing their doing their job, able to do investigations, and um, um, you know one aspect of this that I'm that I'm very interested in, and I think it presents this. Um, uh, this question that I think a lot of us wrestle with and we're wrestling with prior to the pandemic, but now, um, you know, provides, a, you know, our experience over the last year provides a different perspective on this is, um, you know, whether, whether our structure of, of um, mandated reporters calling the SCR for a variety of um, neglect, allegations um, or suspected abuse allegations, whether that's the most effective way to keep our children safe. Um, and how this past year's experience has, in, has kind of informed um, how we think about that. And, um, uh, you, know, I mean, you know, basically have we been able to keep our kids safe in New York City without those points of contact with mandated reporters at such a significant level as we've had in the past. Um, how have we kept kids safe when they're not being seen by guidance counselors and teachers every day? Yeah, uh, Chair Levin, thank you very much for the question. That's, that's something we have been giving a lot of thought to uh, at ACS. And I think as we emerge from the pandemic, it's one of the most important questions we need to answer about the future of the child welfare system. So let me say a few things and then I will also uh, give Deputy Commissioner Fletcher an opportunity to speak to the work that his division has done. Um, so first thing I will say is, as I said in the testimony, I am incredibly proud of our child protective specialists. Um, their work is always difficult, but it has never been more difficult than over the past year. Um, and yet they never stopped. We never stopped doing investigations 24 seven. We never stopped doing the work we needed to do to keep children safe. We never stopped doing the work we needed to do to make sure that families were connected with services and supports that they needed. Um, our child protective specialists have been in the field consistently through the pandemic uh, at, at, you know, as we know, while they were dealing with, you know, um, as we all were with a great deal of personal emotional turmoil and in some cases, personal tragedies. Um, so uh, we of course had to change the procedures significantly to make sure we were protecting staff protecting parents. We implemented all the public health guidance around social distancing, PPE, and so on to make sure everybody was safe. But we continued to do the work that we needed to do to keep kids safe and to support families. 
Um, and we will, of course, will continue to do that. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, when the schools closed uh, just over a year ago, um, we saw initially a very dramatic decline in reports to the state central registry, about a 51% decline uh, last March. That actually has, that number has actually come up back up again significantly over the last year, um, but not quite to normal levels. So we actually, if, if we look at sort of a longer period of time, we've looked at the period between July and December of last year, a six month period where we feel like uh, probably more representative uh, of the pandemic. And what we saw during that six month period is that our level of report, SCR reporting actually was about 16% below what it had been the year before. That is comparison, comparing 2020 to 2019. So not, not nearly as dramatic a drop as we had seen early in the pandemic, but still significant. But when we actually uh, sort of uh, parsed be, uh, that in greater detail, we saw something very interesting, which was that the reports from mandated reporters from 2019 to 2020 dropped by about 24%. But the reports from non-mandated reporters, which as you know, include uh, community members, family members, neighbors, uh, and friends and others, actually remained almost exactly level, uh, which actually meant proportionally, we were getting more reports from non-mandated reporters, community members, family members, and so on, than we had been receiving in, in last year and in previous years. So that suggests to us, although we have obviously a lot more work to do, but that does suggest to us that we need to look very closely at the mandated reporter system and the, and the, um, the criteria under which mandated reporters do report um, to see what we can learn from the fact that uh, it was really on the mandated side of the system that we saw a significant decline. And while it's, you know, it's hard to prove a negative, um, mm -hmm. we, you know, we have been very vigilant throughout the last year um, to look for any indications that we were missing kids who were in trouble that we were missing kids who were uh, being abused or neglected. And we didn't really see them. We didn't see, uh, we didn't see for example, a change in the proportion of reports coming in towards more serious reports of uh, physical abuse. Um, we didn't see more you know, uh, ER visits for physical abuse. We didn't, see, we didn't really see anything to suggest us that we were missing a significant number of children who were at, at serious risk. So I think that does mean we have to think very closely about what this tells us and that's one of the reasons why we're very focused. And I mentioned a few of the things that we are already advocating for and have worked on, on the mandated reporter side of the system to make sure that mandated reports are, are being used when they should be, which is when children are truly uh, at risk of, of safety concerns, but not when they uh, are, should not be used. And that's why we've been working very closely, as I said, with DOE, uh, especially in the remote learning context, because we did not want technology problems uh, fundamentally to become child welfare issues for families they shouldn't mm -hmm. and we work mm -hmm. very closely with doe on that and we've been very working very closely with the healthcare system um, to make sure that uh, issues that really are about services that family may, may need could be substance abuse services could be healthcare services again that they do not become child welfare issues unless there are genuine concerns about child safety um, so i think you know we're continuing to analyze the data um, but i think uh, we're learning some interesting things that uh, can lead us to, to think about reforms, especially in the mandated reporter system as we go forward. Um, and I would, if, if I could give, like to give Dr. Commissioner Flesher an opportunity to say a little bit about the work that his team has done. Thank you, Commissioner. I think you're unmuted, Deputy Commissioner. Now I am. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Chair Levin. Um, so thank you, Commissioner, um, for highlighting um, a lot of the work that our CPS have endured um, during this pandemic. And I want to thank you, Chair Levin, um, for raising this, you know, the concern around how our child protective specialists have been doing their job um, since entering this pandemic in March of 2020. Um, and it's been a challenge. And as our commissioner noted in, in his testimony, um, that we are proud of our CPS, you know, because they are truly first responders, because they pivoted quickly 
quickly based on knowing what they probably were going to face going out to ensure that our children, the children of New York City were, are safe, they went out there without pause, right? And it's it was a difficult challenge because again, our child protective specialists must balance child safety mandates um, with the families we serve, as well as their own physical and psychological safety, right? That became a very challenging thought for them as they endured, but they became the lifeline, as the commissioner also noted in his testimony, for our families that were in need of resources, in need of concrete resources. Um, because as they got out there to do their assessments, um, families, because many of them were sheltering at home, um, you know, had trepidation and going out in community. Um, so there were food issues, they were um, procuring pampers, um, formula, our CPS were able to make that connect um, in order to serve those needs of the families. The other thing that helped our CPS to be able to do their job um, efficiently um, was technology. Right, and we were very fortunate that prior to the pandemic, this was yeah. one of the commissioner's priorities and making sure that our our CPS frontline had smartphones as well as tablets. Right? I remember, I remember yes. visiting with them and and uh, them being very enthusiastic about the tablets uh, yes. about two years ago. Yeah. Exactly. So it really went a long way, so that as they went out in the field. Um, and did their initial assessment, they were able to remain connected with families through um, technology. Because many of our families, as you know, do have smartphones and they do have the WhatsApp app um, and similar platforms. So that has helped them tremendously. Um, but our CPS, you know, they ran into um, the, the communities um, without hesitation, um, as well as they were able to efficiently continue to do their work because of the technology that we currently had in place, we were able to quickly pivot to getting a lot of the work that they have to do as it relates to documentation into the system as quickly as they could so they can make sound assessments in keeping children safe. Yeah. So yeah, it, 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 absolutely. Yeah, it, 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 it definitely bears noting um, that, you know, they were frontline workers um, that uh, during the during the, the, the most, um, uh, you know, critical points in the pandemic, they they had to keep do, they had to keep showing they couldn't work from home. Um, they were, they were frontline. Yes. Um, and I think I, I, I obviously, you know, um, you know, ACS has a has a um, I think a, a data team that is second to none, and and it, it's it's um, uh, I think that there's a lot that that we can be learning from um, from the data as, as as you both spoke about, and I think that this is um, uh, you know this really amazing opportunity. We just I, one thing that um, jumped out at me, Commissioner, what you said about um, the pr proportion of of non-mandated reporters calls coming in from non-mandated reporters was interesting because it, it, it kind of, uh, to me shows that the communities kind of st are st step in um, to, to meet those needs um, in a, a way that, um, you know, kind of in the, highlighting the communities kind of, we, we know how to keep ourselves safe as communities and, um, uh, these weren't, you know, because these weren't calls coming in, you know, out of fear of repercussions, right? These were calls coming in, you know, I think that that's always a, a consideration or a challenge with, with the mandated reporter system is that people are making calls because they don't want to be blamed later on if something were to go wrong. Um, and so um, this is something that we should continue to talk about. And I'm, I'm eager to continue to talk about for the, you know, the remainder, remainder of my tenure um let's share this committee with you because i think that there's a lot to delve into here um out of the fifty thousand plus calls the scr every year um you know really trying to understand um uh what's the best way to keep our kids safe um and i do want to know um you know this the, the tragic passing of of um of, of aiden wolf um in, in 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 the last couple of weeks in in um in the city and, and our and our heart goes out to that little boy and 
um, and his family and his loved ones. I know that there's, uh, you know, not that much that you're able to say because there's an active investigation going on. Um, but um, it, 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 um, it broke my, my heart to, uh, to read the accounts of the um, abuse that he suffered. Um, and, um, and uh, it, it, you know, it, 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 I think makes us uh, examine what we're doing and, and, and what we can be doing, continue to do better um, to protect children in the city. Yeah, thank um, you. If I may just, uh, I, sure. I certainly, I think all New Yorkers have mourned with, with, uh, with Aiden's family and we certainly have at ACS. Um, and I think, you know, if, if there's anything we can learn from, from tragedies like that, it's exactly what you said, which is child safety is everyone's responsibility. Um, it's responsibility of the community. And so uh, I think you said it very well, Chair Levin, which is the community has really stepped up during this pandemic to make sure that we are collectively keeping children safe. And we want to encourage um, people to continue to do that. Thank you. Um, so I want to uh, uh, pivot to kind of some bigger, bigger um, uh, budget questions here. Um, uh, you mentioned the state executive budget proposing $38 million in cuts to ACS. Um, but the American Rescue Plan is now bringing $1.8 billion in child care block grant funding alone. Um, is, do you think that the, the, the uh, preliminary budget as presented by the administration, is it still accurate? And um, how have you started to um, uh, process the, um, the American Rescue Plan, plan funding, um, particularly as it relates to, to CCBG and um, how, um, what do you think are the areas of opportunity in terms of um, uh, allocating those resources to, to bolster our communities? Mm -hmm. uh, let me uh, say a few things and then uh, Deputy Commissioner Moiseev may want to elaborate. Um, so first of all, as I said, we are very, very excited about the American Rescue Plan and, and the impact that I, I very much hope it's gonna have. Uh, on our budget situation here. Um, obviously, you know, the ink on the plan is barely dry, so we don't yet know uh, in any detail what it's gonna mean, but I, I, I guess there are really three, three areas where I hope it will make a difference. First of all, um, the state, both the state and the city are gonna receive direct funding uh, as you know, all states and localities around the country will. Um, I very much hope that, uh, that that new funding the state will receive um, will lead to a rethinking of the cuts that the governor proposed. We were very happy to see that the one house bills that were released uh, by both houses of the legislature um, just a couple of days ago uh, would restore some of the cuts the governor proposed. Um, I would certainly hope that the American Rescue Plan funding uh, will influence that discussion. And so um, I hope it will have an impact on the final state budget in a way that will uh, not result in cuts uh, to any of our core programs. Um, the city also is receiving direct funding and we don't yet know what that's gonna mean. Uh, I would imagine that uh, that, will, that impact will be reflected in, in the mayor's proposed executive budget in a couple of months, but uh, until, until we have that information, we don't really know yet what it's gonna mean um, specifically for our, our overall program. But as you pointed out, in addition to the general funding going to the state and city, there is a specific infusion of childcare funding, the childcare block grant. Um, we know, as you said, we know the amount going to the state. We do not know yet how the state is going to distribute it. Um, the state has to decide how to allocate it to New York City and uh, the other uh, 58 counties around the state. So we don't know what that will mean. We don't know how much money we'll be receiving, but we certainly can anticipate that we will be getting a significant infusion of, of child care funding, federal. And so uh, in anticipation of that, we have begun to plan for how we might use that funding to expand eligibility, uh, to families and to expand the benefits that families receive. And so I think as soon as we know what our allocation is, um, I think we'll be well positioned to come forward with a set of proposals as to how we will use that additional federal child care money to expand child care access and eligibility for families. And uh, that's a conversation that I hope we'll be having with you and the council very soon. Do you have an expectation of when you might be hearing from um, your counterparts in, in the state government about this? Uh, we don't know for sure. Uh, the Office of Children and Family Services will have to make, actually, um, we are still waiting to hear from OCFS about the allocation of 
the last tranche of funding that was provided in the December stimulus package. We still haven't gotten that guy. That's not yet. good. So uh, we're hoping that they will move a little bit more quickly on on this 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 package. And uh, uh -huh. uh, we know, I mean, we know there's some very complicated issues they have to work through, but um, sure. I hope we'll get that guidance very soon. Right. Um, I mean, New York City represents probably 40 percent of the children in the state. So, um, you know, it's it's it, it, I certainly urge will be urging uh, my state colleagues to um, to act with, you know, all deliberate haste on that. Um, uh, I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues because I, I know we want to keep as close to on track as possible here. So I'm going to turn it over to Councilmember Salamanca for questions. Chair, I'm getting my notes together. Is it possible you can go to the next council member and I can go right after them? Of course. Yeah. Thank you. I guess that I'm not sure that there is another council member with questions. Do, do any of my colleagues have questions? Other colleagues? Okay, I'll, I'll continue with my questions. Um, um, Headcount reduction. Um, oh, I just want to acknowledge council members Gibson, Lander, Diaz, and Riley. Uh, and, and anyone uh, that has questions, please feel free to, to raise your hand. Um, uh, the the fiscal 22 preliminary budget removes 75 full time positions, leaving um, uh, 7,249 positions. Um, this year budget loses, so this would be the, the FY 21 budget, um, 308 positions as a result of a peg. Um, so that's you know that's that's pretty significant. That's about five percent. How is ACS preserving? I'm sorry, not. No, not 5%. No, no, yeah, 5%, 5%. How's ACS uh, preserving frontline positions in spite of attrition pegs? And where are the positions coming from, these attrition positions? Well, let me say a couple of things and then I will turn it to Deputy Commissioner Moiseev to talk in detail because he's been working very closely with OMB on this. Uh, and I will say, um, as we work through um, how we were going to meet our peg target and how we were going to implement the reductions, um, we worked very closely with OMB to make sure that it did not impact core operations. And I'm, I'm I'm confident that's the case. Um, the most significant thing I, I will say is that uh, despite the, the reduction in overall headcount and the headcount peg, and of course the, you know, the one to three uh, attrition plan, um, we uh, have been able to move forward with hiring our essential frontline staff categories outside of those limitations. So um, we are continuing to be able to hire uh, child protective specialists. In fact, we have a new class starting in May um, we continue to be able to hire youth development specialists in our detention program, uh, family court legal services attorneys and special officers. So um, while we are operating under the citywide constraints of, of the PEG and of the one to three uh, attrition, um, we have been able to fill frontline positions outside of that. Uh, but let me ask uh, Deputy Commissioner Moiseev to elaborate. Uh, thanks so much, Commissioner. Uh, so the uh, PEG was calculated by explicitly excluding those frontline positions. And that, that's very important to us. So essentially we are continuing a uh, uh, kind of full steam ahead hiring on those frontline positions. The 308 reduction comes from a combination of existing vacancies that were there uh, in January and anticipated future vacancies for the remainder of the year. They come from a mix of uh, uh, various support positions, and we certainly do have to make adjustments in how we do business as an agency to uh, get by on lower levels of hiring. But uh, like the commissioner said very critically, we do not believe there will be any programmatic effect from these reductions. Okay, and obviously let's uh, keep us informed as as um, as you move forward with um, and, and, you know, understanding whether some of those um, pegs can be reversed or, you know, mitigated in the future as a result of the American Rescue Plan. Um, uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Councilmember Salamanca for questions. Time starts now. Uh, you're on mute. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Um, Commissioner, very, uh, very quickly, I just have some few questions that I would like to ask you. 
So I have the Horizon Detention Center in my council district. Um, and I, 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 I've, uh, I've spoken to you many times. I've spoken to your team. We're having an issue with the employees that report to ACS who are double and triple parking in front of the Horizon Detention Center, which are causing um, major issues in terms of safety issues um, for pedestrians and, 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 and both drivers. Um, when, they, when, they, when they raised the age, you know, I was, I was extremely supportive of this uh, project uh, in terms of bringing the adolescents over to the Horizon Detention Center. And I got a commitment from your administration and from your agency that you are going to address this. And it has not been addressed. I was wondering if you can speak on that. Yeah, council member, I, I appreciate your concern about this. You have brought it to me as recently as about a week or so ago, um, which I appreciate because um, when you did, and as you have previously, um, I reiterate to our leadership in our Division of Youth and Family Justice um, and our leadership on the ground at Horizon um, that staff cannot double park or triple park at Horizon. That's not acceptable. Um, and they in turn make sure that that is that information is, is reiterated and reinforced with staff during roll call and every shift to make sure it doesn't happen. Um, we have, I, I believe since you brought it to my attention most recently, um, my understanding is we've, is we've corrected it. In fact, I actually uh, just checked today to make sure and I understand uh, that the situation is corrected today, uh, but we will continue to be vigilant to make sure it doesn't happen. Um, and I hope if it does, I hope it won't, but if it does, I hope you will continue to bring it to our attention um, and our, you know, our, our hope is, and we would love to work with you on this if it's possible, is that we can find other parking resources in the community um, for those staff who, who do need to drive, uh, who don't have access to public transportation from where they live. Um, and if we could work with you to help identify those and, and obtain those, that would be our, you know, our, our long-term solution to the problem. But we realize even without that, uh, double parking is not acceptable and we will continue to emphasize that to staff. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner. It's not just double and triple parking. They're also parking on a sidewalk. Uh, so it's like, I can't walk on the street and I can't walk on a sidewalk. Um, my next question here is how many adolescents do you currently have housed at, at Horizon Detention Center? Uh, if you give me just a moment, I can give you actually our current, obviously the census varies from day to day, but I think I can give you the current census in just a moment. And while, and while you look for that information, what's the average stay for every, you know, the average stay this past year for the adolescents? And what's the cost to house them yearly? So um, our, uh, our detention census as of yesterday at Horizon was a total of 28, uh, 28 youth at, at Horizon. Um, length of stay, I actually spoke to in the testimony. Um, and as, as I mentioned, it has, um, and this is a concern to us, it has increased um, because of a real slowdown in court process. Um, as you know, uh, the, de the decision to place a child in detention is not made by us, it's made by the, the court, uh, usually the family court. Uh, in some cases, it might be the, um, the, adult, uh, the adult courts. Um, and uh, they choose whether, or determine whether the child is placed in secure detention, which would be Horizon or Crossroads, or one of our non-secure detention facilities that are operated by uh, nonprofit partners. So we, we don't control kids coming in, we don't control kids leaving, um, but it concerns us that the length of stay has increased. It has been in 2020, the average length of stay in secure detention was 33 days, which was an increase of I think five days from what it had been in the year before. And we very, very much hope that the court process will resume um, so that I, th we, I think, you know, the court, young people have a right to have their, their cases heard expeditiously in court. Uh, they should not linger in detention any longer than necessary. And we hope that the courts will resume normal processing very soon. All right. So, Commissioner, uh, all right. So, I, I understand that um, why there was uh, an extended stay, but what's the average cost per child, per adolescent that's being held there? Uh, I will actually turn, I don't know if Deputy Commissioner Moiseev knows that off the top of his head. If not, we will get back to you with that information. I mean, that, that's, go ahead, I'm sorry. Deputy. No, no, we'll, we'll have to get back to you. I'm sorry, I'm gonna try to- I mean, but this is a budget notes. hearing. You should have that information, you, you know? I, I just don't understand. Like, you're, you're at, we're reviewing your annual budget. You should know how much it costs to, uh, to, to house an adolescent, daily and yearly in, in, in Horizon Detention Center. Um, I'm, 
All right, Mr. Chair, my time is up, but I'll, I'll come back for a second round. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Salamanca. Um, I also want to acknowledge, um, sorry, excuse me, uh, uh, Councilor Gredenchik for questions, and we've been joined by Councilmember Heim Deutsch. Good morning, everybody. Uh, good morning, Commissioner. Um, thank you, Chair. Uh, I have been sitting here listening. It's it's um, been a very long year, Commissioner, and I want to thank you and uh, your entire team for the work that you've done. Uh, I just I. I I was sitting here thinking and um, didn't have an initial question, but I do have one now. And I'm wondering, um, are you working, and I know you work with DOE, I'm sure you do. Um, you know, this has been a, a the most traumatic year of, of all our lives. Um, people are continuing to get sick. Um, and uh, as we emerge from this pandemic and children begin to go back to school, um, do you have any special plans in place to work with the DOE to ensure that um, we look after the welfare of these children um, and and figure a way that um, those that need special attention can get that attention? I'm wondering if, if uh, ACS has um, wandered down that road yet. So I would I would love to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, thank you, Councilor, for that question. Um, it has this is this issue the issue of. Uh, how we work with the DOE has been a particularly challenging one over the last year. I talked about it a little bit in my testimony. Um, you know, when, when the schools went fully remote in March, um, uh, we knew that that was gonna change the relationship that DOE had with students. Um, and then of course, we've seen a lot, of, you know, a lot of changes over the last year in terms of kids being in school, out of school, different schedules. Um, very excited that, that uh, you know, uh, as of next week, high schools will be reopening. So. Uh, all kids in New York City will have at least some opportunity for in-person learning. Um, we do, uh, in normal times, we do rely on the Department of Education um, to be essentially eyes and ears for child safety. Obviously, in normal times, uh, teachers and school personnel see kids as regularly as really just about anybody. Um, usually, Even more than their parents basis. sometimes. <laughs> well, <laughs> in some cases, that might be true. So we do count on them to, uh, to identify true child safety concerns and report them to us. Um, and they do that. We were concerned during COVID uh, when children were, were um, learning remotely, especially at the beginning, when I think we all know there were some significant challenges for families to keep their kids connected, didn't have technology, didn't have Wi-Fi, uh, didn't have broadband. Um, v v concerned A, that um, those challenges were corrected, and I think DOE has worked very hard to do that. But concern B, that those technology challenges not become child welfare issues or child safety issues. And so um, we actually worked with a DOE initially on guidance they issued back in April of last year, uh, when things were still fully remote, about how their teachers and other staff should distinguish between true child safety issues and other issues that were really about technology or connectivity um, or support that really DOE was responsible for handling. And we, when things in the fall began to shift again a little bit, we worked with them to reissue that, uh, that guidance. So we'll continue to monitor that as the schools reopen. Um, and our goal will be to make sure that, uh, that DOE continues to partner with us to be a, um, a, you know, a set of eyes and ears in, in for, for true child safety concerns, because we wanna make sure we know about those um, but also that they will continue to work with families uh, to make sure kids have the resources they need so that they can, they can fully participate in educational programs. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I know that we'll be hearing from the new chancellor at the preliminary budget on education, I think toward the end of next week, if I remember correctly. Um, so I will press that uh, on that day. Uh, and I thank you again for all your work. Uh, Chair Levin, thank you for indulging me. Of course. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Gredenchik. Um, do any of my other colleagues have questions? Uh, please raise your hands if you do. Um, and I will go back to uh, my list of questions. Um, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, family enrichment centers. Um, you mentioned that they were um, uh, uh, RFP'd, um, how many, so there are three family enrichment centers in the city. Um, Correct. how many, um, 
how many family enrichment centers? Um, I guess two questions. First is, um, how have you seen them working in, during COVID? I mean, here was a, uh, a model that was developed prior to COVID, um, which in a lot of ways I see as having, you know, the, the moment, the times have kind of caught up to that model in the sense that, you know, having a, a, a location centrally located in, in a high need community that has, you know, an array of resources that are, um, you know, available to communities in a, um, you know, in a non-mandated way. So there's no coercion, there's nothing that's um, um, you know, uh, uh, forcing people to be there. Um, uh, but I've seen, you know, mayoral candidates uh, proposing um, enrichment centers, community enrichment centers, which seem to, 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 um, to, to track very closely to uh, how the FECs have been working. So first off, how have you seen them uh, working during COVID and second, um, would you like to see more? Uh, would you like to see more FECs around the city? And do you have potential partners for those that, uh, if we were to be able to expand it? Well, I, honestly, I would say that the FECs have truly proven their value <laughs> during the pandemic. Um, they, you know, the original model of the FECs, which we put in place in 2017, was, and we have three of them, as you said, was that they would be co-created with families in each community. We didn't want to assume cookie cutter approach. We didn't want to assume uh, family needs were the same. Uh, and so each of the three organizations, uh, provider organizations that, that ran uh, one of the FECs worked with local community members to design the services that they wanted and needed. And so each of them, they all look different. All three look different mm -hmm. from each other, even before COVID, um, because they put in place a, a sort of a suite of programs and services to meet the needs that the families had presented to them. What we saw during COVID, not, I don't think this will be to anybody's surprise, was that families' needs um, pivoted pretty quickly to concrete services, um, food, uh, childcare, um, technology so kids could do remote learning, you know, all those kinds of things that we know all families in New York City have been challenged with. And so the, the, the FEC model, and this is I think one of the hallmarks of it, is, is flexible enough that the FECs were able to very quickly pivot to providing the kind of concrete services that families needed. Um, and so um, I really don't think it's a, an overstatement to say that the FECs were really a lifeline to families in their communities in Highbridge and uh, Hunts Point in East New York uh, during the pandemic because they were able to quickly uh, you know, rearrange what they were doing to meet the needs that families had. And, We'll continue to do that, obviously, as we emerge from the pandemic. The other thing, and this is sort of coincidental, but it happened to be during the pandemic that we um, released the results of the first evaluation that we've done of the FEC model. Um, and it too was very positive. It indicated uh, that uh, the FECs had um, overall, the majority of families reported that uh, their involvement with the FECs had improved family functioning, had improved their social and emotional attachment with their children, um, and had strengthened their social connections in their communities. So we also now have evaluation data showing that the model um, is, is working and meeting the needs of families. So um, I think it has, is, it has functioned well during COVID and I think it really has proven its, its value during COVID. Um, That's great. I just say that I, I, I wanna also acknowledge the work that uh, former Deputy Commissioner Vargas did uh, in setting these up um, um, and and it, that they were created from, from the ground up. I mean, they were created from the ground up. There was no pre-existing model to, to go off of. And so, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, I think that that deserves to be acknowledged. Sorry, do, you, do any of you, the deputy commissioners want to speak on it? Uh, deputy Commissioner Martin, perhaps? All right, it looks as though I'm unmuted. Yes. Yeah. Um, so uh, not a tremendous amount to add to what the commissioner has already said, uh, but we do believe that this is the right model uh, to reach so many of our families. Uh, you know, it's been stated, uh, our families in communities, we know for over 30, 30 plus years now, we've been invested in prevention services. And so the FECs really give us an opportunity to reach families before harm occurs. 
and that is basically our intent, right? We know that these families exist in the communities. And so I, I think uh, it's a model, as the commissioner said, that is proven effective. Um, and I certainly believe that what works uh, is where we should, uh, you know, continue to focus and expand. I think that's the right thing for the children and families of New York City. Thank you. So it, um, it, by expand, uh, do, would you uh, be, would be open to, if, if some of those federal dollars are available to um, additional sites um, in the city, so meeting some, some uh, new neighborhoods outside of the three that have already been, um, have already been established? Um, I, I, is that a question for me or should Commissioner have Either to anybody can answer. I'm happy, happy to take that. Um, well, the first thing, first thing probably to say, which is important to say is at this point, um, the FECs are funded 100% with city tax levy. Uh, the state provides no support and the federal child care funding streams, including the one we're about to start uh, receiving in New York later this year, the Family First uh, Prevention Services Act, none of them support the primary prevention model that the FECs represent. So this is at this point, this is uh, carried entirely by New York City. Um, we, uh, you know, so we, maybe some uh, of the federal money could could supplant some of the existing CTL and prevention that could then be moved towards primary prevention, maybe. That's certainly theoretically possible. Um, we know we picked, I mean, when we, when we, when we started the, the FECs, and I think Dr. Martin really kind of spoke to this, our goal was obviously was to serve communities, but our also a goal was to prevent involvement with the child welfare system. Our mm -hmm. hypothesis, and I think it's, it's it, we don't have, you know, as, as solid data as we'd like, but I think it's, it's, it's proving out is that if we invest in communities, if we invest in the services families need, we'll reduce involvement with child welfare. Um, mm -hmm. We picked three communities initially back, you know, three, four years ago, uh, from which we had historically received high levels of uh, SCR reports, child welfare reports. They're certainly not the only three neighborhoods in the city from which that is true. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I do think the model that is working in those, in those communities could work in many other communities across the city as well. Okay, I, I'll certainly be pushing to see if we can expand it as a program. Um, I would love to see that. I think that this is the right model. Um, so moving on, because I know that we're, um, we want to get to, we have our other agencies and we have a couple more things to get to here. Um, uh, Commissioner, you, would, uh, you and I had spoken um, uh, on Monday uh, and you said that there was some news you might be willing to share about um, city Pep's vouchers for youth aging out of foster care. Is that right? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, uh, Councilman, let me, let me um, thank you for your advocacy on this, uh, your advocacy on making sure that um, youth both in foster care and leaving foster care have the service and supports that they need. You were an active participant in our, in our foster care task force, which we very much appreciated. Um, you. And you have uh, been really, I think, pushing us and our partners in the city to make sure that we have the right kind of um, uh, options in place for youth as they leave care, if they leave without uh, permanent family connections, um, including housing, which is critical. Um, so uh, I am delighted to say um, that we uh, have agreed with uh, our partners at DSS, and I know you'll be talking with Commissioner Banks shortly, um, and, and, uh, and OMB to initiate a pilot to test out the use of the uh, FAHEPS vouchers for youth who are aging out of care and, and need housing. Um, we obviously, we never discharge anyone from foster care to homelessness, and we have other options available, but we think that perhaps vouchers could really be a useful resource for some of the young people uh, leaving care. So um, we will be launching a pilot um, to look at that and see how well that works. Um, we were, are gonna beginning, beginning with an allocation of 50 perhaps vouchers. Um, we'll be working with DSS over the next couple of months um, to design the program, to design a referral process, uh, to make sure we can identify the right young people who will benefit from this and make sure we can provide the support that they will need to make it successful. Um, our goal is to launch the pilot in July and we hope to be able to uh, present you know, the results and findings to you by this fall. Um, so I'm very excited about this. Uh, I'll see if, if Deputy Commissioner Farber would like to say anything because I know the issue of uh, support for youth aging foster care is is a very important concern of hers. 
Um, sure, thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Council Member, for asking about this. Um, you know, as the Commissioner mentioned, we do not exit young people to homelessness. Um, we uh, keep young people, um, you know, supported uh, until they have an identified housing plan. We work really closely with NYCHA and other supportive housing programs. Uh, we have programs with HPD uh, in terms of FUP vouchers. Um, and so we're really looking forward to this pilot um, with DSS to really target the young people who might be at greatest risk um, of becoming homeless uh, at some point um, for the FAHEP vouchers and I'm confident that over the next couple of months we'll put together that criteria we'll get that information out to the foster care agencies and um, you know we'll connect young people with the FAHEPS voucher um, so I think you know we'll be adding that into the book of um, you know housing opportunities that we provide to all kids um, when they're leaving care. Thank you Deputy Commissioner I, I um, uh, we have led this pending legislation um, that um, would would uh, potentially mandate that that um, that youth aging out pre qualify essentially. Um, the issue being that I don't you know we don't want to see youth aging out of foster care going into a, a DYCD or a DHS shelter um, in order to get access to the voucher that could get them into permanent housing. Um, you know, uh, frankly, my beef here is with OMB. Um, more than anyone else, um, because um, I think that that a lot of these limitations are um, because of OMB's um, resistance um, over the last several years. And so, you know, I, I really um, uh, uh, take, you know, address all, almost all of my criticism at, at OMB here. Um, uh, so I would be eager to see how this is working if, you know, by the fall, it's not, you know, or we're seeing um, issues or, or even if it is, we, we might want to do the legislation to make sure that it goes beyond the pilot and is expanded to um, every youth that's aging out as well. Um, uh, but I appreciate the, the response. Um, and then um, I'm going to just uh, ask one more question it's about um, uh, child care vouchers. Um, uh, you know, last year we saw some, because it was such a difficult budget year, um, we saw some moving around of, um, of, of how the budget is working when it comes to vouchers. I'm sorry, I have two more questions. I also want to ask about fair futures, but, um, uh, um, some, because that was the other area of, of the budget where we had to figure out what we, what exactly was going on. But, um, but basically what happened last year was that we, um, uh, there was some available funds in um, in the mandated voucher portion that we got in state um, in state uh, child care funds that could be used for um, for for non mandated uh, vouchers. So we basically we moved um, uh, SCCF vouchers into the um, what we used to call priority five or, um, you know, the, that, that funding stream, the CCBG funding stream, um, because there were some availability. Now, coming out of the pandemic, we may see that mandated voucher demand goes up, in which case SCCF, those SCCF vouchers get then bumped back over to CTL. It, I think, so, so you're, you're, it's, you know, because there was room within other funding sources, um, they could, you know, they they could be there for a while. But if if that demand goes up again, um, there's still going to be this need. So, are is there? Are you exploring um, how you can use the in um, the influx of CCBG funds under the American Rescue Plan to um, to enhance funding streams for non-mandated vouchers because. These non-mandated vouchers, so everybody understands, are for um, low-income families that um, that are not necessarily uh, qualifying for public assistance or other types of, of benefits which would require mandated vouchers. But there are many, many New York families, many families in New York that have that are above the poverty line, um, just above the poverty line, that could really use 
subsidized childcare. Um, so I guess my, my first question is, are you exploring uh, um, these other funding streams um, to be able to support non-mandated vouchers? And then my other question would be, um, how much money would it be to support 10,000 non-mandated vouchers? I think that that's, that's a question that we've gone back and forth with over, over the years um, because that was the, that was the pot of non-mandated vouchers when the de Blasio administration came into office, roughly. Let me, let me start on the answer and then uh, I think uh, the Commissioner Moiseyev can, can pick up and has uh, probably on the details. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned in my testimony, what happened uh, last year is when, because of the fiscal crisis, the final budget uh, reduced the allocation for SCCF vouchers, city funded vouchers. Um, we wanted to obviously preserve childcare for as many families as we could. And so we were successfully able, and as you alluded, to move most families, not all, but most families from city funded SCCF vouchers onto um, federally funded uh, CCPG vouchers. Um, and we were very happy we were able to do that. Um, the, well, the first thing I will say is just a slight, slight uh, correction. Um, the, the funding actually doesn't come from the state. The funding comes yes, from the federal no, no, government. No, yes, yes. <laughs> through I was the mixing state. Because it was the fair futures that came from the state. Yes, this is the federal, yes. This is all the federal. So, um, yes, yes, yes. So, this point, so the issue is really is, is the state and how the state allocates the money. And the, the challenge is that there are, of course, there are some eligibility re requirements that are in federal law, but the state applies its own. And in some places, the state el eligibility requirements are more restrictive than what federal law requires. And I think that's where, to your point, there are opportunities for us to look at with a significant infusion of new money coming in, um, whether uh, the state can expand its eligibility requirements so that we can serve more families on the non-mandated side of the program. Mandated, obviously any family who is mandated by, uh, by DSS to participate in work activities or other activities, they have an, uh, an absolute right to a voucher. But the non-mandated criteria, as you point out, are, are set by the state, um, largely, and to some extent by us within the state regulations. So um, I, I definitely think that we need to look at and, and work with the state to determine where we can use the infusion of new money we're getting to expand eligibility on a number of criteria, including income, for sure, because I absolutely agree with you. There are families that are above poverty that are still uh, very much in need of childcare. Um, but also that I think there may be categories of families who should be categorically eligible for non-mandated voucher. We know we have provided that we're providing vouchers now to homeless families. Um, I think there may be other categories of families that are experiencing particular challenges uh, that should also be eligible for non-mandated. So um, I'm very much interested in uh, thinking about what we as a city believe uh, child care access should be and then working with the state to make that possible. Uh, but let me ask Michael uh, to speak a little bit to the the, the funding issues because I think it's important to really understand the context for this. Absolutely, thank you, Commissioner. Um, so uh, uh, I wanted to start by maybe talking a little bit about the transfer of uh, SCCF uh, funding to CCBG funding, uh, and I just kind of wanted to clarify that we spent quite a bit of time uh, talking to OMB about how to do this in a sustainable way. Uh, there's long-term trends that have basically freed up CCBG that actually predate the pandemic. And some of this mm -hmm. just comes from uh, the demographics and public assistance usage. And so we're gonna be looking at it very carefully, but I did wanna just kind of make the point that the vouchers that we're converting from SCCF to what used to be called priority five in CCBG eligibility, they're, they're safe and not, not just today or tomorrow, but for at least a few years. And we're gonna be looking at that very closely. Um, uh, the infusion of federal money is definitely an opportunity. We are looking very closely at that. And I think like the commissioner said, it, it boils down to uh, eligibility and different eligibility definitions. And so we're gonna be working very closely with the state on that. Um, to answer your uh, uh, funding question, Chair, it's. Uh, about $7,500 per voucher is what it comes uh, comes out to. It varies a little bit depending on the type of voucher, but yeah, roughly mm. if you wanted to know what it would cost to do 10,000 vouchers, about $75 million. Okay. 
Thank you so much, uh, Deputy Commissioner. And um, uh, I'll go to my colleagues for uh, for questions. I know that Councilmember Diaz has questions, and then I'll go over to Councilmember Salamanca, and then I have one last question just about fair futures. Time starts now. I have two quick questions in reference to the pilot program. Can you give me the dollar amount per voucher? With regard to the which pilot, pilot program, program for the 50 vouchers? Ah, the 50, yes, the FAPS vouchers. Um, that actually is a question you should probably direct to DSS because they actually administer that program. We don't. Okay. I'm sure I'm sure Commissioner Banks could answer that question for you. Okay, then, then my, my next question is, last night I received a phone call from a local resident whose, whose nephew was in the foster care system, and as he phased out, his exit plan did not come through, so he's facing homelessness. Is there a safety net? How long do you follow um, youth have exited the system? Do you follow them at all? We do. Uh, I'll let Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner Farber talk about this. We absolutely do. As, she, as, as I said, she said, we, we, uh, we never um, uh, have a child leave the foster care system to homelessness. So obviously we'll want to follow up on get the information and connect on that. But yes, we absolutely do at the point of departure. And then we uh, try to provide ongoing support for young people. But uh, you know, so he, he had a plan. His plan, his plan failed. So, OK. I'll okay. Um, yes, council member, um, I would be happy to follow up on that. So if your office wants to, to follow up with my office um, with the information so we can follow up on the individual case. But as the as the commissioner mentioned, um, we, we will not exit a young person to homelessness. And if whatever his plan was, if it was a certain kind of housing and fell through for some reason, or if it was with a relative, um, we'll, we'll come back to the table and, and figure out a plan. Um, and so I'd be happy to follow up with you on that case. Thank you. Thank you very much. So. Uh, Kasper Salamaka. Time starts now. Uh, yes, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I just have a quick question uh, regarding domestic violence. Um, has there, I know that um, <clears throat> there, there, since the pandemic, there has been an increase in domestic violence. And I know that you know our children going to schools is an opportunity where we can uh, identify some type of child abuse occurring. Have the numbers of child abuse cases decreased or increased um, in this past year? In relation to domestic violence? Well, in relation to child abuse. Ah, child abuse generally. Well, um, what we know, um, council members, is a number of reports that uh, go to the state central registry that get referred to us. Um, those have decreased. Um, I, I talked about this a little bit in the testimony. They decreased um, dramatically at the beginning of the pandemic a year ago. They have since recovered. Um, and we're now, uh, the, reports, uh, the, the reports we receive are about 15% below what they were a year before. So there has been some decrease in the number of reports that we're receiving for investigation. Okay. Um, is, the, is ACS um, performing some type of outreach to help um, you know, get some of these uh, uh, possible, um, you know, child abuse cases reported, uh, maybe through neighbors or friends or, you know, uh, is, there, is, there, is there some type of outreach that you're doing currently? Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's, that is a great concern for us uh, because we did want to make sure that, you know, we knew, especially back in, in March when schools closed, we knew, you know, teachers weren't going to be seeing kids in person every day. And of course, uh, other kinds of service providers weren't either. And so we did want to absolutely make sure, to your point, that um, community members, neighbors, friends, uh, and others were being vigilant about child safety. Um, so we did several things. One is um, we, uh, we, because we knew also that there was, had been a big increase in 311 calls, people who needed information about where to get services. So we recorded a PSA uh, that has been playing on 311 uh, about how uh, it's really everybody's uh, responsibility and opportunity if they have a concern about child safety to call uh, the state hotline. Um, we launched a couple of um, campaigns specifically, one for families, parents, and one for teenagers, because we were especially concerned about teenagers who were home isolated, not going to school, not seeing their friends, not you know, participating in sports and so on, uh, and, and the impact of that isolation on them. So we launched uh, two campaigns, one called um, uh, one for families and one for, for uh, teenagers about how to access resources 
Uh, and in particular, what to do if you uh, if, a, if a teenager felt that they were uh, in an unsafe situation, to know that there was some place that they could turn. Um, and as I said, uh, as we looked at the data over the last year, we actually have seen that communities really have stepped up. And even though the overall number of reports that we've gotten of possible child abuse and neglect has dropped, the number that we've been receiving from community members hasn't. It's actually stayed, stayed constant. So it does uh, look to us from the data that we have like uh, communities really are stepping up to the plate to make sure the kids are safe. But we want right. to make sure that they continue to do that. All right. And then finally, Commissioner, I'm really interested in knowing what the total cost is to house adolescents um, at Horizon at these detention centers. And I think that that's information that should be available at these hearings. So I look forward to getting a follow-up from your, your agency on that information. Absolutely. We'll get that to you very quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Councilmember Salamaka. Councilmember Gibson, do you have questions? Time starts now. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair Levin. Good morning, everyone. To all my colleagues. Good morning, Commissioner Hansel. To you and the team at ACS, I echo the sentiments expressed by my colleagues and thanking you for all the work that you and the members of your team have been doing every single day during this pandemic. Um, unfortunately, my county of the Bronx, we have the highest death rate to COVID and it's such a painful reminder of the work that lies ahead. Um, I wanna thank you and, and Chair Levin for recognizing the horrible tragedy that happened to a 10 year old uh, young boy in Harlem. Um, he was memorialized at a church in my district just yesterday in the Bronx. Um, it's very painful whenever we have cases of neglect and certainly the death of any child uh, that must be preventable and serve as a wake up call for all of us in terms of what we can do better. Um, so I have a couple of comments I wanted to make and then a final question. Uh, I agree on the family enrichment centers. One of those three neighborhoods you talked about is in my district in the Bronx. So we've done a lot of work with bridge builders and we really provide a lot of support to families. So if we have an opportunity in this budget to expand, we should. Uh, we should be looking at all neighborhoods, whether you have a high rate of substantiated cases or not. Um, I think family enrichment centers pro provide a lot of collaboration and really resources for families that don't know the process, that don't understand the process and certainly don't know what ACS offers. Um, Council member Bredenchik mentioned the issue that I wanted to raise and that is the coordination with the Department of Education. And unfortunately, during the pandemic, when students were working remotely, we've seen a couple of cases in our district of parents with multiple school-age children, not enough devices, and the inability to log on uh, on time for school. And, and certainly, many of those parents expressed concerns about getting an ACS call against them when they were trying their very best to make sure their children had access to internet as well as devices. The digital divide is a real challenge for us in the city and certainly in our district in the Bronx. Um, and so I wanna further understand how we can be of support. I know the mayor announced an initiative on addressing the digital divide, particularly for students in temporary housing. They have challenges with internet connectivity. So I certainly wanna talk more about that. And then the third issue, Chair Levin's going to bring it up, but I'm speaking before him. So I want to add my voice to the incredible foster care youth and advocates that are talking about the Fair Futures campaign and our advocacy over two years ago. I know it's funded by the state, but certainly the ability to get this baseline any way we can so we don't have to return every year, uh, just to advocate for this, a comprehensive model for foster youth through age 26 is exactly what we should do in New York City. And we can lead the way as a city and we can be a model for the country. I represent many foster youth and I am really grateful that every year pre-pandemic, we've had foster youth shadow day at the city council where we have our foster youth come to us. They see our work every day, but we also hear their stories and their challenges. The foster care subsidy needs to be increased um, you know, things like that, the pipeline, someone mentioned a pipeline into public housing, finding a way that there could be a pathway to 
college careers and longevity and sustainability and real self-sufficiency for foster care youth should be our goal. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that and how the program is going and anything the council can do to be of support, add my name to Fair Futures and baselining it and keeping this program going. Thank you so much, Commissioner, and thank you, Chair Levin. Thank you, Councilmember Gibson, and thank you for your advocacy for Fair Futures. Um, Commissioner, do you want to uh, respond to that? And are there, um, sure. uh, are, are, is it in the works to try to baseline um, Fair Futures into the either executive budget or, um, uh, or, or adopted budget this year? Um, I think that it would be a great way, uh, certainly the end of this, the last budget of this administration to get Fair Futures fully in there um, so that you know our colleagues, uh, the 35 new colleagues next year are uh, trying to advocate to you know get it once again into the budget. And lastly, there's just a, it's it's a, from a practical perspective, it's really important to be able to give these organizations and staff some predictability in terms of funding year to year and not not worrying in June whether or not they're going to have a job in July. Right. Well, let me start by saying. Uh, that Councilmember Levin and Councilmember Gibson, I am delighted that you both are as enthusiastic about this program as we are. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we think this has been a great addition to our support for uh, young people in foster care, um, the ability to have, provide not just coaches, but as I said in my testimony, coaches and tutors and um, housing and education specialists, basically um, you know, people dedicated team members who can work with them in an ongoing way to address their challenges and help them through significant transitions in their lives, um, we think has been a, a really great uh, expansion of the supports that we were already providing to youth in foster care. So we're very excited about the program. Um, and I have to, I mean, I, I do actually have to um, acknowledge two of the members of my team who are, are, are here at the hearing today because uh, they really made huge contributions to this. When we got the first funding uh, for Fair Futures in fiscal year 20, the initial $10 million allocation, um, Deputy Commissioner Farber and her team um, worked with uh, foster care agencies to get this program up and running in record time. <laughs> often, I think you often know when there's new money for a new program in a budget, it all sometimes takes the whole year to get that program up and running. That did not happen with Fair Futures. Uh, it was a matter of a few months. Um, and so I really want to acknowledge the work that Deputy Commissioner Farber and her team did to get the program going two years ago. Um, and then last year, when, uh, when we got the results of the, uh, the final negotiation of the budget between uh, the mayor and the council, and we saw that the allocation in the budget for the program for fiscal year 21 had dropped to, I believe, 2.7 million, um, we were very concerned about that because we did think it was important to, to uh, sustain the program at, at the level that it had been in and hopefully to grow it. And so, um, Deputy Commissioner Moiseev uh, and his team in our finance department um, immediately went to work to see how creative we could be in finding ways to leverage the funding that was in the budget to make sure that we didn't have to reduce the scope of the program in any way. And as you know, um, we were very successful in doing that. We were very successful in uh, utilizing other state funding, um, match funding and prior year revenue so that we were able to bring the, the level of funding for the program this year from the amount that it was allocated in the budget up to $12 million so we could continue uh, to grow it. So we are very, very committed to this program. We think it's been an enormous success. Um, and we certainly hope uh, as the discussions around the executive budget begin between the mayor and the, and the council that um, Fair Futures will be prioritized for consideration uh, to continue the program. And certainly to, I, I, I believe it's proven uh, it's worth, I've proven that it should continue to be a permanent part of our portfolio of services for young people. And so I hope uh, that that will be fully reflected um, as the executive budget discussions continue uh, later this spring. Great. Well, thank you, Commissioner. I appreciate that. And I, I, I certainly appreciate the, um, the, the really extraordinary support um, that, that uh, you and Deputy Commissioner Farber and the entire teams there have given to this program. So. Um, your your commitment to it is is very clear, and I appreciate that. Um, so that's that's all the questions uh, for me. I realize we're running late, and so I apologize for um, uh, to to DSS. I know that they were expecting to start, um, you know, almost an hour ago. So um, with that, I will I will wrap up. I just want to uh, 
end by congratulating uh, Deputy Commissioner Saunders on, um, on your, your new um, appointment. <clears throat> so congratulations. And, and also uh, uh, because this would be uh, the last budget hearing um, with, with first Deputy Commissioner Brett Schneider, I wanna thank him for uh, his extraordinary service and um, uh, collaboration with the council over the years. And, and we've always appreciated um, his, his, uh, his voice and his insight and his passion uh, for um, uh, serving New York City's children and, uh, and, and, and really making a difference in their lives. So um, Deputy Commissioner Brett Schneider, congratulations to you on your retirement and we thank you for all of your service. And with that, I'll let you all go. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, everybody. Um, okay, uh, I'll turn it back over to um, uh, to uh, Committee Council Amita Kilowan um, uh, to welcome the DSS uh, administration officials. I apologize, apologize for those few seconds of a delay. We are going to move on to testimony from the Department of Social Services momentarily. We just want to give the department a moment to log on. And once they do, we will proceed to the next portion of this hearing, which will be testimony by the Department of Social Services. So please bear with us as the administration representatives log in and we will begin momentarily.
All right, everyone. I see we have been joined by Commissioner Banks from the Department of Social Services. So I'll now turn it back over to Chair Levin to deliver his opening statement for this portion of our budget hearing. Thank you very much, uh, Council Kilowan. I, <clears throat> I have to bring up my remarks here. Hold on one moment. Okay. Just loading here. Okay, good morning, everybody, or yep, still morning. Good morning, everybody. I'm Council Member Stephen Levin. I'm Chair of the Committee on General Welfare here at the Council. I wanna thank everybody for joining me for the Fiscal 22 Preliminary Budget Hearing for the General Welfare Committee. Uh, we will now hear from two agencies, the Human Resources Administration and the Department of Homeless Services, who will be testifying as one under the umbrella of the Department of Social Services on each of their proposed Fiscal 22 budgets. The city's proposed fiscal 22 preliminary budget totals $92.3 billion, of which approximately 12.2 billion or 13% of the entire city budget funds DSS, encompassing $10.1 billion for HRA and $2.1 billion for DHS. These two agencies serve the most vulnerable populations in the city and their vital work is now more important than ever given the COVID-19 pandemic and its devastating impact on our city. As the largest social services agency in the country, HRA provides cash assistance, emergency food assistance, SNAP, HIV AIDS support services, otherwise known as HASA, legal services, anti-eviction services, rental assistance, rental arrears, and many other public assistance programs for low-income New Yorkers. DHS provides transitional shelter for homeless single adults, adult families and families with children in accordance with New York City's right to shelter mandate. DHS also helps clients to exit shelter and move into permanent and supportive housing. The budget put forth does not reflect any of the additional resources that will be needed for COVID-19 related expenditures or to support the staggering increase in demand for social safety net programs and homeless services. In fiscal 2021, DHS recognized $329 million in federal FEMA reimburse uh, and budget, sorry, in federal FEMA funding and budgeted $134 million in federal CARES Emergency Solutions Grants funding, totaling $463 million for critical programs such as stabilization beds, de-densifying hotels, isolation hotels, and medical services related to COVID-19 COVID pandemic. In fiscal 21, HRA recognized $78.8 million in funding for COVID-related expenditures, the majority of which were federal. Most notably, $50 million was added from a federal community development block grant for the city's pandemic food reserve called PFRED, and $22.2 million was added from FEMA for COVID-related testing in the city's shelter system. Remarkably, no funding has been added to either DHS or HRA's budget for COVID-related expenditures in fiscal 22 or in the out years. And so we wanna hear from the administration why that is and what, what they plan, uh, how they plan to address that in the executive budget. While the budget maintains the essential benefits programs administered by HRA and the shelter programs administered by DHS, more can and should be done. And we need to think more deeply about what we can do most effectively to allocate city resources, especially during these uniquely challenging times. I'm particularly disappointed that the preliminary plan does not put forth a solid plan for COVID-19 spending at DSS in fiscal 22. No new funding was allocated to restore the indirect rate initiative and no new funding was included for hazard pay and no new funding was allocated towards addressing food insecurity or the increased need for social services programs. I strongly feel that the city needs more comprehensive planning and a clear path forward on how we will combat poverty, food insecurity, and homelessness, both during the remainder of the pandemic and in the long recovery ahead. 
Other areas of concern we would like to discuss during the hearing today include the timeliness of DHS's contract payments, which have been slow and challenging for providers, leaving many with delayed payments. DHS has planned to implement Wi-Fi in shelters, particularly those with children, the effectiveness of the city FEPS voucher program, and the impact of the pandemic has had on benefit access, HRA client services, and human services providers. Before I welcome the commissioner, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who are here today. Um, and I, let's see, we've been joined by Councilmember Salamanca, Grudenchik Deutsch, um, Bear with me, Gibson. I think Holden was here, Diaz. And if I'm missing anyone else, I apologize. But I think that that is it. I also do see a great number of uh, uh, members of the public and advocates on this, um, the Zoom as well. And so I wanna thank everybody for joining here. I also wanna acknowledge General Welfare Committee staff for their hard work preparing for today's hearing. Um, I want to thank Doheny Sampora unit head, uh, Julie, Julia Haramis, financial analyst, Frank Sarno, financial analyst, Aminta Killow on senior counsel, and Crystal Pond, senior policy analyst, and Natalie Omery, policy analyst. Um, they really did a remarkable job under difficult circumstances getting this hearing together. I'd also like to thank my chief of staff, Jonathan Boucher, and my legislative director, Nicole Hunt. And now I will turn it over to Committee Council Amita Kilowan to swear in the administration. Thank you. Good morning again, everyone. The next panel will include testimony from the Department of Social Services, Services followed by council member questions and then public testimony. Testifying on behalf of the Department of Social Services will be Commissioner Stephen Banks, Commissioner of DSS. I will now administer the oath Commissioner Banks, once you hear your name, please respond once a member of our staff unmutes you. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Recognizing there's a little bit of a delay with the unmuting, you are now unmuted, Commissioner. Thank, thank you very much, I do. Thank you, you may begin your testimony. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Council Member and Chair Levin and uh, Council Members who are present for this hearing. Uh, we have uh, extended remarks that we're asking you to include in the record. I'm going to paraphrase them to give time for the for questions. Uh, obviously, at the outset, I want to acknowledge uh, that COVID-19 has profoundly impacted all of us, including our staff, our clients, and our not-for-profit service providers. And over the last year, we've lost family members, colleagues, clients, friends, and neighbors. Uh, and I want to just take a moment to remember all those who we've lost. Now, turning to the January plan, even in these hard times, the FY22 budget uh, reflects our commitment to continuing to remove barriers and increasing access to benefits and services and eliminating punitive policies and improving services available for New Yorkers. Uh, as we'll describe in the testimony, our reforms and initiatives uh, are taking hold despite longstanding challenges for clients such as decades long underinvestment in affordable housing, income inequality, and persistent structural racism, all of which have been brought into stark relief during this past year as COVID-19 has changed the lives uh, of all of us in so many ways. Many of our reforms and initiatives over the last seven years provided a strong foundation for us to serve New Yorkers throughout the pandemic. Uh, moreover, the federal and state waivers that we've obtained during the pandemic have allowed us to enhance benefits, uh, benefits access uh, that we've been developing uh, and one uh, system that decreases burdens on clients seeking assistance under federal and state law through onus, un unnecessary in-person application uh, interviews, appointments and documentation requirements and paternalistic engagement obligations. With the waivers we've requested and received this past year has afforded us an opportunity to administer benefits programs with much of the bureaucratic relief we've been seeking for a number of years. And it clearly demonstrates the necessity for reforms at the federal and state levels to enable us to continue to make progress for our clients. 
the FY22 HRA DSS preliminary budget is at 10.09 billion, consisting of 7.84 billion in city funds. Uh, FY22 DHS preliminary budget is 2.05 billion, consisting of 1.25 billion in city funds. The HRA headcount for FY22 includes 10,120 city funded positions and another 3,472 uh, 3, non city funded positions. The DHS headcount for FY22 includes 2,101 uh, 2, city funded positions and another 40 grant funded positions. Uh, the uh, obviously, as you're aware, there's been a significant impact on the citywide budget due to COVID. And all agencies, including ours, have been tasked with finding savings to address the budget gap resulting from COVID. And this has involved making some difficult decisions. Uh, the January plan contains the following one-time savings, uh, 53.9 million in prior year revenue and, one point, uh, and 13 million in unanticipated fringe benefit reimbursement savings in FY21 only. Uh, 100 million in federal pandemic related increased Medicaid reimbursement produces one time city savings. Uh, $8 million in savings in FY21 due to uh, the eviction moratorium and the related lower level of uh, case processing and the access to counsel program due to the eviction moratorium. 20.6 million in savings in FY21 only for the job training participant programs due to COVID 19 related program suspensions and reductions in activity. $11.7 million re-estimate in FY22 of the phase-in schedule for supportive housing due to uh, COVID-19. Uh, 1.2 million in FY21 due to underspending and office supplies from remote work during COVID. 3.7 million in vacancy savings and 723 vacancies in FY21 due to the citywide hiring freeze. And in the November plan, there was one time in baseline savings of 2.3 million in FY21 and 3.1 million in FY22 in the out years through the elimination of 152 positions uh, and the savings from those vacancy reductions. Uh, I want to highlight a few issues before uh, getting into questions. Uh, I want to focus on the state budget right now to address uh, issues that we've said, uh, testified to in prior years. Uh, we've had a number of funding cuts uh, at the state level, cost shifts from the state to the city, and we have advocated very strongly for certain changes in this year's state budget. I'm pleased to report that in the two Assembly and uh, Senate one house bills that our proposal to address the disinvestment in the city by advocating uh, for the uh, increasing state FEPs to the FMR uh, federal uh, 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 market rate rent uh, that has been included in those two one house bills. Uh, for years, the state has refused to use this standard for setting rent subsidies for the state FEPS program. And if the city did so on its own for our supplemental city FEPS program, among other consequences, it would lead to landlords favoring city vouchers over state vouchers, resulting in a substantial cost shift to the city by incentivizing landlords to rent only to city voucher holders and not to states. And so we're very uh, pleased to see that this is in the one house bills and we know that we will work with the council in these remaining weeks to make that part of the final budget. Uh, in addition, uh, we have been advocating for the ability to provide cash assistance clients with the same access to benefits that SNAP clients have had for several years. The ability to access services by phone and online without having to come into an office at the client's choice. Uh, that has dramatically reduced the numbers of clients coming into our SNAP offices pre-pandemic. It stood us in good stead when the pandemic hit to be able to provide those kinds of remote services. We, uh, we've been asking for years to be able to have that kind of access. Uh, access for cash assistance clients, uh, and uh, a bill has now passed both the Senate and Assembly providing uh, to make permanent the waiver that we got during the pandemic to provide that, and that is something that we're pressing for in the context of the budget, so there's no delay in implementation of that important client access change. We've also called on the state to support shelter services and outreach by restoring the traditional 50-50 cost uh, shift for single adults in New York City, for outreach workers, for shelter, for safe havens, for stabilization beds, and the cost of homeless services from the MTA overnight uh, shutdown initiative. Uh, despite the fact that a consent decree requires both the city and state to provide shelter services to single adults experiencing homelessness, the state's steadily reduced its uh, support for single adult shelters in New York City from 50-50 split to only 9% uh, of those costs for shelter. And in fact, 
uh, the state pays zero for the cost of outreach workers, stabilization beds, safe haven beds. Uh, and we have been asking for uh, this to be addressed in the context of the state budget. Obviously, on the federal level, uh, we're very uh, happy uh, with, the, uh, with the recent stimulus package, which provides aid to the city and to the state, uh, and also includes additional rental assistance, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, let me talk a little bit about HRA's response to COVID, uh, which I think is relevant to some of the questions the chair uh, raised. Um, one of the most important changes I described earlier is that we've been able to change how clients access benefits during the pandemic uh, to provide cash assistance uh, clients with the same option that we've been providing to SNAP clients, the ability to not have to come into one of our offices to get help. Uh, at the same time, I want to illustrate uh, and highlight uh, that we have managed the largest increase in cash assistance uh, or, or historic increases in cash assistance and SNAP benefits. Let me just give you the overall top line. Between February 2020 and uh, uh, November 2020, there was an approximately 53,000 person increase, 20% increase, and a more than 30,000 case increase, 16.8% case increase in the cash assistance caseload. And uh, on the SNAP side, uh, there between uh, March through December, the agency received 152,244 more SNAP applications uh, during the same period in the prior year, which is a 55% increase. Um, and between February 2020 and December 2020, there was 164,699 person increase, 11.1% increase in the numbers on our SNAP caseload. Uh, the way that we were able to manage this increase uh, was through a series of waivers that we obtained from the federal and state government, waiving interview requirements, uh, providing uh, suspensions of recertifications, uh, providing for suspensions of engagement requirements, all of which both helped keep clients and staff safe, uh, enabled us to keep open only a few centers. Uh, we got an additional waiver to waive the signature requirement so that HRA staff can take applications by telephone for clients uh, who could not uh, manage technology. Uh, and so all of these are ways that we manage the caseload, plus we have redeployed at the height of the pandemic uh, 1,300 staff uh, from back office and support uh, functions in order to help us on the front lines. Um, I should say we're seeking to continue and renew the waivers that we've obtained during the pandemic uh, as the public uh, health emergency continues. And for your awareness, we've submitted with this testimony a full list of all the waivers uh, that we have obtained. I want to highlight in particular the eviction prevention work, uh, which thanks to the partnership with the council, uh, over the last several years, we've been leading the nation in providing access to council and housing court. Pre-pandemic evictions were down uh, city by city marshals, 41%. Uh, and we had driven up a representation through the right to council law uh, uh, from 1% in 2013 uh, to uh, almost 40% pre-pandemic. Uh, as we were continuing to implement uh, the right to council law. Uh, when the housing court shut down uh, and then reopened, uh, a new system was created with the housing court, with our providers, with the support from the right to council coalition, uh, which now uh, we are uh, happy to say that as the court has been doing virtual hearings, we've been able to work with the legal services community and assign lawyers to literally every case uh, so that cases that are being conducted by conference now have lawyers on them. Uh, because we're now, uh, obviously, the, the pandemic changed the zip code implementation of our right to counsel program, and now we're in the, about to enter into the last year. There is no zip code limitation in terms of assignment of counsel for those uh, virtual court hearings. Uh, and in addition, uh, we've been assigning uh, a, a counsel irrespective of immigration status, as, as we have been doing all along, uh, and uh, with a waiver uh, irrespective of income uh, of the tenants and about 14% uh, uh, of the tenants with council turn out to have gotten income waivers. Again, uh, this is a real tribute to the work of the legal services community, which has responded uh, to our work with the court system to provide lawyers for, uh, for virtually everybody in these virtual uh, hearings. Um, wanted to talk lastly about some of the issues involving homelessness during the pandemic and some of the status of our efforts in this area. Um, first and foremost, uh, we've testified this about this in previous hearings, but I want to just uh, uh, highlight it again. 
Uh, beginning in March of 2020, we created isolation space uh, in order to isolate clients who showed symptoms or were tested positive. At the height, we had about 700 beds available. We worked in partnership with h and and the Department of uh, Health and Mental Hygiene in order to uh, develop protocols uh, for our shelters. Uh, and uh, then we began, as you know, the strategic relocation of single adults from uh, congregate shelters uh, into uh, uh, commercial hotels. At the height of that evacuation, about 10,000 uh, human beings were uh, evacuated from uh, various congregate shelters in order to reduce the density in those shelters. We began a proactive testing program uh, that uh, now we have a positivity rate of uh, 1.3% uh, across the, our shelter system, which is lower than the positivity rate, obviously, across the city. Uh, we've now begun vaccinations, uh, about approximately 8,000 uh, doses have been uh, administered, both from a site that we stood up to supplement the city system and through a mobile system that we put in place uh, that builds upon our mobile testing uh, that has been in place uh, over the course of the summer. Um, I think in terms of the uh, street uh, programs that we've implemented, we right off the bat in the beginning of March implemented a screening program for clients on the street and our outreach providers were trained to screen, screen clients uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, COVID symptoms. Uh, we uh, have uh, uh, stood up uh, 1,200 uh, emergency beds during this period of time. Uh, and uh, during the overnight shutdown, been able to uh, bring in uh, from the subways 700, more than 750 people who have remained off the street. Uh, that is part of our overall effort from Homestat, in which more than 4,000 people have uh, been able to uh, receive help from us and come in off the streets. That's as a result of tripling the number of, uh, of uh, outreach workers to nearly 600. Uh, and also increasing the number of low barrier safe haven and stabilization beds from 600 to more than 3,000 with hundreds more uh, on the way. Uh, we've talked in a number of these uh, hearings and I just wanna uh, bring you up to date on where we are in terms of the four pillars and then I'll open this up to questions uh, from you chair and the other council members. Um, I would call your attention to a recent report by the IBO as well as a report in city limits that highlights the reduction in the uh, shelter census, accelerating uh, trends pre-COVID. Uh, the overall shelter census is now uh, below 52,000 from a high of more than 61,000. Uh, the, uh, this is the DHS shelter census. Um, there really are two uh, dynamics going on within the shelter census. Uh, one is the families with children numbers are at 2012 levels, uh, as has been pointed out in both the IBO report and the city limits report. Uh, the investments in rental assistance and legal services are having an impact uh, in terms of uh, reducing the numbers of uh, people and families with children in the shelter system. Single adults continue to be um, uh, at now at record numbers in part because of uh, the challenges uh, that we are seeing with good uh, public policy. Uh, Deinstitutionalization continues to be a driver of the single adult population uh, as does uh, decarceration, both uh, positive progressive policies, but uh, creating a situation in which our shelter system is literally the safety net uh, for individuals who are being released from institutions. Um, but if you look at the four measures that we laid out in terms of metrics, uh, for the uh, plan to address homelessness. Uh, we said, number one, let's... And what are we doing to change the reality for New Yorkers who say they're seeing more people? And the best answer I have to New Yorkers who, who assert they're seeing more people is not to debate them whether there are or not, but to redouble our efforts every day to help bring people in from the streets. Um, and, and just to speak to that really quickly about stabilization beds, new stabilization beds, how many, yep. how many new stabilization, how many new safe havens? In the last year, we brought on more, more than 1,200, so we now got more than 3,000. At the time of Journey Home, uh, we had increased the number from 600 when uh, the 90 day review began in that period of time to uh, 1,800 at the time of Journey Home, December 2019. Now we've got uh, more than 3,000 and we have the ability to bring on more and we will, there are hundreds more coming online. And then my last question here is, um, do, um, 
what is your plan for conversion of hotel rooms potentially to like SRO units? So we have a, uh, a master lease uh, 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 procurement that enables not-for-profits to come to us uh, and seek a contract that could provide financing to purchase a uh, distressed hotel. Uh, we have several uh, proposals in the procurement process. Uh, again, it emphasizes the partnership we've got with not-for-profit providers who are coming to us with these creative proposals. We at the Department of Social Services, uh, Department of Homeless Services created a financing mechanism uh, that would enable a not-for-profit to come in uh, and uh, 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 get the, take, take to a bank the financing to be able to convert uh, a distressed hotel into supportive housing. And uh, we are very encouraged by the fact that we've got several of these proposals right now we're working through with not-for-profits. We think that could provide a very good model going forward for the city. Uh, sorry, one other question about supportive housing. I've, I've, um, you know, I've heard from, from advocates a lot that there's continues to be concerns around this, um, you know, the phenomenon of creaming um, where um, uh, individuals are passed over for supportive housing placements because they may um, present uh, some challenges. Is this, um, we have a bill that would require some, some reporting. Um, do, is there, I think in 2018, HRA came out uh, in, in opposition to uh, this intro 147. Is that, continue to be HRA's position? Well, I, th I think we said, and, and you and I have spoken about it, that uh, we're happy to sit down with you and see what could be uh, a workable uh, piece of legislation. Remember, one of the issues at that time uh, was that the legislation was broader than just um, uh, uh, supportive housing providers and sites that we have oversight over, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, therefore the ability to, uh, to report on things that we don't have oversight over for challenges. Uh, I think there's also an important issue to uh, separate out the criticism that you're uh, describing and providers who may be a program that aren't appropriately situated to serve the needs of a particular client. Um, as yeah, the, no, I, do, yeah. I do get calls from elected officials, for example, of how is it that X person is in this facility when they've got this needs, do they have, uh, in, in this permanent housing site when they've got these needs, is this the right housing site for them? But yeah, look, I think I, the I, concern we're, is we're willing to work through with you to see okay. how there might be a potential build to be able to be done. Okay, because concern is that that the you know people are being rejected for discriminatory purposes. Does does HRA does does HRA track those types of um, or how does you how does HRA ensure that people aren't being um, uh, rejected for discriminatory reasons? Right, I think there's a real issue about what visibility we can and do have into that process. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll certainly work through with you the legislation to see what could be done to improve it. Um, okay. We don't wanna look, getting people out of uh, shelter into supportive housing, supportive housing is the gold standard. Uh, the providers of supportive housing are many of the same people that provide street uh, outreach and provide shelter services, they do an excellent job. Uh, at the same time, I don't want clients who could get into a facility, uh, into a permanent housing location, uh, right. being improperly rejected. So we'll work with you to see what's possible. Right. It always, it, I find it always quizzical if they're, if, why, they're, why they're people being rejected for supportive housing when the, when the alternative is them staying in uh, housing where there are fewer services. So it's you know, the idea that somebody gets rejected just for supportive housing because they have a lack of insight to their mental health condition when, you know, I mean, that's maybe one aspect of the mental health condition is the lack of insight into your mental health condition. So, you know, I, I, I just, I'm a little bit, um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about that being a, a people being stuck in a, in a purgatory of sorts um, where they, you know, they can't get out because of their, you know, they're, they, they demonstrate too many uh, issues to get into the type of housing that supports people with those issues. No, I, t I take your point. And as I said, there's a, there's a balance between providers uh, uh, being the right program for somebody in terms of what their uh, service That's a different model issue, is. Yeah. There's yeah, a balance yeah. between that problem and the challenge of a client being, uh, being uh, properly or improperly passed over. So we'll work with you. Okay, very good. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over. Uh, Helen has one more question or remark, and then I'll 
I'll let you go. Thank you. Sorry, I stepped out for a bit, but um, I, I just a little bit took issue at the idea that the Upper West Side is flooded with homeless people. I think we, our office has been working really closely with the homeless outreach providers um, on the Upper West Side. Look, there's no doubt uh, there's a homeless crisis. We all know that, but I think um, if we're seeing more, it's because other people aren't on the street as they usually are. And during this time of COVID, you know, when the streets have been empty, I think the homeless stand out more than before. But I, I do worry, as we all should, that with the warmer weather coming, as usual, we will see more homeless on the street and, and need to be able to offer them help. I mean, we just had a very unusual situation, which I don't mind mentioning, where a movie production team that wanted to film in front of one of the restaurants literally gave uh, the homeless individual a thousand dollars, stored his things and put them up at a hotel. And then he was back a week later um, uh, with all his stuff. We saw the production team moving all his stuff back out from the restaurant onto the street again. And that just perplexes me. I mean, that I just don't even know how to wrap my head around that. Um, but, you know, the goal is to make sure that our outreach workers have all the tools they need. Um, and I, our experience has been that they do as good a job it, that is possible. So I just didn't want to leave any, um, you know, um, inaccurate information on the table. Thank you for that comment. I, I would just add to it, and I appreciate uh, the chairs giving us the ability to present during the course of this hearing, uh, the progress that we're making, but I wouldn't wanna conclude without also emphasizing that even as we talk about the progress we've been making, uh, there's still a tremendous amount of work to do, but I am extremely uh, optimistic. And I think, as I've said before, I'm an optimist by nature. I wouldn't have this job or have run legal aid if I wasn't an optimist by nature. But uh, the idea that we have a federal partner uh, is a tremendous difference now in staving off uh, the human crisis of uh, the evictions that could be out there. Uh, I can't uh, say enough about the potential to have $2 billion statewide, substantial portion of which will be accessible for New York City residents in staving off this human crisis that will enable us to continue to make the progress we've been making and driving down the traditional shelter census, uh, even as we uh, uh, address the differences in, in, in what's happening with families with children going down to 2012 levels and single adults being at record levels. So uh, the complexity of the problem is not uh, well understood. Uh, but the solutions that we're trying to bring to bear on the complexity, I think you've given us an opportunity to describe them, and I appreciate that, Chair. Thank you very Thank much, you. And and Kasper Rosenthal, I I, I, probably, I was being a little bit, um, you know, sarcastic with my remarks. You know, I don't mind. There are those who firmly believe what you just said, and I appreciated the commissioner's comments in response and. You know, I, I mean, I think it's a matter of being patient with people and educating them and with the main thing being eyes on the prize to try to help get people off the street, which, you know, everyone here is trying to do. So thank I you. appreciate you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Councilman Rosenthal. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I appreciate you and your staff taking the time to be here today. Um, this is our last, this is our final um, preliminary budget hearing together. So, you know, happy trails. 
<laughs> if you go back and read the first testimony at the budget and all the changes we we made, I appreciate your comment that I studiously don't make commitments we don't keep. If you look at what we laid out as the agenda in the first budget hearing, I think you'll find that we actually did everything we said we were going to do uh, on the HRA side. Obviously, at DHS, we've had uh, less time for the reforms, but there you can see we're making progress. And there'll be a foundation to build upon for the future. People can make decisions about doing more or less, but uh, we've got a foundation to move forward from. Absolutely, your 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 uh, commitment is is um, beyond dispute. Yours too. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Okay, uh, we'll take a three minute break and start up with uh, with um, uh, with public testimony at two twenty five. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back, everybody. Um, uh, I'll ask Committee Council Minta Kilowan to call on the first public panel. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. We are now going to turn to public testimony. First, I want to remind everyone that I will be calling you up individually, but in panels. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you, and you may begin your testimony once the sergeant at arms sets the clock and gives you the cue to go ahead. A reminder that all testimony will be limited to three minutes. And remember that there is a few seconds of a delay once you're unmuted before we can actually hear you. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. The first panel of public testimony will be comprised of Ralph Palladino of Clerical Administrative Employees Local 1549. And Mr. Palladino's panel will be followed by a panel comprised of Lauren Shapiro, Emma Ketteringham, and Zainab Akbar. So we are going to begin now with Ralph Palladino. Time starts now. Good day. Um, nice to see you, City Councilman, and also your committee. Um, I'd like to start by just going through Local 1549's ask in terms of this budget. First, I'd like to bring up the hiring of 400 eligibility specialists and 100 clerical associates in HRA. The recently passed federal uh, stimulus package shows funding for administrative purposes for SNAP for localities. We call on the city and city council to increase the hiring of the eligibility specialists because there is a great need. Also, the hiring of 100 clerical associates, uh, civil service title employees in the agencies of ch uh, children's services. We'd like you to join us in demanding that HRA and DCAS cease their attack on the civil service system and to cease the waste of tax dollars by stopping replacement of civil service clerical titles by higher paid non-competitive ones who perform the same duties. That's the waste of money. The hiring and use of interpreter title in HRA and ACS. And the City Council should not support Senate S3223 and Assembly A5414 dealing with the phone usage in terms of um, a clients in SNAP. Uh, uh, that is, uh, at least as it exists right now, without being amended. Last year's city budget covered the, uh, uh, covering this year was supposed to reflect a shift of funding for the police to social services for the community. Yet the HRA and Agency for Children's Services had to cut their budget and staffing this year, just as nearly all other agencies. How could this be? Does this mean not enough funding was uh, cut from the NYPD? Or perhaps it is the usual style of reducing uh, costs by just cutting across the board, regardless of the effects it has on the needy uh, population. Every year since the Bloomberg administration, the New York Daily News has run articles about the way the mistreatment of HRA uh, clients. For over a decade, we have testified as advocates and clients have on the mishandling of services for the poor in EHASA, HRA, and Medicaid. The closing of centers and the forcing uh, clients uh, to use social media was reported in the Daily News in August, and that was scandalous. And the situation has not changed for the clients. In SNAP, uh, there is uh, untrained, higher paid uh, employees helping our members uh, finish uh, the projects. Uh, there's a backlog. ACS clerical show doubling of cases in the last uh, 11 years, and they've cut the staff by 50 percent. HASA employees caseloads have shown the past few years over quotas uh, in, in terms of what their work entitles. Finally, I'd like to say that the proper language services are critical. Use of service, civil service interpreter title is documented and written this, in this uh, testimony, excuse me, just as everything else I've, I've uh, said in this um, uh, testimony. And the client prob problems, you should read that section in uh, what I have written and that you have. And I'd just like to say to you, uh, city councilman, you have been very cooperative. You have been very um, forthright and, and uh, worked together with us and has responded to us when we've uh, asked uh, and, and um, forthright. And we just want to say we wish you well and uh, hope you can work with us for the rest of this year. And thank you on behalf of Eddie Rodriguez and our members. 
Thank you, Mr. Paladino, and uh, please um, give my my best regards to Mr. Rodriguez um, as well. And you know, I hope that I hope that I'm able to continue working with you not just for the rest of this year, but maybe even <laughs> beyond that, <laughs> where, where, wherever I I land. Hopefully, on my feet somewhere. But um, but but I look forward to continuing to work with you because um, uh, you know I greatly respect the work that your members do day in and day out. Um, this has been very difficult on them. Um, and I want to make sure that, that their jobs are protected um, and that, um, you know, there's a, um, you know, uh, it, it was before my time, but I represent uh, uh, Greenpoint Williamsburg. And there was this phenomenon from the 70s and 80s called planned shrinkage that they had in the city. Um, I hope that that does not happen with, um, with the system of human services in our city where uh, we use this pandemic as an excuse to uh, to shrink the system in any way. So um, you have my commitment to continue working with you for the rest of this uh, year and and hopefully beyond that. Thank you. And and the, the public needs jobs and they need good paying jobs and there's nothing wrong with a civil service job to help people. Thank you. You do not make city policy. You do not make policy for HRA. We know this, but thank you very much. Thank you, Ralph. Thank you. Thanks again, Mr. Palladino. I'm now gonna call on our next panel. Our next panel will be in the following order, Lauren Shapiro, Emma Ketteringham, and Zainab Akbar. Over to Lauren Shapiro. Time starts now. Um, good afternoon, Council Member Levin. Um, thank you for the opportunity and the committee to speak today. Um, I, my name is Lauren Shapiro. I'm the Director of the Family Defense Practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. And I'm with my colleagues. Um, collectively, we represent over 12,000 parents a year in abuse and neglect proceedings in family court. Today, I'm gonna focus um, my testimony on the impact that COVID-19 has had on our clients and how we've responded. Um, as you may know, our clients are the most economically disadvantaged in the city and come from communities of color that have been hit the hardest by COVID. In the best of times, our clients face daily challenges stemming from their poverty, including housing insecurity, unemployment and low wages, lack of daycare, and inadequate medical care. And often, our offices are the only resources that our clients have to help them access basic necessities. The COVID-19 pandemic has created even greater need in our clients' communities. Parents are struggling with remote learning, limited internet access, and issues accessing technology, which is especially difficult for children with special needs. Par the parents we work with are also facing the loss of work, illness and death, and social isolation. For parents with children in foster care who we serve, in-person contact has been vastly curtailed and is often limited to phone calls or video chats. <coughs> And it's much more challenging for them to be involved with their children's education and their medical and mental health care. During COVID, our clients have had more difficulty accessing services and treatment, which is often required by the court and ACS to get their children home or even to expand from supervised to unsupervised visits. As a result, family reunification is being delayed and the time we spend helping our clients navigate these obstacles has dramatically increased. Our offices have responded to our clients' needs by renegotiating hundreds of visiting plans in and out of court and by ensuring that our clients have access to PPE and the technology they need. The family court shut its doors to the public over a year ago. What was an opaque system before has become almost impossible to navigate. Our clients have difficulty accessing virtual proceedings beginning with the first court appearance without access to the proper technology <laughs> Reaching an attorney and even getting into court can be a challenge. Although the court is accepting less child protective filings, the cases that are filed all involve family separation. And we're doing as many emergency hearings now as before, but under much more difficult circumstances. Unfortunately, the court also believes that they don't have to follow statutory timeframes for conducting emergency hearings. So we are seeing delays in family reunification in these hearings as well as permanency and other hearings. When we do have hearings, they take much more time due to technology issues and is challenging for our clients to meaningfully participate. For families with children at home, delays in court mean that they are being unnecessarily monitored by ACS. All these court delays are causing a huge bottleneck and making it very difficult for us to resolve cases, which has a direct impact on our pending caseload. 
during COVID and its aftermath, restoring our Article 10 funding and fully funding our pre-petition advocacy is necessary to ensure that our offices can handle the ongoing unique needs of our clients and to address the increasing backlog of cases in family court, which my colleagues are going to speak more about. Thanks. And I'm, I, I'm done. Thank you so much, Lauren. I'm now gonna to turn to Emma Ketteringham. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Emma Ketteringham, Managing Director of the Family Defense Practice at the Bronx Defenders. Um, I want to start by saying that, you know, nothing in ACS's testimony this morning actually spoke to the kind of transformation that is necessary in this moment. Expanded prevention services is expanded surveillance when it's delivered by the same city agency that has the power of family separation and dissolution. As said in the Times today by Professor Chris Gottlieb, when ACS knocks, it's not benign social work. Uh, we need direct investment and not funneled through the agency with the power to dissolve families. We need direct investment in the lives, health, schools, and communities of the city's most vulnerable and marginalized families the direct investment and reimagining of family support that is being called on in this moment by impacted families. And a hearing on the general welfare of our city can't just be about ACS. It must also include ensuring that adequate funding is provided for the legal representation for the parents who are ensnared in this system. The parents who face the surveillance by ACS, who face prosecution, and the loss of what is most important to them, their children. And yet in this moment, the city is planning to reduce our budget. We call upon the city council to pressure the mayor and the mayor's office of criminal justice and the mayor's office of management and budget to restore our fiscal year 22 funding to fiscal year 21 levels. Our model of interdisciplinary representation links attorneys, social workers, and parent advocates to provide parents with comprehensive representation in Article 10 cases brought against them by ACS. We provide representation that is mandated by New York law to parents who face enormous obstacles, even in the best of times. Since we were created in 2007 by the city, the foster system census has shrunk by almost 50%. Together, we prevent thousands of children from ever entering the foster system. And for the parents whose children have entered the system, we reduce the, the family separation by months. Not only does our model actively divest from what is a policing system, ensuring that we are funded adequately is a good investment. According to one study, our work translated into 40 million in annual savings for the city. And it has translated most importantly into the priceless preservation of family bonds. And we, fulfill a need that is urgent and real. Even though the number of Article 10 cases has declined slightly during the COVID pandemic, our offices are representing just as many parents as before the pandemic. Our workload is I'm determined sorry. not just by new intake, but by our pending overall caseload. Cases last an average for two years and some cases pend much longer. Presently, cases are stalled due to, the pandemic, due to the pandemic and a backlog of cases is building. And the longer a case pens, the more complex it becomes and the more unfortunately likely it is for a family to be dissolved permanently. We will enter fiscal year 22 with a rising pending caseload of complicated cases with families on the line. So we're asking today that the city council take action now to ensure adequate funding for the family defense providers by pressuring the mayor, Mock J and OMB to provide us with revenue in fiscal year 22 that at least matches what we receive in fiscal year 21. And if I can just have one more moment to explain what council members might not know is that despite- Emma, you need 20, fiscal 21 or fiscal 20? We need fiscal 20, we need in fiscal year 22, we need what we are now getting in fiscal year 21. Okay. And okay. so just to explain, you know, what many people don't know is that despite our pending caseloads being on average 30% higher 
than they were in fiscal year 16, our contracts are still baselined at fiscal year 16 levels, which is basically a shortfall of 30% in needed funds. And then each year we have to go through this sort of cumbersome, lengthy contract amendment process to have restored what MACJ acknowledges is the funding we truly need, which is funding that corresponds to fiscal year 20 and fiscal year 21 caseload levels. We end up getting the funding eventually, but it's always late in the contract term, which makes it very unmanageable. Um, and so without intervention, we'll be forced once again to begin the year at a deficit and just have to hope and pray for restoration of our full funding. And this will force our caseloads to rise to unmanageable levels. Collectively, we need an additional $9.6 million for fiscal year 22 in order us to be fully restored. And this funding you know, should be restored as soon as possible to avoid an even worse crisis for parents facing the loss of their children in the system. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. I am now gonna call on Zainab Akbar followed by Tara Coles. Zainab Akbar, over to you. Time starts now. Good afternoon, council members. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Zainab Akbar and I'm the managing attorney of the Neighborhood Defender Service of Harlem's Family Defense Practice. NDS is a community-based public defender that provides high quality advocacy to the residents of Harlem and Northern Manhattan who are largely black and brown in family, housing, public benefits, criminal and immigration matters. As a defender with our main office located in the community we serve, we see the disparate impact of economic and racial inequities on our clients on a daily basis. The current public health crisis has heightened those realities and unless the city and state dedicate resources to our community the negative toll will be devastating and long-lasting. I'm here today alongside my colleagues from Bronx Defenders, Brooklyn Defender Services, and Center for Family Representation to urge City Council to fully fund our Right to the Family Advocacy Initiative. In particular, I would like to talk about the importance and the necessity of the City Council's funding of our work clearing our clients' records at the State Central Registry, otherwise known as the SCR. New York State has one of the most punitive and opaque registries in the country. New York uh, parents who are listed on the SCR are routinely denied employment based on unproven allegations. Tens of thousands of New Yorkers are on the registry and many don't even know that their names are listed, let alone that they were named in a report and then investigated and determined by ACS to have an indicated case. The majority of parents listed in the SCR never have cases filed against them in court and never have the allegations against them reviewed by a judge to determine whether they are supported by evidence and actually warrant drastically limiting a person's employability. In these cases where there is no court filing, parents are never assigned an attorney to inform them of their right to challenge their listing on the SCR, a listing which remains accessible to employers and others for years, restricting parents' ability to work and support their families. Employment opportunities that parents might be barred from because of an SCR record are exactly the kind that can help lift low-income New Yorkers out of poverty, work within a daycare, home health aid work, for example, and they are the kind of essential frontline jobs that our city needs more, more of as we come out of the pandemic. In the 1990s, the Second Circuit and the New York Court of Appeals held that people with indicated cases in the SCR are entitled to fair hearings before that information is released to employers, and OCFS established procedures to provide those hearings. Until the City Council funded this incredibly important initiative in 2019, New York City's low-income parents, who are mostly Black and Brown and who are disproportionately impacted by the registry, were not given access to the Council and SCR hearings that are necessary to amend the indicated case. Empirical data indicates that people of color are disproportionately unlikely to undertake the administrative challenge process to clear their records, even though the chances of prevailing are high for those who do. Although last year New York law was changed and there will be some modifications that could benefit parents, the law does not go into effect until January of 2022, and there's a new type of rehabilitation hearing that parents will have the opportunity to apply for to clear their record. Regardless of what kind of a hearing a parent is granted, they must present their case before an administrative law judge and advocate for the clearance of their That's record fine. against an experienced ACS attorney in a hearing where witness testimony and documentary evidence are presented and considered by the judge. It is critical that the city continue to provide low-income parents with access to attorneys to navigate the changes in the law and to represent them in these hearings to remove unjustifiable and unreasonable barriers to their employment. 
This is even more urgent as the unemployment rate in New York City remains high. People who challenge their inclusion in the SER and have their names cleared can get jobs that serve society and financially support their families once they are cleared. We ask that City Council fully fund the Right to Family Advocacy Initiative for fiscal year 22 so that low-income parents who are mostly Black and Brown and who are some of the most impacted by the pandemic can have the ability to remove unnecessary barriers to employment as the city returns to normalcy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zainab. Before I call on Tara Coles, I just want to read off the names for the following panel so you all can be ready. So after Tara Coles testifies, we will have Kathleen Brady Stepien, Catherine Wormfeld, Raisa Rodriguez, Samantha Sutphin Gray, and Marion White. So I will now call on Tara Coles. So time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I, my name is Tara Coles. I'm a litigation supervisor for the Center for Family Representation. And I just want to take a few moments to talk to you about the Right to Family Advocacy Initiative. Um, it provides desperately needed due process and legal representation and advocacy to services for individuals and families that are involved in the child welfare system. Um, our contracts with the city do not fund us to provide this critical representation before a court case is filed. And without it, parents do not have access to counsel before an Article 10 petition is filed. And so much happens before a petition is filed. There's the call to the child abuse registry. There's the knock at the door, often late at night or in early hours of the morning. The intrusive questions, the demand that you wake your sleeping child and have them disrobe so they can be inspected by an investigator the request that a parent sign, sometimes blank medical releases, and the question of neighbors, landlords, teachers, and others. Critical decisions are made at this stage and grave consequences um, can um, occur when it comes to how cases proceed, including whether a family will be diverted to preventive services or whether a case will be filed in court, and most significantly, whether children will be separated from their parents. And without access to counsel, parents are forced to meet with ACS, make these decisions, and navigate the state's interference into their family on their own. The result is that too many cases are filed and too many children are unnecessarily separated from their families. And all of this disproportionately impacts black and brown families from the city's low-income neighborhoods. At CFR, like our sister agencies, 100% of our clients are poor and 93% of them are people of color. I know, I know that our partner agencies have similar numbers. Through this initiative, low-income parents in New York City actually have access to attorneys, um, as well as hotlines, emails, and walk-in hours when they're faced with ACS investigations. Teams of attorneys, social workers, paralegals, and parent advocates are available to advise parents about their rights, their choices, and consequences of decisions made during an ACS investigation. Um, and they're able to meaningfully engage in the process and ACS is better informed about the family situation. Um, I also want to just quickly mention the legislation that's pending at both the state and local level that would require ACS to inform those investigate it investigates of their rights from the first knock at the door. Um, and we urge the council to pass this legislation. Uh, with the funding that the city council has provided, the family defense providers collectively represented over 550 parents between July 2019 and April 20, um, 2020, and we avoided unnecessary and traumatic family separations um, and often kept family court cases from ever being filed. Um, so I join um, the others that you've heard from on this panel and asking um, that this initiative be fully funded. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I just want to thank this entire panel. I, I, I um, I know how um, how difficult the work that you've been doing was before the pandemic, and the challenges that your clients were facing prior to the pandemic were, um, you know, were were so daunting. Um, but um, as you've uh, detailed in your testimony, and that the work and um, the challenges are are so much greater and that has a real impact on on um, 
on people's lives uh, and their families. And um, uh, the, that loss of, of time is, you know, can't be regained. Um, the, the time that, that um, families are, are, are split up. And so um, you certainly have my commitment that on the council side, we'll, we'll be pushing to expand the initiative and continue funding it um, and seeing, you know, that it's really had this, this value, but um, I wanna work with you all in the, in the coming months to do whatever we're able to do legislatively um, to, to, to improve this, the outcomes and improve the system um, and really orient it towards um, keeping families together and um, um, getting um, a better semblance of justice than, than, we, than our current system affords people. So, um, but I thank you very much for your testimony and for your time. Thank you to this entire panel for your testimony. I'm now gonna call our next panel. Our next panel will be as a reminder in the <clears throat> order, Kathleen Brady Stepien, Catherine Wormfeld, Raisa Rodriguez, Samantha Sutton Gray, and Mar Marion White. Over to Kathleen Brady Stepien. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Kathleen Brady Stepien. I am the president and CEO of the Council of Family and Child Caring Agencies, or CAFCA. Our member agencies include over 50 not-for-profit organizations in the city, providing foster care, adoption, family preservation, and juvenile justice services. I offer four key requests for you today, and the first relates to prevention and primary prevention. We recently conducted a survey of largely frontline staff in prevention services programs in the city with our friends at the Citizens Committee for Children. We found no surprise that families' needs have increased for food, for PPE, cleaning supplies, mental health counseling, housing, and many more needs. We are particularly concerned about our older adolescents as they've been out of school, they are exhibiting more maladaptive socialization behaviors and they're displaying enhanced mental health challenges. We are really proud of our members on the primary prevention front, uh, Bridge Builders, Children's Village, Good Shepherd and Graham Wyndham for partnering with families in their communities to build up the FECs over the last few years. Uh, we see these family enrichment centers as a very low cost investment that is also a racial and social justice measure given that they're available to communities without any child welfare system intervention. And we'd like to work with the council and the city to expand these. Our providers stand ready uh, to do more FECs in various communities. Uh, number two on workforce, our essential workers worked uh, tirelessly throughout the pandemic to support the city's kids and families. We join with the voices of the Human Services Council. We asked the city council to renew the COLA for human services workers in the FY22 budget at a rate of at least 3%. Uh, number three, the indirect cost rate. We strongly support the Human Services Council's call for full restoration of the indirect cost rate. We ask the city council to stand with us in full support of the need to fund our programs fully for these costs, which would be 171 million uh, needed to fully honor this funding initiative for fiscal year 20, 21, and 22. These funds are even more critical given the extraordinary costs that our providers have had to take on throughout the pandemic to support their staff and their families and our communities. And finally, we strongly support Fair Futures. This is an incredible initiative to provide our young people with strong, stable relationships with positive adult figures to provide coaching and tutoring and building towards a positive future for our young people. And we ask the mayor and the city council to make Fair Futures a permanent fixture in the city budget and to baseline $20 million for this important program. Thank you so much, Chair Levin and all the other uh, city council members for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Kathleen, and congratulations on your new position. Thanks again, Kathleen. I'm now gonna call on Catherine Wormfeld for testimony. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Kate Wormfeld, the Director of Family Court Programs at the Center for Court Innovation. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. 
As you know, the center has enjoyed a longstanding partnership with council on improving public safety while reducing the use of incarceration and the footprint of the police, which is why we're asking for council's continued support on the points of agreement to close Rikers Island, which feels more important now than ever as we emerge from this public health crisis and face a reckoning with systemic racism and harm to communities of color. So to that end, we're seeking renewal funding for Project Reset, New York City's first foray into early diversion prior to the criminal court process with council funding the program in the Bronx, Brooklyn Felony Alternatives to Incarceration, an evidence-based pilot program for people otherwise facing jail or prison time, Driver Accountability Program, a proportionate response achieving accountability in vehicle and traffic law cases, and the center's innovative, innovative criminal justice programs, core funding for a range of community-based justice initiatives across New York City. So I also want to talk today about how we can move further upstream to reduce intergenerational cycles of cross-system involvement when folks first have contact with the justice system as children through an ACS investigation or a family court filing, often leading to the trauma of family separation and lifelong consequences. Our Strong Starts Court Initiative seeks to address this cycle with a transformative, multidisciplinary, collaborative approach to child protection cases involving children birth to three years of age, the very first point of entry for these children at a critical stage of development that too often leads to a lifetime of system involvement, including criminal court and future child welfare involvement. Notably, a significant percentage of the parents served by Strong Starts, at least half were involved in the child welfare system as children, and almost all are black and brown, a powerful reminder of the need for reform. Strong Starts seeks to transform the family court child protection process with several core strategies, including a clinical social worker who's a neutral party, not part of the court or ACS, coordinates a multidisciplinary court team consisting of all the attorneys, service providers, and case planners that often work in silos. Keeping families together wherever possible and where children have been removed, maximizing contact between parents and children, and working tirelessly towards family stability and reunification through a strengths-based approach. Clinical assessments for all families to connect them with targeted evidence-backed services based on expert knowledge of the infant family field, monthly clinical conferences with the whole court team to problem solve and move cases forward, detailed reports to the judges who provide monthly oversight and who attest to how this allows them to resolve cases much more efficiently and with the information they need to assess risk and make informed decisions towards permanency. Training, consultation, and psychoeducation to the court and community on trauma and child development in order to leverage the impact for all court-involved families. This approach has been even more critical during the pandemic and disruptive court processes that has led to family preservation and reunification on cases that would otherwise have languished. Attorneys and judges often tell us that every family should have the benefit of strong starch, which is why this budget cycle we're fundraising to expand the program to Manhattan, which is the only borough that does not have strong starts programming. Currently, we're funded solely with private foundation support and know that the only way to expand and sustain programming is to attract the investment and commitment of city and state government. We thank council for its time today and for all the support already received and look forward to continuing to work together to, to reduce intergenerational cycles of system involvement through our criminal and family justice programming. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Now I'm gonna call on Raisa Rodriguez, followed by Samantha Sutfin Gray. Over to Raisa. Time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you so much, Council Member Levin and um, all of the council staff um, for this important hearing today. Um, my name is Raisa Rodriguez. I am Associate Executive Director for Policy and Advocacy at CCC. CCC is a multi-issue independent child advocacy organization that aims to ensure all New York children are healthy, housed, educated, and safe. Um, I'll sound a little bit like a broken record right now, like my colleagues really pointed to the fact that this time has been so hard on children and families, and in particular, New Yorkers who were already struggling before COVID and before the economic collapse. We know that those who are hurting most now are those who were living in poverty before the pandemic, experiencing severe rent burden um, and other risk factors that we know um, children and families face. Um, I wanna call attention to a number of key priorities and look forward to working with the council 
um, to make sure that these priorities are met in this year's budget. In the area of child welfare, as my colleague Kathleen mentioned, we are excited to have undergone a survey um, of qualitative data with, with Kafka. Um, I won't go through the findings, but I will tell you that what we hear um, from providers is um, that more and more families are experiencing need and hardship. 37% um, of survey respondents also indicated that their current contracted funding um, needs to be supplemented to uh, meet those needs. I'm sorry about that. Um, I will move quickly to uh, the area of homelessness. Thank you so much, Council Member Levin, for his continued uh, partnership uh, to combat family homelessness. CCC is a co-lead in the Family Homelessness Coalition. Um, we aim to tackle family homelessness by three key strategies. The first is strengthening preventive services earlier on before a housing crisis, um, ensuring and offering on-site support services and shelter, um, and expanding the options of, of affordable housing units. Um, thank you again for your leadership. We look forward to working with you. The availability of $6 billion in federal aid marks an important opportunity to make sure that we increase rent vouchers, as an example. Um, now is the time to pass intro 146 um, to make sure that families experiencing housing instability have access to more competitive um, rent vouchers. In the area of youth justice, very quickly, I want to point out CCC is a member of the Youth Justice Research Collaborative. Our work here is really aimed at um, evaluating and assessing the implementation of Raise the Age legislation. Um, what I'll call out is that in our qualitative work with this group, um, surveying not only service, service providers, but defenders and um, youth engaged or involved in justice systems. We hear from service providers time and time again that what youth need to really prevent system involvement is all the services that we know help, whether it's health, mental health, access to, to income and housing supports. Um, and so here, uh, you know, what we want to make sure we point out is the critical need to target youth services to youth who are most at risk of systems involvement. And then lastly, in the area of food insecurity, CCC echoes the priorities of colleagues in Lunch for Learning and the New York COVID Food Coalition. And we urge the city to take immediate steps to combat food insecurity and support families struggling with, with hunger by addressing emergency feeding and benefit access, addressing hunger in schools, and some supporting community-based organizations that feed New Yorkers. Um, I will be sub submitting longer testimony. And at the end of that testimony is CCC's full um, analysis of the preliminary budgets for fiscal year 22. Thank you so much for your time and I'm happy to take any uh, questions. Thank you, Raisa. I'm gonna call on Samantha Sutton Gray for testimony. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Samantha Sutton Gray, and I'm the Vice President of Performance and Quality at SCO Family of Services. And I'm also a member of the Clinicians in Child Welfare, CCW. I've worked for SCO Family of Services for two years and been in the field as a clinician and researcher for 15 years. Thank you to Chair Levin and the members of the Committee on General Welfare for the opportunity to testify during today's preliminary budget hearing. Today, I'm submitting a report for review by the committee on behalf of the clinicians in child welfare and asking for the committee to review our recommendations as it relates to telehealth for children. The clinicians in child welfare whose members promote best practice and advocate, advocate to enhance the delivery of services in the child welfare system released a report on why telehealth services are so critical, especially to the communities hit hardest by the virus. Previously inaccessible to New York's Medicaid recipients, expanded telehealth services have made strides in closing New York's health equity gap, deeply benefiting the groups previously excluded from these services. The member, the paper findings have made clear that the city and state must permanently remove harsh restrictions, hamstringing access to these critical services. The paper, Accomplishments of Telehealth Within New York's Child Welfare System, an exploratory study, uh, draws from quantitative and qualitative study results from 249 participants who responded to the survey to highlight how communities have been used have used behavioral health telehealth during the pandemic. Of those surveyed, 120 were parents or caregivers, 71 were foster parents, 51 were the individuals receiving services, and seven did not declare what type of um, individual they were. 
The key findings included 76% of the participants stated that they were able to connect to additional supports that were not accessible prior to telehealth. Two, the majority of children and families reported telehealth to help um, is helping them to meet treatment goals and develop or continue the therapeutic alliance in the comfort and safety of their own homes without travel time and cost. Three participants identified safety, convenience, and ease of making and keeping appointments as areas improved through telehealth. Four, most noted that they were able to maintain or grow the connection with their therapist, service provider, or care coordinator, and were able to work together to accomplish the treatment goals. And lastly, the lack of techno technological infrastructure continues to be a challenge, and that's something that we truly advocate that the city council and ACS take a look at in terms of how we can fund better technology for our ser um, service recipients. I'm submitting the full report for the record. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you, Samantha. I'll now call on Marion White. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. My name is Marion White and I'm here on behalf of the Child Abuse Prevention Program of the New York Foundling. The Foundling is one of New York City's oldest and largest nonprofit providers of human services. And our Child Abuse Prevention Program educates thousands of children each year about their right to personal safety. First and foremost, I wanna thank Chairman Levin and the committee members for their unwavering commitment to our community's children. For the past two years, the Child Abuse Prevention Program has been allocated a generous grant of $248,000 from the Initiative to Combat Sexual Assault, which has been crucial to our ability to prevent abuse from occurring and from going unreported. The family is requesting renewed funding for CAP, Child Abuse Prevention Program, to address the ongoing threat of child abuse at this critical moment in our community. Changes necessitated by the pandemic have placed tremendous stress on families and strained family relationships. This places children at risk, serious risk. Just last week, Aiden Wolf was killed at home by an abusive family member. An increased online activity has also created a dangerous opportunity for internet predators. At the same time, children who were cut off from their teachers and other mandated reporters who were on the front lines of detecting and reporting signs of abuse to authorities. CAP is designed to help third and fourth grade children recognize situations that might be abusive and assure them that they have the right to seek help from a trusted adult if they are experiencing abuse. The program uses relatable child-sized puppets to discuss safe and unsafe and confusing touches and after the workshop, children are given the opportunity to stay and speak to a trained counselor or our prevention specialist. During our, our virtual workshops, students have been given an opportunity to speak with the counselors at the end of the program, either through a Google breakout room, or we also have an activity sheet that the kids can actually request to speak to the counselor. And that's worked very well. Um, next page, one sec. <laughs> The impact of the work is clearly illustrated by the testimonies of the people we work with. For example, one guidance counselor shared the following story. One of my students was suffering from sexual abuse perpetrated by her mom's boyfriend. The student would normally not have been brought to my attention. However, thanks to your presentation, this eight-year-old girl found the strength and courage to disclose the abuse to one of our presenters. The student mentioned to me later that the show inspired her to be brave despite the threats from the perpetrator. Had it not been for your program, the abuse would have continued into the summer. That was from last year. In cases like this, when a child discloses a serious case of abuse, our team of prevention specialists are trained to respond appropriately and work hand in hand with schools to make reports to either the state central registry or law enforcement as necessary. We look forward to continuing our partnership with schools and with city council to prevent abuse from continuing unreported in our community as we emerge from this crisis. Thank you for the giving me this opportunity. If you have any questions, happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Marion. I am now going to call on our next panel. Our next panel of witnesses will be in the following order, Eric Lee, Tierra Labrada, Ted Houghton, and Jessica Yeager. I'll now call on Eric Lee. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. 
Um, my name is Eric Lee. I'm Director of Policy and Planning for Homeless Services United. Uh, thank you, Chair Levin and members of the General Welfare Committee for allowing me to testify today. For the consideration of time, I will summarize my written testimony. Um, at this critical juncture, when the city is poised to recover, the council has the opportunity to lay groundwork uh, to best prepare the city for the challenging months ahead. Recognizing the extremely tough financial situation that the city is facing, we're very grateful to the council for its leadership and commitment to maintaining level funding for homeless and eviction prevention services in the FY22 budget. We're hopeful that the council will also institutionalize pandemic related expansions to homeless services to preserve gains made such as expanding capacity for stabilization beds for street homeless individuals. To maintain viability of the city's entire nonprofit sector, um, which is relied on for a myriad of human services, including eviction prevention, emergency shelter, and public benefits assistance. Um, the FY22 budget must invest an additional $171 million to honor the city's prior funded commitments for the indirect cost rates uh, for nonprofit city contracted uh, contracts there, retroactive to FY20. Just last week, the city notified nonprofits that would further slash reimbursement rates to a dismal 30% of their approved contract rates for FY21 and 22. Um, as Chair Levin and Councilmember Rosenthal raised earlier, um, due to chronic payment delays, DHS contracted nonprofit providers are particularly unable to absorb this indirect cut. Uh, HSU thanks Commissioner Banks for his commitment to working with providers to address late payment delays. Um, with regards to the commissioner's testimony that the majority of invoices are aged less than 60 days, um, invoice policy actually calls for payment to be, to be made within seven days. Um, and we work, look forward to working with, collaboratively with the department to fix this. As touched on earlier by the committee, uh, several nonprofit organizations are owed over $10 million each, and some of them are considering terminating their contracts at the end of this fiscal year. We urge the council to stand, to continue to stand with nonprofit providers and hold the administration accountable for its obligations to nonprofits, uh, demanding that they register contracts and amendments promptly and pay invoices in full and on time. As housing courts reopen, eviction prevention providers will be essential to ensuring that as many tenants as possible remain stably housed. Some home-based providers already report operating at maximum capacity, and we urge the council to commit additional funding to hire additional home-based uh, staff within zip codes serving the highest eviction rates. We are heartened by news that the state legislature is seeking to raise state FEPS rent levels, and HSU is grateful to Chair Levin and members of the uh, council that co-sponsored intro 146. And we urge the entire council to pass this piece of legislation this budget cycle. Um, within OTDA's, uh, temp with OTDA's temporary wa waiver for the lawsuit requirement for state FEPS eligibility, which was won through the hard av uh, legal advocacy of Legal Aid Society, um, families must be able to access this important rental assistance voucher in a timely manner, given that the waiver tentatively, ex tentatively expires May 1st. Um, to accomplish this, HRA must commit uh, funding to hire additional FEPS centralized determination unit staff, which is a current team of only 12 people, as well as additional homeless diversion unit staff to be able to timely uh, complete and process FEPS applications. And we also recommend that the embed FEPS specialist within HRA centers uh, moving forward to be able to help people with in-person applications after the pandemic. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Eric, for your testimony. Now I'm gonna call on Tierra Labrada. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Levin. Good to see you again, members of the New York City General Welfare Committee. My name is Tierra Labrada, the Senior Policy Analyst at the Supportive Housing Network of New York. Uh, the network is a membership organization representing the nonprofit developers and operators of supportive housing, their staff and tenants. For the last several weeks through testimony and outreach to council, the network and our partners have been advocating on behalf of our members and community for several things to be included in the fiscal year 22 budget. And we are encouraged by the passage of the American Rescue Plan, which will bring $6 billion in needed assistance to the city. As such, we are calling on the city to do the following. First, fully fund the indirect cost rate initiative. Uh, as our partners mentioned already, the retroactive cuts to the indirect cost rate are detrimental to the nonprofit sector. 
Not only are providers grappling with increased expenses due to COVID, they now have to retcon their budgets to account for gaps in funding because the city has failed them. We stand with our partners in calling for $171 million to fully fund the initiative for fiscal year 20, 21, and fiscal year 22, and to ensure full funding in the years to come. In addition to fully funding the ICR, we're also calling for a restoration of at least a 3% COLA increase on nonprofit human service contracts and full funding of emergency pay retroactive to March 20, 2020. Second, with the influx of stimulus into the city, we are calling on the council and administration to increase rental subsidies to the fair market rent, making them more competitive with programs like Section 8 and broadening housing options for people exiting shelter. We can do this with the passage of Intro 146, which would increase city FEHEPS vouchers. We can also achieve this by increasing supportive housing scattered site contracts to the fair market rent. Uh, finally, I know this is out of the purview of the General Welfare Committee, but uh, one of the points that are definitely our priorities is the HPD hiring freeze. Uh, currently, there are dozens of vacancies across HPD's Development, Preservation, and Rental Assistance Administration departments, which are beginning to impact the pace of supportive housing development and move-ins. While we sincerely appreciate the tremendous effort to HPD staff, um, they've made amazing strides throughout the pandemic, allowing for the largest number of supportive housing units ever to be financed in a six-month period. There is a tremendous toll to long periods of understaffing and overworking. And because some positions have not seen salary increases in almost a decade, there is potential that the city could lose even more staff with no capacity to fill the vacancies. Even positions that are fully funded by the federal government are now being held vacant. Now it's not the time for the city to skimp on housing but to increase efforts to ensure that New Yorkers have a safe, stable place to call home. Uh, thank you, and I welcome any questions. Thank you for your testimony, Tiara. I'll now call on Ted Houghton. Time starts now. Hi, uh, my name is Ted Houghton. I'm the president of Gateway Housing, um, and I've been working in government and nonprofits for about 30 years now. And I just want to limit my, my testimony on the subject of Intro 146 and funding uh, city FEPS vouchers and other locally funded rent subsidies at fair market rents. This is a really strategic and big idea that we can do that can really be a game changer for us. We have focused and focused and focused on providing shelter and meeting the, the terms of the right to shelter in New York City, we really need to shift that and really turn it into a right to housing. And the way to do that is to provide rental subsidies that extend for as long as people need them and provide enough money uh, coming in each month to really uh, allow them to meet the market and actually afford to, to live in the housing that's out there. Um, we are on the verge of a potential uh, eviction tsunami that may really increase uh, homelessness if we don't move quickly. And that's why I urge you to, uh, to really to, to provide funding for 2022 um, 2021 now so that we had the next mayor will have money to work with uh, when they're uh, when we try to do a lot more rentals more quickly as the effects of the pandemic wear off. There's eight and a half million people living in New York City. Uh, they've got to live somewhere. And right now we are choosing to make 85,000 of them live in shelter. And we say, well, that's because of the right to shelter and other things. But the fact is, is that we are putting people into one of the most expensive institutional settings uh, instead of into their own homes that they have independence and support and are able to succeed. Uh, the effects on children, on seniors, on disabled people of being homeless are so well documented at this point that any cost just about is going to justify helping people stay in housing. The improvement in children's outcomes, the improvement in health care, uh, all the different benefits that we see from lives in stable, affordable housing justify just about any kind of uh, expense spent on these rent subsidies. But the fact is, is that even if we increase spending on rent subsidies, we're going to move families out of shelter more quickly. 
and that's going to reduce cost of shelter. We're going to prevent families from entering shelter in the first place, and that's going to reduce costs. And we're going to reduce all sorts of Medicaid costs and other kinds of uh, emergency care. So I urge you to try to get something into this budget now. Thank you. Thank you, Ted, for your testimony. I'll now call on Jessica Yeager, followed by Craig Hughes. Over to Jessica Yeager. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Levin and members of the General Wel Welfare Committee. My name is Jessica Yeager and I'm the Vice President of Policy and Planning at Wynn, the largest provider of shelter to homeless families with children in New York City. I'm here today to discuss a pending expense before the City Council that the City has the funding it needs to enact thanks to the latest federal stimulus bill. The proposed expense is the increase of rental voucher values to Section 8 levels, as outlined in 146. I'm very happy to be here as one of the many voices making the case for this important bill. bill. Intro 146 is critical to helping families break the cycle of homelessness and housing instability. Despite overwhelming support, it has languished for three years in the City Council because of the administration's concerns about funding. Thousands of New Yorkers have publicly pushed for its passage, many describing how difficult it is to find housing with the voucher. A diverse cross-section of 80 leading nonprofits and civic institutions have signed their support for the bill. Yet families are still spending months in shelter, unable to use their vouchers because the vouchers pay hundreds of dollars less for rent than market rate values. With more than six billion in federal stimulus dollars coming directly to the city, we ask you to finally bring intro 146 to a vote and pass this crucial bill for our most vulnerable neighbors. The city FAPS voucher is intended to offer a clear exit path out of shelter for eligible families. But because the voucher amount is so low, that exit path is blocked. Wynn has been monitoring street easy data on NYC rents for years as we have fought for this update to the voucher. At no point during this time, including since COVID hit, has there been even a single neighborhood in the city where the median asking rent for a two bedroom apartment has been, has been within reach of a family with a city FEPS voucher. Not a single month in a single neighborhood for at least two years. There's wide consensus on the clear solution to this problem. In order to make city thefts an effective tool, its rents must reflect the actual cost of housing in New York City. City thefts maximum rents should be pegged to the rents in the Section 8 voucher program, which are, which are based on New York City's fair market rent. 37 of your colleagues agree, 80 leading nonprofit groups agree, the Daily News editorial board agrees, and most importantly, thousands of New Yorkers struggling to find housing with this broken voucher agree. While the city is facing unprecedented fiscal challenges right now, without change, the shelter system risks being burdened way over capacity with families experiencing COVID-related hardships. Additionally, as the city emerges from COVID-19, helping its residents to successfully enter permanent housing will have strong economic effects, helping it to fill our housing units and place families and neighborhoods throughout the city that will benefit from their presence. We must do all that we can to widen the door out of shelter. This is the right step, and the best use of tax and federal stimulus dollars to help families who need to find a home. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Jessica. Thanks again, Jessica, for your testimony. I'm gonna now call on Craig Hughes. Uh, sorry, before, Craig, before you begin, I just, I, I, Jessica, I just, I just also wanna thank Wynn for, for their advocacy around uh, 146, which has been uh, extraordinary you know, from, from the get-go. So just thank you very much, appreciate that. Thanks, Craig. Thanks for your forbearance, Craig. Uh, I echo those thoughts about Wynn's advocacy around 146, um, uh, which has been incredible. Uh, we have the Safety Net Project, which is um, uh, where I work, uh, also are in strong support of that. Um, before I go into my formal testimony, I just want to um, take Commissioner Banks up on something he had said about uh, sticking to having the choice between facts and opinion and, and really um, agreeing with him on that. And uh, to that point, just a very brief for the record uh, summation of how homeless counts work in New York City in terms of just the Department of Homeless Services numbers. Uh, he was correct in pointing out that actually there are multiple shelter systems in New York City. And unfortunately, there's a larger public policy problem 
of only acknowledging much of the time the Department of Homeless Services numbers. With that, even within the Department of Homeless Services numbers, uh, there are uh, significant uh, kind of misleading data points that get put out there. So uh, just for the record, every day or almost every day, the city Department of Homeless Services puts a, a document up, which is its daily count. Um, and it's a very misleading document. In the middle of the document, it says total shelter census and it says 51,453 individuals. But there's two boxes, one on the left and one on the right, uh, the single adults and the family intake boxes. Those are not actually included in the total shelter census box. And so actually that 51,453 has to be added 306 pe uh, 118 people in the overnight drop-ins, 1,150 people in the safe haven utilization, hundreds of people that are sheltered in PATH and APIC intake processes and so on. Thousands of more people are actually included in that number that are just not talked about um, because the city strategically says this is who's in the mainstream shelter census. They're all DHS overseen. It's ridiculous. It's a political matter. And I do hope the commissioner can also stick to the facts in reporting the number of homeless people in his systems. Uh, with that in my testimony, um, I'm actually going to testify today uh, uh, on behalf of Peter Malvan. Peter is a uh, member of the safety net activist who was homeless for many years uh, and couldn't be here today, but he um, uh, wanted to make sure his words got said and I will do that very quickly. Um, so good morning and thank you, Chair Levin. Uh, I begin with the fact that over the past year in New York City and its Department of Homeless Services has ignored CDC guidelines to place folks in single rooms or support hygiene of those on the street by more than doubling the number of sweeps on short notice. The effect is terrorizing those on the street constantly and interfering with census and annual counts of unsheltered by which the unsheltered people by which the uh, the city gets financial assistance uh, from the federal government. And despite an initial promise of 75% uh, in female reimbursement for moving people into hotel uh, individual hotel rooms, uh, it doubled the city doubled up people sometimes in spaces where beds were as close or closer than in congregate shelters. Uh, HBD has ignored the exodus from New York City of those who could afford the housing units. It has provided billions to developers who cannot rent them as the city's vacancy rate grows and incomes decrease. It has, in collusion with DHS, averted using its own guidelines to house those living in communities. I'm expired. May I finish, uh, Chair? Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, it has inclusion with DHS averted using its own guidelines to how those house those living in communities where buildings are built to allocate 10% of community preference uh, with those living on the streets or in uh, hotel and shelters and communities. Uh, a budget of over 3 billion per year goes to shelter people at more than th uh, 3,400 uh, for years on end. Uh, city fest vouchers uh, pay under 1300 a month with $800 a month for rooms uh, and only utilize at about 4% uh, of their issuance. Uh, I'm confident that a majority of that can be seen to actually be uh, in the $800 shared rooms. City Fed vouchers need to be parallel to Section 8 or fair market rent. This can be accomplished by voting uh, in Intro 146. Uh, it has a veto-proof majority. Uh, the City Council backs the bill. Uh, there is no more excuse around federal funding. The bill needs to pass. Homeless people need to get housed. Uh, rescue aid has come from the federal government with a guarantee of 100% reimbursement for FEMA up to uh, um, uh, up through September to safely place people in hotels. Still, the housing process is shrouded in bureaucracy and mystery. An independent housing placement requires a homeless housing assistance application that must be submitted to DHS and passed along to HPD. Yet, in looking up home, uh, the homeling, homeless assistance housing application, one finds 2010 online. One finds 2010 e uh, housing application information. Um, and often that is congregate and transitional housing, uh, which is not uh, safe for many people. Uh, it is time to do the math and science. Uh, the US CDC guidance said to place people in single rooms or support access to hygiene while people are on the street and get shelter residents out of congregate shel shelters. The cost of recycling people in shelters and terrorizing those in the street, increasing infection risk and rates for all of New York City will cost our city an economic crisis federal dollars by disruption of accuracy of the US census, uh, the, the census and the, um, the annual homeless tallies. Uh, our vacancy rate, this is my last piece here, our vacancy rate is on the rise with plunging incomes and this sets, uh, this sets the stage to house people and keep people housed at a profit over the amount spent annually to keep people in unstable uh, settings. Those on the streets and in shelter and hotels could be housed and those at the risk of homelessness can be sustained, but the homeless industry must end. We can no longer spend billions to hide, degrade and destabilize New Yorkers while placing the entire city at health risk and those uh, at risk of homelessness and downward spirals to the desolation of those, uh, to desolation of experiencing uh, shelter.
That's all. Oh. Sorry, I got muted. I was pointing to my unmute button. Uh, so those were the words of, of Peter Malvan, um, who is a member of the Safety Net Activists and who couldn't be here today. Uh, and I'm honored to testify on his behalf. Uh, thank you. Great. Thank you, Craig. And, and, and obviously, thank you for um, uh, for your continued advocacy on, on a lot of the issues that are affecting um, the most vulnerable New Yorkers. And um, so uh, I just want to express my appreciation and gratitude. Thank you so much again, Craig. Um, I'm now going to turn over moderating to my colleague, Natalie Omery. Natalie is the policy analyst for the General Welfare Committee. So I'll turn over Hi. moderating to Natalie. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Natalie Omari, and I'm a policy analyst for the General Welfare, and I'm going to assist in moderating the rest of today's hearing. I will now call on the next panel for public testimony in the following order. James Meager, Gabriella Sandoval Rakenna, and Amy Barish. James, you may begin when the sergeant prompts you. Your time starts now. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Jimmy Marr and I am policy director at Safe Horizon, the nation's largest nonprofit victim services organization. Safe Horizon offers a client-centered trauma-informed response to 250,000 New Yorkers each year who've experienced violence or abuse. And we're using an anti-racist lens to guide our work. Over many years, the council has been a key supporter of our programs, helping adult, adolescent, and child victims of violence. Today, I'll focus on two key initiatives that are funded by the council and contracted through HRA, the Supportive Alternatives to Violent Encounters or SAVE Initiative, and Immigrant Opportunities Initiative or IOI, uh, which provide critical funding to Safe Horizon and to our community partners across the anti-violence field to provide trauma-informed responses to survivors. I'll also discuss the overwhelming need for meaningful housing assistance to survivors and our support for Intro 146. Um, our domestic violence law project, DVLP, utilizes funding through the supportive alternatives to violent encounters initiative to provide direct legal services to indigent victims of domestic violence and family, supreme and integrated DV courts throughout the city. Due to the pandemic, court operations have been severely affected. Um, and even though the family courts continue to operate on an emergency basis, hearing only emergency matters, our attorneys continue to assist the family courts in filing emergency petitions and motions on behalf of survivors. In the months and years ahead, as our city recovers from COVID-19, um, COVID our legal services and the services provided by our legal partners across the city will be critical for the many, many survivors who are waiting for the courts to return to normal. We're seeking restoration of funding for this initiative. And our immigration law project uh, utilizes funding through IOI to provide expert legal advice and representation to undocumented survivors of crime, violence, abuse, trafficking, and torture. Um, during this pandemic, the federal government kept immigration courts open when New York remained on pause, our staff served as essential frontline workers in the fight to protect immigrant victims and their families. Um, our work didn't end during this pandemic, rather our community of advocates uh, worked even harder. Um, we're also seeking for this initiative funding to be restored as well. Lastly, Safe Horizon joins the calls of housing advocates across New York City in urging the council to pass Intro 146 as soon as possible. Clients across all of our programs need safe, affordable, stable housing. So many victims and survivors of all forms of violence call our hotlines and turn to our programs for housing assistance every day, and the housing options we can offer remain too few in number. Temporary emergency shelter will always serve a purpose for survivors, but our city needs to do everything it can to connect New Yorkers experiencing homelessness to permanent housing. Although it is not the only solution for our homelessness crisis, passing Intro 146 and raising the amount of the city FEPS rental voucher to fair market rent is one key part of any comprehensive housing plan. By increasing the, uh, the voucher amount, more of our clients will be able to leave shelter and find safe, stable housing. This will also increase geographic mobility for voucher holders, allowing survivors to better navigate their safety and find the housing right for them. Um, our mission is to provide support, prevent violence, and promote justice for victims of crime and abuse, their families and communities. When we say justice for victims, we mean so much more than just criminal justice. Rather, we cannot promote justice for victims and survivors without also demanding housing justice and economic justice. Our clients need safe, stable, affordable housing to find justice and healing, and we advocate for equitable access to housing resources and subsidies for all people experiencing homelessness. The help available to you as a person experiencing homelessness should not be determined by the door you walk through, whether that's an HRA DV shelter, a DHS shelter, or a DOICD shelter. When we invest in the safety, healing, and well-being of individual New Yorkers, we invest in the safety, healing, and well-being of New York City as a whole. Thank you so much for the opportunity to testify today. 
Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, James. Next up will be Gabriella Sandoval Urkenna. Gabriella, you may begin when prompted by the sergeant. Your time starts now. You're still muted. Thank you for that. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Levin, Council members, and committee staff. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today at the preliminary budget hearing. My name is Gabriela Sandoval Requena, and I am the senior policy analyst of uh, New Destiny Housing. New Destiny is a 27 year old nonprofit committed to ending the cycle of domestic violence and homelessness by connecting families to safe, permanent housing and services. Uh, we've submitted that written testimony, uh, so I'd like to use the time to underscore the takeaways and our four recommendations. Um, as you know, uh, domestic violence continues to be the number one driver of family homelessness in New York City. Uh, HRA manages the largest uh, domestic violence shelter system in the country. And additionally, 41% of families that enter the separate DHS shelter cite domestic violence as the cause of their homelessness. Uh, COVID-19 has only exacerbated the predicament for survivors with stay-at-home orders, forcing them to make the impossible choice between shelter or remaining with their abusers. Um, and this is largely due because housing resources are very limited for survivors of the kids. The Department of Social Services 2020 annual report on exits from New York City DV shelters reveals that 37% of the 2,700 households that left the DV shelter system were actually transferred into the DHS system with over a thousand households uh, that is actually a thousand households that left the shelter for shelter in 2020, while only 64 households moved to permanent housing by using a voucher or rent subsidy. Uh, so we urge the city to take much needed steps to expand equitable access to housing. And for that, for uh, New Destiny makes four recommendations. First is to pass and fund intro 146. Uh, second is to allow HRA shelter residents equal access to HPD homeless uh, set-aside units, which would cost the city no additional funding. Uh, third uh, is to increase accountability in the HRA domestic violence shelter system by requiring it to maintain daily census like DHS does, uh, which would also cost the city no additional funding. Uh, and fourth is to leverage federal funding to develop a 10 million innovation fund to support best practices that mitigate or avoid the trauma of homelessness for survivors. Um, for more information, I would like to invite you to um, check out our website and see our 2021 policy platform that's available there. And I also urge you to support the priorities of the Family Homelessness Coalition. Uh, that's a coalition of shelter and housing providers, advocates and other nonprofits um, homeless for uh, helping homeless um, New Yorkers in, in New York City. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to submit the testimony today and uh, I welcome any questions you might have. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank you. Thank you, Gabriella. Thank you for all the work that New Destiny does. Um, next up, we will have Amy Barish. Amy, you may begin once prompted. Time starts now. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to testify today. My name is Amy Barish. I'm the executive director at Her Justice. For 28 years, Her Justice has provided women in New York City with free legal information, advice, brief services, and full representation in family court matters, divorces, and immigration matters under VAWA. Our clients are all living in poverty in the five boroughs of New York City. Most are moms, many are survivors of partner violence, and 90% are black and brown women. Support from the City Council has been critical in making our mission possible, and we're deeply grateful for the Council's continued partnership. Her Justice offers our legal help through a pro bono first model, our small legal department of 21 people trains and mentors thousands of volunteer attorneys who are paired with women who are unlikely to obtain legal help otherwise. This approach has allowed us to reach tens of thousands of women over the years, far more than we could have reached on our own. Over 6,000 women and children were helped by Her Justice in 2020 alone. The council's support of Her Justice through both the SAVE and Speakers initiatives will be only that much more vital as we continue to assist the clients we already have whose cases are lasting longer under COVID as they get stalled in the courts, while we also manage the continually changing city court processes, as well as respond to the coming increase in legal demand that we anticipate. We urge the council to appreciate the extra work facing all legal services providers when courts are in crisis. Women like our clients must rely on a civil justice system that has been historically and systematically under-resourced. In the before times, our clients sometimes spent hours, days, and years moving through the family courts to access basic freedoms, personal autonomy, financial independence, and safety from abuse. 
When these courts do not function well or smoothly, there is a real economic consequence for the litigants. Case delays impose a cost on litigants and create barriers to resources to which they are entitled. The barriers and delays under COVID are unprecedented. During this COVID year, the model we use at Her Justice showed itself to be flexible. We brought our helpline to our homes. We created specially equipped spaces in our offices from which clients could appear remotely in court if they didn't have access to safe and reliable technology. We revamped our community outreach efforts using technology so that we actually reached more people than we usually do. And we recently released a report about the child support process as it existed before COVID as a way to assist the courts in imagining a new system for child support that would function after COVID. But how we work is inextricably linked to how the courts work. Due to the pandemic, the city's civil courts have experienced closures and partial reopenings, creating confusion and uncertainty for litigants and frankly for attorneys as well. As sympathetic as we are to the challenges facing the enormous state court system in having to adapt to this public health crisis, we struggle to understand why the process in family court is so ad hoc and confusing, even for lawyers who work hard to be well informed. This court confusion will exacerbate the long term harm that has been borne by women like our clients, and that will have ripple effects for their children and all of the human service providers in this city. I'd like to highlight a few key points quickly. The family courts are only hearing cases that they de deem essential. Most litigants only go to family court once they've been unable to address their issues on their own. So our clients don't understand what the courts think are essential and not essential. For victims of partner violence, orders of protection are important, but often addressing child visitation or child support can be even more important. I know I'm running out of time, I'll go super fast. The court processes are confusing to non-lawyers in a good day. It's not a good day. They're confusing now to lawyers as well. It's very hard for us to counsel clients when we have a hard time understanding what's going on. I honestly don't know how unrepresented people are figuring it out. Many victims of partner violence suffer financial abuse. Under COVID, as we know, there's been a great deal of job loss and economic harm. Debt and damaged credit because of financial abuse can make it hard to leave a relationship because you can't rent an apartment, get a job, or buy a house or car. It's a cruel irony that we have clients who are being sued by third-party debt buyers for debts accrued by their abusers at the same time as they cannot file or move forward a child support case in the family court. And our immigrant clients are in extreme crisis. For them too, the lack of child support is a huge barrier since they've been ineligible for relief under most federal relief programs during COVID. Sometimes child support is the only economic relief that they have an ability to seek. So in short, we thank the council for their support for the essential legal services that we provide to women living in poverty in New York City. And we look forward to continuing to work with you to support this community. Thank you very much, Amy. Thank you for your testimony and the work you do. Thank you for your testimony, Amy. I will now call on the next panel in the following order. We have Nicholas West, Rachel Sabella, Joel Berg, Molly Krakowski and Gregory Silverman. Nick, you may begin once the sergeant prompts you. Your time starts now. Sorry, who, who are we waiting on? Oh, Nick, I think you're up. Can you, are you trying to speak yet, Nick? Mr. Buess, we do not hear you. Maybe now. Keep trying to mic check. Hmm. Okay, well, Nick, we're going to come back to you. Okay? We'll come back. Um, we can move on to our next panelist. We have Rachel 
Sabala. Time starts now. Thank you. My name is Rachel Sabella and I'm the director of No Kid Hungry New York. We work to address child hunger and poverty across the state. Thank you, Chair Levin, not only for the opportunity to testify today, but for your leadership during your tenure at the council in addressing food insecurity. Great strides have made due to your leadership and the members of this committee. We've come a long way. I think about all the conversations and campaigns we've worked on together, but now we need the council support more than ever before. One in three kids in New York City could face hunger this year due to the pandemic. I want everybody to take a moment and hear that number. Before the pandemic, it was one in five. A decade of progress has now been reversed in a few short months. We need more than ever before to take drastic steps to address food insecurity. And we need all levels of government to get involved because there isn't a single solution. We heard a few times today about the 15% increase in SNAP benefits. This was a huge step by the federal government as SNAP is the first line of defense against hunger. There are likely newly eligible New Yorkers for this program. They may not know that they are eligible. The FY22 New York City budget needs to invest funds in outreach and awareness. They need to reach out to community members, get them enrolled, help them to access these programs. From what we've heard anecdotally, there's gonna be a cut for, or there's, as the budgets look at reductions and places where things can slow down, now is not the time to be slowing on marketing, but it's to get the word out, to invest in community organizations to do this work. I also wanna say how important it is to invest in the emergency food network. Providers have been on the front lines since day one. We've also seen organizations who've never had a food program before start one practically overnight as they look to support their community members. We need to make sure that the budget has that funding that is able to support school pantries, food pantries, soup kitchens, any type of program that is going to address food insecurity. I'll have additional recommendations that will circulate tied to the Department of Education budget, but we wanna be really mindful that today is specifically about HRA and programs under the general welfare umbrella. But to close my remarks, I wanna be very clear, careful on time. Um, again, I wanna thank this council and just say how much we look forward to working with you, working with this administration to make sure that this budget not only strengthens, but expands funding for programs that address food insecurity. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rachel, and it's been um, wonderful working with you these these past few years. And um, uh, you know, we still have we still have a lot of. I mean, as you said, I mean, we we have challenges we're facing right now that we never anticipated a year and a half ago. So, um, yeah, look forward to continuing to to make strides in this last year. Thank you, Rachel. We will now hear from Joel Berg. Joel, you can begin once prompted by the sergeant. Time starts now. Hello, I'm Joel Berg, CEO of Hunger Free America. I too want to thank the chair. This isn't your funeral, so we're we're still going to be working in the future. But thank you so much. It's for... like it's like Tom Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn like going to their own going to their right. own funeral. Right. Well, first I want to announce we've ended hunger, so we don't need any money. <laughs> that, that, that was my early April Fool's joke. Uh, I guess you shouldn't joke about these things. It's serious. As everyone's indicated, the hunger rates dramatically increased in the city. And considering that the unemployment rate is three and a half times what it was a year ago, we shouldn't be shocked that the hunger rate is still double what it was a year ago. I really wanna focus on the importance of the safety net programs funded by the federal government, administered by the city. And uh, SNAP went up 184,000 people. That's a huge increase, a historic accomplishment through HRA, uh, but there are many, many, many more people eligible today than before. Uh, and, and in fact, the truth of the matter is uh, that when you compare where we are to peak participation a number of years ago, we're still way below peak participation a number of years ago. I have all the numbers in my encyclopedic uh, written testimony, but we're still way below peak participation, even though our unemployment rate is far higher, higher than it was when that occurred in 2013. Also, 100,000 CUNY students who are probably eligible for SNAP now because of the changes in, in federal policy. And I just want to put this in concrete numerical terms. Uh, SNAP program in New York City last year spent $3.4 billion, $3.4 billion with a, a B. If you were to increase participation in that program by only 5%, 
that would be 175 million extra dollars for New York City. So, you know, Mr. Chairman, I rarely come and make self-interested requests. I rarely talk like everyone else, uh, we need more money for our organization, but I will this time and say that the $600,000 we got in the last year to do benefits access was about the most effective money the city's ever spent. We and other groups that do benefits access leverage at least $20 for every city dollar we get. And so while we strongly support the continuation and expansion, and making sure there's money for food and staff in all the home delivered programs and the grab and go programs and EFAP and prefred, we want to particularly emphasize the need to continue uh, this benefit access money. And I point out that every penny spent on SNAP is matched by the federal government. So it's extraordinarily good investment overall. And again, thank you for your leadership. And I'll just say that as we go into a, a new administration, we need to really ramp up our online applications. I understand all your concerns about online applications, but for most of our clients and customers, it's been a big plus. And we need to expand that beyond SNAP to combine that with every other program, with um, uh, Section 8 and every other anti-poverty program in the city. Thank you. Joel, I just wanted to reiterate, for every dollar we spend on, on the outreach, uh, what, how many dollars comes in? At least $20 of SNAP outreach, uh, of SNAP benefit dollars. And a multiplier we'll of 20, uh, for $600,000 investment, we're getting... Uh, 20 times that uh, back into the city? Well, roughly, yes. So those, uh, you know, WIC is a slightly larger, numeric, less numerical investment. But uh, yes, because we're also matching the federal funds. And I'd also point out that even though uh, food is untaxed, when people get more SNAP dollars, they're able to save money to buy more taxed items, diapers, yes. you know, hygiene products, et cetera. And those are taxed. And so not, and this creates jobs uh, adding to income tax revenues and reducing unemployment roles, reducing cash assistance roles. And so tax aside, only, this is money going into the economy. Yeah, not only is this right thing to do morally, it's just smart business. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Joel. Okay. I think Nick, are you, are you available now, Nick? Do you want me to, to mute Nick? and we'll okay. go back to Nick? I know, he's here. I'm here. Uh, too many headphones going on. Um, <laughs> thank <laughs> you so much, uh, Chair Levin. Uh, thank you to the committee members. I also want to particularly thank um, the committee staff for all of their uh, attention to um, hunger issues and anti-poverty issues. Um, I'm Nick Buse from the Food Bank for New York City. Um, as you know, our city's food pantries have experienced a spike in need due to the pandemic. Uh, 25, excuse me, 75% have reported an increase in visitors, 91% of those are first time visitors and 79% include families with children. Food insecurity has increased by more than 44% in our city. This is the highest rate in the last 10 years. And while the loss of wages and jobs has driven this increase for people who are food insecure, recovery is a much longer road than is indicated by simple metrics like unemployment rates. For instance, after the Great Recession, it took 10 years for food insecurity to fall below pre-recession levels. In the last year, Food Bank for New York City has distributed over 100 million meals to partner agencies. This is a 61% increase in overall food distribution compared to last year. We've also distributed over a million pounds of non-food items like PPE, baby and hygiene products. We've developed new partnerships with ACS, um, NYCHA, Health and Hospitals, many other programs across the city. And our income support services, like Joel was just talking about, help people navigate SNAP, but also free tax assistance. Um, when we combine those services at, for our organization, it brings in $38 million back into the pockets of low-income New Yorkers. This work would not be possible without the support from the city, in particular, our partnership with HRA via the Emergency Food Assistance Program, EFAP, and in coordination with their benefits access unit. Last spring, I reported that a third of our partner programs suspended service due to the pandemic. Today, most of those programs have reopened, but our city must continue to invest in food, capacity, and partnerships to expand the depth and reach of nutrition assistance in the coming fiscal year and beyond. So ongoing support for EFAP will be essential, and we will continue to work with HRA to ensure a steady supply of food that complements other emergency food sources, and paired with supply, we urge the city to fund capacity at distribution hubs like ours and community food locations. 
We stand with the speaker and council members calling on the administration to provide an additional $25 million for food pantries and soup kitchen capacity. We also call on the city council to invest in innovative programming like food pantries and schools, mobile food pantry distribution that helps fill in the gaps of supply, as well as funding community organizations to do the outreach to New Yorkers for income supports like SNAP. Lastly, I want to thank the Mayor's Office of Food Policy and their team for coordinating efforts across city agencies. We know there's more work to be done, but we stand with our network of direct service organizations who have the experience and community connection to protect our neighbors from hunger. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. We will now hear from Molly Krakowski. Molly, you may begin once prompted by the Sergeant. Time starts now. Hi, thank you for um, the opportunity to testify today. My name is Molly Krakowski. I'm Senior Director of Government Affairs at JASA. Uh, JASA is a large senior service agency serving over 40,000 older New Yorkers. Um, in addition to a whole wide range of aging services, we also have contracts for Adult Protective Services, Community Guardian, Legal Services in Queens, and um, a significant number of other programs. Uh, we're very appreciative of the New York City Council's um, continued focus on the needs of the most vulnerable New Yorkers throughout the pandemic. JASA's budget requests and priorities for FY22 are tied to fair funding of social service contracts in New York City. We're looking for the city to fully fund the New York City contracts and honor the indirect rates for human services sector that were prior, approved prior to the FY21 budget. We're distressed that the city is failing to fulfill its promise to fund certified indirect costs which are the backbone that support direct service delivery staff in providing essential care to New Yorkers in need. In order to supply and support clients and staff during the pandemic, JASA pivoted last March to virtual programming and remote work in most programs. JASA's adult protective services and community guardian staff continue to meet in person with their clients, um, as did home delivered meal staff providing daily deliveries and home care workers continuing to provide in-home in care, in care to clients. As an example of this effort, from March 2020 through the end of February, JASA APS staff managed 4,900 referrals and conducted nearly 10,900 face-to-face visits. In other programs, JASA has continued seamlessly with program oversight and service delivery managed virtually. Um, for example, in JASA's contract to provide supportive services at one of HRA's senior affordable rental apartment programs, Sarah programs located in Beach Channel, uh, we've been doing many different initiatives to address social isolation and try and keep people um, connected. I'm just gonna skip to the vaccine efforts, which we've been doing across the board, um, trying to get people appointments, but also coordinating at our HUD buildings with CBS to, to provide vaccine clinics, um, as well as at Beach Channel and um, additional programs like NORCs and senior centers in conjunction with the city. Um, there's a very big need to invest in this um, in the human services sector. Um, this city really needs to um, honor, like I said, um, prior commitments. Um, the pandemic has only served to highlight the importance of indirect personnel. Indirect funding supports our IT department, our human services, finance, facility support. For example, throughout COVID-19, our human resource department has followed and provided updated safety and other guidelines on working in offices, program sites, and remotely. JASA's IT department is supporting hundreds of remote workstations, troubleshooting online course offerings, supporting um, support groups in addition to monitoring servers and providing network safety and security. JASA's accounting department I'm has sorry. submitted and resubmitted numerous budgets and modifications this year in order to keep up with changing city requirements and updates regarding PPE and COVID-19 expenses and shifting to remote activities. Indirect services are essential to daily and long-term agency operations. We're experiencing an extraordinary level of uncertainty related to the course of the pandemic, but our current experience also informs our vision and the needs of the preferences of the city's older adults and vulnerable populations. The priority of senior services and, and aging populations now um, is to ensure that the safety of clients, including access to vaccines, providing them with tools that are necessary for safe and appropriate housing, food security, and social connectedness to people and communities that are important to them. We look forward to working with the city council, the mayor, HRA, and DIFTA to implement an FY22 budget that's senior friendly and human services friendly. So thank you very much.
Thank you, Molly. We will now go to Gregory Silverman. Gregory, you can begin once prompted by the sergeant. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Chef Greg Silverman. I'm the CEO of the West Side Campaign Against Hunger. Uh, thanks for inviting me and WISCA to testify at the General Welfare Preliminary Budget Hearing. I'm here representing our 50,000 New Yorkers in need who come to WISCA as our customers. Uh, founded in 1979, WISCA's launched, launched the country's first uh, choice model grocery store slash food pantry almost three decades ago. Today, we're one of the largest emergency food providers in the city. We alleviate hunger by ensuring all New Yorkers have access with dignity to a choice of healthy food and uh, supportive services. In the words of City Council Speaker Johnson, access to adequate nutritious food is a human right. I'm gonna focus my, my remarks on, this, on the EFAP program because I think we've heard a lot about COVID response in sort of the bigger frame. Uh, so we, we share what Speaker Johnson said previously and share this conviction. Last year, we gave out almost 2.5 million pounds of food. Over half of that, over 50% was fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, and we think that's key. Our customers deeply appreciate that. We survey them and find out that information. Uh, and so we continue to push really hard, no matter the pandemic or any issue, to provide the healthiest, best food possible. Uh, WISCA created a, cust uh, a collective purchase model with some of the other largest emergency food providers in the city, St. John's Bread and Life, Product Hospitality, New York Common Pantry, uh, Met Council, Holy Apostle Soup Kitchen, funded by Robin Hood, New York Community Trust, Sea Change, New York State Health Foundation, because we believe that we want to advocate for our customers to get the best food possible. Uh, we did this partly because of programs like EFAP, the Emergency Food Assistance Program. We don't think our, they're not providing the necessary choice of fresh and healthy products. At WISCA, we survey our customers, they want healthy food. Our job as emergency food providers is not simply just to provide calories or ultra processed food, it's to give people access with dignity to a choice of healthy food and supportive services. EFAF has been said to be a, a huge win for New York City because of its $22 million in baseline budget. But let's be clear, the 50% of fresh produce that we give out at WISCA doesn't come from EFAP. EFAP distributes $22 million of ultra processed foods to New Yorkers who need healthy, minimally processed foods. This is a tragedy and it's time to change it. It's well to have fast time to align EFAP, the RFP, the city charge or the budget with food insecure folks needs. And I think, you know, we've seen in the last, during pan the pandemic, we've seen the ability of other programs to work in different ways. We can align EFAP in the same way HIPNAP is run. We can, we've seen New York City demonstrate through PFRED and the Get Food program, the ability to put customers needs front and center. Although these programs have faced many issues such as lack of fresh, healthy, culturally appropriate food via get food and sluggish bureaucracies of PFRED, they have increased the ability for folks to try out new models. In our increasingly customer-centric world, solutions must move towards and not away from customers in the community. Emergency feeding solutions such as EFAP, PFRED, get food must focus on bringing healthy food options direct to people. PFRED and get food have successfully tested the approaches. Our hope is that WISCA is that at WISCA is that these programs continue to grow and evolve and that with, in conjunction with a choice-centric EFAP, a purpose-built citywide open data model allowing collaboration across anti-hunger communities and giving all organizations the ability, which they do not have now, to deliver a choice of healthy, culturally appropriate food to all in need. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you very much to this panel. Calling the next panel up, we will have MJ Okma, Michelle Yanch, Nicole McVenua, Marcin Campbell, and Darren Block. MJ, you may begin when prompted by the sergeant. Time starts now. Right, good afternoon. My name is MJ Okma with the Human Services Council, a membership organization representing over 170 human services providers in New York. Over the past year, city contracted human services workers who are majority women of color were not provided PPE, they were not given a COLA in last year's budget, and they were not afforded job protection while the city and state disproportionately cut human services. Due to these compounding cuts, our city's human services sector has seen a net loss of over 44,000 jobs since this time last year. One of the extremely damaging cuts from the city was the retroactive dismantling of the indirect cost rate funding initiative before it was ever truly implemented. 
When the first retroactive cut was announced last August, providers faced a cut up to 40% of their indirect funding on fiscal year 20 contracts, despite the fact that the fiscal year was already over and the money was spent. This allowed the underfunding of ICR to be replicated in the fiscal year 21 budget before Mox announced that it was in fact a ma massive reduction rather than a right sizing. In response, nearly half of the city council, the controller and all five borough presidents condemned the cut and called for funding to be restored. But instead of prioritizing paying city contracts as committed, last week, Mox and OMB told the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee that providers will face another staggering retroactive cut of up to 70% of their indirect funding in current fiscal year 21 contracts, with less than four months left this fiscal year. This is unacceptable and it displays a complete lack of regard for New York City human services providers and frontline workers. In order to address this crisis, the fiscal year 22 budget must include $171 million to fully honor the ICR initiative and pay human services providers the indirect rates that the city has already previously committed to paying them. That $171 million covers 91 in total for fiscal year 22, including the 34 million already currently baselined, 57 million for fiscal year 21, and 23 million for fiscal year 20 to fill in the gaps between the costs the city committed to pay nonprofits and the amount actually included in the last two budgets. More data, as well as a detailed timeline of the failed ICR rollout can be found in my written testimony. The fiscal year 22 budget must also support the human services workforce with the restoration of a COLA at a rate of at least 3% and comprehensive emergency pay for city contracted human services workers retroactive to March 23rd, 2020, when the stay at home order was first put into place. Thank you, Chair Levin, for providing me this opportunity to testify. We greatly value your support and partnership. Thank you, MJ. We Thank will you, now MJ. go to Michelle Yanch. Michelle, you may begin when prompted by the sergeant. Time sports now. Thank you, everyone. I am Michelle Yanchi, Executive Director of Good Shepherd Services. Um, particularly, we'd like to thank you, Chair Levin, and all of the members and staff of the General Welfare Committee uh, for hearing this testimony. I um, am going to just summarize, and I want to add, add Good Shepherd Services voice to um, the four key points that other colleagues have raised up today. Um, my my uh, comments are going to concentrate on uh, salary parity for residential staff in child welfare and juvenile justice, um, in preventive service investments, um, the need for investments in nonprofits, in particular the <coughs> indirect cost rate, um, and the restoration of budget cuts hitting children with an emphasis on uh, for this hearing on fair futures. Um, so first, just, re just uh, related to salary parity for residential, um, if you hear nothing else of my testimony today, I hope that you will remember my plea to you to make sure that with the stimulus package and this budget, the next budget that we will adopt for New York, we finally will bring some level of equity and parity for our residential staff in child welfare and juvenile justice residences. I've testified um, about this in the past, um, and to the uh, specifically to the point that their day in day out jobs in normal times, um, they are not being, uh, we are not able to uh, to fairly and equitably compensate them for the for the incredible jobs they do and the risks that they take. Um, that is has been dramatically exponentially increased in the middle of this pandemic. Uh, over the past now full year, the staff in our residences have been on literally the front lines of the pandemic effort. And, have, and that has meant putting their own lives and their families' lives literally on the line. Um, and they are the staff among many providers, including Good Shepherd Services, who have been most likely to get themselves become ill and have uh, bringing also, by putting themselves on the front lines, bringing COVID um, into their families and communities. We have a responsibility to address this. Uh, on preventive services, I just want to call attention to the impact of the governor's proposed budget and ask that the city council join us in calling on a restoration um, of the nearly $38 million cut to that would be, that would hit ACS from the governor's proposal um, to reduce by 5% the state's withholding as well as and that compounding with the historical rate reduction and reimbursement from the statutory 65%. This is a time when we need to be investing more 
in preventive services uh, and in particular um, in primary prevention. Very quickly, um, I really uh, cannot emphasize enough the need to make sure that um, we are re re reversing uh, the cuts to the indirect cost rate. Many other right. colleagues have, have touched on this. I just want to point out that with the 40% reduction in the first year of implementation, FY20, coupled now with an additional 70% reduction for FY21, we will have lost a full year of the value um, of this, uh, of what, what has been um, only a two year implementation. And finally, please, um, please restore fair futures um, and make sure that we can baseline $20 million and work towards um, a scale up to full implementation over the long term. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Michelle. I do have a question actually. Can you, can you speak a little bit about the, um, um, uh, the, Enrich the uh, Femi Enrichment Center, the FEC that you guys uh, run in East New York? I'm so glad you asked. That was part of my testimony, but had to be cut because I could see my clock ticking down and I wanted to talk more about residential. But uh, yes, we, we um, operate one of the three family enrichment centers. Uh, we call ours the CRIB, Community Reinvestment in Brooklyn and uh, Community Resources in Brooklyn. And uh, we, are operate, we operate in East New York. I know that Chair Levin and many of the other um, uh, some of the staff and other folks on this uh, in this hearing have visited. Um, I, I, um, we were, you know, very fortunate to just have our contract renewed. Uh, we were really hoping to see there be a an expansion. That was what the plan was for this year, so that other colleagues and other organizations would have the opportunity to operate um, family mm -hmm. enrichment centers. And this really would have been the right time to do it. Um, our, um, our Family Enrichment Center has been absolutely pivotal in Good Shepherd Services pandemic response efforts over the past year. Uh, the Family Enrichment Center is truly a, a primary prevention model, meaning that it is um, it's open to the whole community and it is a community-led and community-driven strategy. It's not specifically focused on families already known to to the, to the child welfare system, although absolutely can and does serve those families as well. But we were able to really engage the community in, in identifying right on the ground, you know, we use the term boots on the ground, but this was truly boots on the ground to identify what were the pressing community needs at every step of, of the past year of the pandemic and to, and to use it really as a, as a location, as a hub, as a platform for mobilizing resources to meet those needs directly. Everything from technology distribution for young people so that they could be part of um, homeschooling more effectively, food distribution efforts, financial assistance, benefits enrollment, and, every, and, and meeting every other kind of community need. And it, this, it, it, similarly, as um, as the, our Family Enrichment Center has been a critical part of our uh, efforts over the past year, it's going to be a critical part of the uh, of the recovery. Um, and this is really exactly the time when we should reactivate that opportunity to allow other organizations to uh, to open family enrichment centers in in all of the communities that have been hard hit. Chuck, can I ask just does the you know, I, I wondered since I first went, like, does the affiliation with ACS in any way kind of like, you know, cloud the mission or prevent people from participating or add to any community skepticism or anything like that? Because it's, you know, it is, you know, I, I mean, just generally speaking, you know, we're here from ACS is like not what people want to hear. Well, I mean, that's the beauty of the uh, of the Family Enrichment Center model is that it really is actually designed not only to, um, you know, not to emphasize uh, the ACS involvement, but really even not to emphasize Good Shepherd Services. I mean, it is a, it is purposely, um, you know, named, branded, cooperated uh, with with community. Uh, it is that that is really what the model is. It's not supposed. It's not supposed to be, um, you know. A, this is ACS and Good Shepherd Services. Uh, it's really a, it's it's we are facilitators in the process, uh, and it's very much about um, bringing community uh, to the table to design, implement, lead, 
mobilize. And that's also, honestly, that's why it's been so incredibly effective during a pandemic, because it really creates a platform for community to assist community, neighbor to assist neighbor. This is exactly the kind of strategy that, uh, that not only is effective in quote unquote normal times, but is especially effective to help neighbors help each other um, in, in a crisis. Thank you, Michelle, thank you. Thank you, Michelle, for your testimony. We will now go to Nicole McVanua. Nicole, you can begin when prompted by the sergeant. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Chair Levin and members of the committee. My name is Nicole McVenue and I'm the Director of Policy at Urban Pathways. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on the FY22 budget. Urban Pathways is a nonprofit homeless services and supportive housing provider. We assist single adults through a unique combination of street outreach, drop-in services, safe havens, extended stay residences, and permanent supportive housing. Urban Pathways served approximately 3,900 New Yorkers in need last year. Throughout the pandemic, our doors have never closed and our services have never stopped. Uh, in fact, we opened an additional 60 stabiliz stabilization beds to bring New Yorkers experiencing street homelessness inside to, stay to safety. Uh, at great risk to their own health and that of their families, our frontline staff continued to come to work to ensure the well-being of our clients and our residences. And like Urban Pathways, human services providers across the city have continued to provide food, childcare, and other critical in-person services throughout the last year. And while the human services sector stepped up to meet the needs of New Yorkers in crisis, unfortunately, New York City government did not step up to support us in the same way. Throughout the last calendar year, the city has allowed the COLA for human services workers to expire in the middle of the pandemic by not renewing it in the FY21 budget, failed to provide comprehensive emergency pay for low-wage city contracted frontline workers, and created fiscal chaos for the sector by retroactively cutting the indirect cost rate funding initiative, like so many of my colleagues have spoken to, um, at a time that we were experiencing so many increased uh, costs related to COVID. Um, and so what this looked like um, for Urban Pathways was uh, a retroactive cut of $387,553 in FY20. Um, and then just last week, we found out that uh, we were getting the 70% reduction, um, which is a loss of $678,218. Um, so this is you know, a massive loss to our organization. So in order to address this crisis, the FY22 must include the following. The restoration of the COLA on the personnel services line of all human services contracts at a rate of at least 3%. Comprehensive emergency pay for human services workers retroactive to March 23rd, 2020, when non-essential workers in New York were ordered to stay home. And $171 million to fully honor the indirect cost rate funding initiative for FY20, FY21, and FY22. Um, and the uh, other thing I'd like to join my colleagues um, in supporting is the funding for the city FEPS voucher. Um, the, you know, our staff does extremely challenging work. And one of the most difficult tasks that they have is helping our clients who are experiencing homelessness to find independent and permanent housing. Um, and the reality is, is that the city FEPS voucher has a, a great capacity to provide meaningful access to the private market, um, but it just falls short. Um, the maximum rental allowance of $1,265 for a single adult uh, is just impossible to find an apartment um, in New York City. And it creates uh, a lot of um, frustration for our clients and for our staff who are assisting them. Uh, so to address homelessness, the city must take the step of creating adequate access to the private market by raising uh, the maximum rent on city FEPS vouchers to at least the fair market rent value, um, like so many have spoken to today. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Nicole. We will now go to Marcin Campbell. Marcin, you may begin when prompted by the sergeant. Time starts now. Um, okay, thank you. So good day, members of the New York City Council. My name is Marcin Campbell, and thank you for um, the opportunity to testify today. I'll be sharing my story with you in hopes of emphasizing just how important Covenant House is as a youth shelter. Um, I was a member of Covenant House um, 
look at it in midtown Manhattan by Times Square for about a month and a half from approximately November 29th to mid-January. So I honestly can't emphasize um, enough about how much that program helped me. Um, besides, be so before that point in my life, I would have seen that I was living in a shelter. Um, I grew up relatively in a, in, in a privileged background. I had attended top schools. I was an honor student. And eventually, I got accepted into one of my top schools with an academic scholarship, Manhattan College. So despite my um, accomplishments, however, there's issues in my personal life. And there's issues with my mother a lot. Um, so sometime in mid-November 2020, um, this is reached a boiling point, And I was kicked out of the house. So I spent a week with a friend. But eventually, I made my way up to New York City and to be closer to the college I'll be attending. And where a friend of mine had recommended Covenant House. So Covenant House was truly a blessing for me. Um, I was one of my lowest points in my life and in a situation I never saw myself being in. Despite this, I was welcomed to the program with open arms. The staff there um, at all levels are so, are so, um, so, um, so, 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 so dedicated to youth um, and their success. And it made me feel so inspired to witness that. The services that are provided by the institution are also amazing. I was able to receive um, access to medication um, in a timely manner. I was also able to meet um, amazing people, not just on my floor, but as a result of all the services provided at Covenant House, from the music studio to the art room. So Covenant House wasn't just a place to stay for a month and a half. It was a truly extraordinary service that provided me with resources um, that I'm still utilizing until this day. In fact, through Covenant House, I was able to um, get an internship with an advocacy lawyer and mentor, Jane Bigelson, which is why I already have the opportunity to speak here today. So that's why I'm calling for the city to provide extra funding to um, home to services such as those at Covenant House. Even though Covenant House is doing a lot right, there's still so much that additional um, funding would help with. So the money could be put towards um, development and workplace um, programming, which at Covenant House is called CovWorks. And as someone who's part of the program, I can speak to how much that helped me. Um, funding would also go towards mental health services, which are especially valuable to homeless um, youth as they overcome the trauma they're experiencing on homelessness can cause. I benefited from Covenant House mental health services during my, my time there, so I can't emphasize how much um, important these services are. So there are, there are tens of thousands of um, homeless youth living in shelters across the city, and as the um, most vulnerable population, um, the city should be doing more to ensure their protection. This is like Covenant House. Homeless youth are able to rise up out of their current situations and into a safe space with people that are fighting constantly for their success. And that in turn leads to them becoming self assured, high achieving individuals, members of society. If it wasn't for Covenant House, um, I don't know if I would be called and living on campus right now. That's why I'm calling for the city council to further fund homeless youth services of Covenant House. If this city really wants to um, service most marginalized communities, and um, this is where to start. I'm inspired. <sighs> Um, that's all for me. Thank you very much, Marcin, for your testimony. We okay. will now go to Darren Block. Darren, you may begin when prompted by the sergeant. Time starts now. Perfect. Thanks so much. Uh, good, afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Darren Block. I'm the CEO and Executive Director of Greenwich House. We're a 118-year-old settlement house that provides a variety of social services and supports. Uh, to about 15,000 children, families, adults, and seniors each year. I'm joining you today to share my serious concerns about the IRC and related budget cuts to social service providers that are being pro proposed for this current year and the coming year. Uh, hearing protests against cuts to social services is nothing new to this process, I know. Uh, but these particular cuts at this particular moment show a unique carelessness and deep disconnect from the needs that we're seeing. And I've really struggled to think about how best to characterize what we're seeing here. And the best I've come up with is gross negligence. And to be clear, I'm using that term with thought and care. Uh, gross negligence is extreme indifference. It's a deliberate and reckless disregard for the safety and the treatment of others. It's a serious thing. Companies are sued for millions of dollars because of gross negligence. Parents lose their children to the foster care system because of neglect. And I'm calling it out here because the actions that are proposed are that seriously out of whack with what the system needs and can absorb right now. And yet our mayor and the governor here in New York are literally in the process of taking funds back from the very people and organizations that we've been celebrating for 12 months as our frontline essential workers in this battle with COVID. Uh, the proposal right now is hypocritical, it's short-sighted, and it's dangerous. The realities and impacts of this health and mental health crisis are gonna be felt for years, we know this. And not having local leadership that's actually planning and investing in these programs, people and systems is devastating enough, 
but proposals that are deliberately weakening these very organizations that have been the backbone of our response to COVID and that are gonna be the backbone of our community recovery, it's simple malpractice. Uh, these proposed cuts with clear and tangible certainty will hurt essential workers and they're gonna hurt hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers that we serve and support every day. Perhaps most dramatic is the fact that we're not talking about hundreds of millions in new program funding, which we actually need. The calls you're hearing are to fulfill funding commitments already made for critical work that's already been performed or already underway. We've been reminded recently that government's prime directive is to protect its citizenry. And at a national level, we've quickly seen the difference in outcome between smart investments and neglect. Here in New York, we cannot afford to not meet this moment. In response to this crisis, um, it doesn't correspond to the scale of the problem. You will be prolonging the effects of the COVID-19 even further. Uh, and if you're not investing in these programs, you're gonna be exacerbating the racial and the social disparities that have already been all too apparent in our response to this pandemic. The Im impact of these cuts are gonna be felt in every neighborhood in the city because the work we're all doing reverberates in every community. I strongly urge the mayor's office to reconsider. Um, it's just one sentence left, if, you might, if I can. Of course, yeah. Thank you. Uh, I strongly urge the mayor's office to reconsider his proposed cuts to these people and programs. And in the absence of forward thinking leadership to the mayor's team, I hope the city council steps up to provide a set of investments to protect New Yorkers from indirect and direct impacts of COVID. And that uh, doesn't disrespect and disregard the people who have been on the front line helping our neighbors and New York's recovery. Thanks so much for your time and commitment to New Yorkers. Thank you, Darren. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, I, 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 the way that I like to think about it or look at it is city government can't do uh, a lot of the things that we would hope to do. We rely on the not for profit sector to do the things that we couldn't do. We couldn't pay for it ourselves. Uh, if we did it ourselves, we wouldn't be able to function if we did it ourselves. Um, we absolutely entirely rely on a network of social service organizations that have collectively about 4,000 years of experience. And, um, and yet we continue to treat them um, uh, uh, like they're expendable and that's yeah. just not acceptable. Uh, totally. And, and I think, and, and that was a point Joel Berg raised and I think appropriately so, you know, we can all make, and it's, and it's real and tangible, but the ROI on these community investments is profound. I mean, the amount of, um, uh, of the, um, the reach of these fairly minor investments in a huge, uh, mm -hmm. uh um, city budget um, truly pay for itself over time around education, health outcomes, criminal justice outcomes, and the like. So um, it, it's, it's, um, it's a deeply frustrating and disappointing presentation um, from an administration I think has tried to be uh, thoughtful about uh, the, the social service infrastructure we have. It just, it falls so far short of the need right now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for pointing out. Thank you. Thank you, Darren, and to this panel for your testimony. We will now, we will now go to our next group of panelists who include Bianca Bennett, Jennifer Pinder, and Nancy Katz. We will begin with Bianca Bennett. Bianca, you may begin when prompted. Time starts now. Good afternoon, Council. My name is Bianca Bennett. I'm a youth advocate and quality assurance assistant for You Gotta Believe, a nonprofit organization that finds families for older youth who are at risk of aging out of care or who have aged out. As a quality assurance assistant and long government student, I ground myself on efficiency and I'm very data oriented. I wanted to come to you today and present a plethora of statistics on how You Gotta Believe has transformed the idea of family and has connected thousands of New York State youth with unconditional support. However, when it comes to youth and care, I know as a former foster youth that we are more than just numbers. I want to express a personal story on how YGB helped me find my family and my purpose in this world. I was placed in the New York State foster care system from the age of 13 to the time I aged out at 21. During the whole process, my unconditional support was my maternal grandmother, who at 18 became my legal kinship guardian. She was the only person I could depend on. And when I turned 21, I was scared to age out, but I knew with the support of my grandmother, I could take on the world. A month later, my grandmother had a sudden brain hemorrhage and passed away. I was devastated. Here I was, aged out of care, alone and unaware what to do. In the following two months, I had lost my housing despite working three jobs and had stressed myself out so bad, I hospitalized myself for sciatica for a week and was unable to work. 
Although I had the skills that I was taught in my independent living classes, maintaining a job, creating a bank account, and other adult responsibilities, I was in survival mode because I had no one to help guide me through the process. I was alone and I was falling deeper in the rabbit hole of depression and often thought following in my mother's footsteps of substance abuse. It wasn't until I reached out to my vice president of college and her and her husband came to my rescue. I felt an instant connection and imagined being a part of their family. It wasn't until I reached out to You Gotta Believe where they gave me the belief and confidence that despite me being 22, I deserve family and I was worth it. Because of that conversation, I'm currently in the process of being adopted this year. This is just one story of how You Gotta Believe has changed my life. I've had the privilege as an employee to watch our services make a difference in foster care agencies and the youth and families in our system. You Gotta Believe does more than just instill hope that family is possible. They are with you every step of the way. We are on call 24 seven with parent and advocates to assist with post-placement. Because of our lived experience with the foster care system, we can provide the knowledge and empathic nature to change the narrative for not only youth, but the perspectives of the agencies we work with. In addition, because YGB is an agency comprised of former fosters and adoptive parents, our organization provides employment and advocacy opportunities to allow power back in the voice who have been hindered by the system. By uplifting their voices and providing spaces for them at the table, we can make effective change based on our living experience. I myself and as an employee have not benefited from the professional development that You Gotta Believe has provided and have traveled all over the country before COVID right. advocating for children's rights and foster care reform. I never thought my voice mattered, but YGB proved to me that when you are not at the table, you are on the menu. So you pull up your own seat and you make room. YGB needs the support of the city council to be able to continue the work with young people and bring hope back into the agencies and families. I, as a former foster youth and employee of You Gotta Believe, it supports its efforts in supporting older youth in care, and I hope that the city council will do the same. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'm free to answer. Bianca, thank you for um, for telling your story and for advocating for YGB, um, which is really one of the most um, essential and um, unique organizations that we work with. They're 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 um, they're you know one of only two or so organizations that are that really are dedicated connecting um, uh, older youth in care to forever families. And, and hearing your story, um, you know, really, really demonstrates that in a meaningful way. And so I, I thank you for sharing it and for, um, uh, and, 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 th and congratulations um, on your adoption and uh, for all the work that you're doing. And it's very, um, it's very moving to, to hear your story and thank you for sharing it. Thank you, Bianca. We will now go to our next panelist, Jennifer Pinder. Jennifer, you may begin when the sergeant prompts you. Time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Levin and all the members of the committee. Um, and thank you for your con um, continued support, Chair Levin, and your kind words about YGB. Um, my name is Jennifer Pinder. I'm the executive director of You Gotta Believe. Um, I'd also like to thank Bianca for her powerful testimony and all the work that she does at YGB, which would not be possible without uh, the support of the city council funding. Uh, you Gotta Believe has submitted an ask to the city council discretionary fund to continue to support our Nobody Ages Out program. Uh, we've received support from the city council since 2015, when with the advocacy and backing of council members Johnson, Levin, and Traeger, YGB was given a lifeline after having our ACS contract discontinued after over a decade of service to the system's most vulnerable youth. We continue to support uh, we continue to receive support rather from city council until last year when we were unfortunately zeroed out. It seems as though this may have just been a result of the chaotic situation during budget development and the budget shortfall, but only a fraction um, of our previous level was restored after that, thankfully with the help of council member Drum and others. Um, our request this year is to assist YGB in making up for that loss as we continue to conduct the Nobody Ages Out program a program which was even more intensive and costly than usual as a result of the adjustments required with the pandemic in place. For 26 years, we've been laser focused on finding loving and unconditionally committed parents specifically for kids in foster care who would otherwise age out to be essentially alone in the world. YGB um, is very unique with this focus. We find people interested in becoming parents and we train them to parent traumatized children 
Everyone on our program staff, as Bianca mentioned, are cred credible messengers, meaning they are either parents of older youth from foster care or survivors of the foster care system themselves. This gives our staff an advantage in being able to both train and support our parents and youth and to help them maintain their relationship and avoid the typical disruptions that older youth experience. You Gotta Believe does applaud all the work that's being done first to keep families together through preventive services, secondly, the increased efforts made to reunify families, and finally, the extensive accomplishments and increasing numbers of youth being placed with kin. Unfortunately, there are still what are labeled the hardest to place youth who slip into the independent living track and are often relying on services such as coaches and mentors. However, these services do not take the place of a family and are time limited. We've seen from this past year how everyone required the emotional support of their family and many went home to wait out the pandemic. Meanwhile, youth from foster care just became more isolated than ever as they had no home to go to for support. While the situation was somewhat worse for foster youth during the pandemic, aging out is never a positive experience. Uh, they face homelessness, continued welfare dependence, and often join the pipeline to incarceration. These negative outcomes are avoidable for the youth who we connect with permanent and un unconditionally committed families who serve as lifetime mentors and coaches and who never give up on their kids no matter what. YGB needs the support of the city council to be able to continue right. the work with young people who have not been helped by all the other resources that have been provided. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Jennifer. Before we go to the last member of this panel, I do wanna give our next panel a heads up that they are next up. And that will consist of Beth Goldman, Ron Rasmussen, Ariel Wisbaum, Leslie Thorpe. And we will now go to the last member of this panel, who is Nancy Katz of Seeds in the Middle. Nancy, you can begin when prompted. Time starts now. Hello, thank you very much, everybody. I've been listening for a long time to the, the members of the committee and the chair and um, a lot of the testimony that I've never heard before. I'm a director of Seeds in the Middle. We're a small organization that was founded in Crown Heights with a principal there when we recognized in 2010 with Michelle Obama that obesity and diabetes and heart disease were killing, well now we say black and brown people at much higher rates than anyone else all over the country, but particularly in central Brooklyn, Harlem and the Bronx. And we started a program with Mr. Solomon Long at PS91 to create a hip to be healthy school where the kids could actually grow food, market food, learn to cook healthy, play sports and get, be engaged in the arts. So it's no surprise to us in our struggles over the last 10 years when COVID came along and suddenly uh, people were, many people of color were dying and, and suffering uh, disproportionately because of underlying conditions. We've struggled for many years to open more farmers markets and farm stands in neighborhoods of color. We've and we've tried to promote other groups along with ourselves and it's been next to impossible. Um, the funding, the way the funding stream is with the city council and the mayor tends to go to larger organizations who are all doing wonderful work, but there needs to be a much more super local effort on the small farm stands, particularly working with schools that can actually change the food environment and build healthy small businesses while we do it. That's what we're doing. We asked for $150,000 so that we could open 10 of these farm stands run by community leaders, many of them affiliated with schools or Green Thumb Gardens, who are people who are active in their community. They volunteer their time and never and, and, and scramble for very little money against the millions that go to the other organizations. The, we're particularly shocked, it's not necessarily the city, but it is uh, by the most recent USDA boxes, which are full of hot dogs, uh, pre-cooked chicken, American cheese, and other processed foods that anybody with diabetes or heart disease should stay away from. And we certainly don't feed our children. And there needs to be, and I heard that from other organizations, a real laser focus on, on what are we giving people, even if it's free. And we also in our budget, which is very important that goes with Joel Berg's EBT thing is we want free coupons. We want thousands of dollars to give out free fresh coupons so people have purchasing power. And I agree that it will have an economic effect because if they're spending that money on food, they're spending their other money on tax items. Um, 
We need more free coupons, more EBT online. We need to give people purchasing power, which is absent right now. And over 10 years, it's, it, I have not seen one positive change working in the hood like that. Um, Time expired. Anyway, I'm looking for you know a real look at what we're doing and some changes in allocations of funding. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you to this panel. We will now go to our next panel, which will consist of Beth Goldman, Ron Rasmussen, Ariel Wisbaum, Leslie Thorpe, and Kevin Jones. Um, Beth, you can begin when prompted by the Sergeant. Time starts now. Thank you, Chair Levin, council members, staff, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to the General Welfare Committee about the FY22 budget. My name is Beth Goldman, and I am the president and attorney in charge of the New York Legal Assistance Group. NILAG provides high quality free legal services to New Yorkers experiencing poverty and in crisis to the benefit of 90,000 New Yorkers each year. I wanna focus my remarks today to addressing the role of legal services um, in dealing with the fallout from the pandemic and the recovery. Uh, this committee and the whole council uh, knows the value of legal services. So the city has made a deep commitment to funding for civil legal services. It's like no other city in recognizing that. Uh, but it's now, uh, we, we need it and we're gonna continue to, to need it. So I wanna talk for a minute about how COVID has changed our work. Uh, first of all, our existing clients have new needs. Uh, the pandemic exacerbated the challenges they already faced. It also created a whole new group of clients who were not eligible for our services before. And it also meant that our clients could not access the services in the way they did previously. So we needed to adapt uh, our intake services, our service delivery models, and the substantive work we performed. And I could give you a list of all the um, hotlines and, and resource centers that we created, but I think it's important to talk about some of how the work changed, because I think that's going to affect the future. Um, so for example, let's talk about employment work, which is actually funded by the low wage worker funding that this council has supported. Uh, we pivoted from doing employment discrimination and wage claims to a very large volume of unemployment insurance matters. We handled 17 times as many UI cases as we did the prior year. And it's because we had this funding from the city that allowed us to do that. Um, and, and the reality is in every area in which we work, we had to shift gears. Uh, whether it was domestic violence where the courts were mostly closed and there were barriers to people getting um, orders of protection. So we shifted gears and started doing um, family offense petitions uh, by the hundreds, which is not our normal practice. Um, and I could go on with a list of work that changed completely. Um, but I want to now talk in my last few seconds about the importance of to the recovery. Uh, with more than 800,000 New Yorkers unemployed, um, and of course COVID has exacerbated the racial and wealth gaps, um, we need to be thinking about um, all the ways in which legal services can ensure that people do not go hungry, are safe in their homes, um, and can get the benefits they need. So legal services will need to be there for public benefits, for housing, of course, when the moratoria and uh, foreclosure attorneys to deal with so that people can stay in their homes once that moratorium is lifted. Um, employment lawyers, consumer lawyers who are gonna to have to handle the onslaught of cases by debt collectors who are gonna to seek to recover. Um, and, and the list goes on. So given the commitment of the city in the past, uh, now is the time uh, to continue that um, commitment uh, so that we can work on the recovery together. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. We will now go to our next panelist, Ron Rasmussen. Ron, you can begin once the sergeant prompts you. Okay, we will come back to Ron and we will proceed with our next panelist who will be Ariel Wisbaum. 
Ariel, you can begin once prompted by the sergeant. Oh, shoot. Hello? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Can you come back to me after, after she's done? Sorry sure. about that. I didn't realize I was on mute. No problem. Ariel, go ahead. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, during this unprecedented public health crisis, I urge the council today to support renewed funding for the Immigrant Health Initiative, uh, which has saved lives and improved health across the city. My name is Ariel Wisbaum, and I'm an Equal Justice Works Fellow in the Health Justice Program at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, where we work to ensure that undocumented immigrants have access to health care. At NOPI, I help provide holistic advocacy for transgender, gender, gender nonconforming, intersex, and HIV positive immigrant New Yorkers so that they can gain immigration status and access to health care through direct legal services. NOPI is privileged to be a part of the City Council's Immigrant Health Initiative, and we thank you for that support. At a time when access to medical care and information is crucial and misinformation can endanger our communities, this support has allowed us to expand our work educating immigrant New Yorkers with serious health conditions, their healthcare providers, and legal service providers about how to access healthcare and how to stay safe. We have responded directly to community needs for medical legal information and partnering with the New York Immigration Coalition, created and staffed a Facebook Live educational panel with doctors and lawyers to answer questions on how to prevent the spread of the coronavirus and the implications of the public charge rule. In the wake of the COVID-19 case surge this past fall in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, NOPI, in coalition with the Academy of Medical and Public Health Services and others, hosted virtual town hall events to hear directly from the community. This offered individuals an opportunity to hear updates on local school reopening and testing efforts directly from representatives from the Department of Education and Test and Trace Corps, and gave the local community a public forum to engage directly with city officials on issues of great concern. Most recently, NOPI co-hosted an important conversation hosted by the New York City Department of Health that provided information and answered questions regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. NOPI actively participates in the city's Emergency Partner Engagement Council, addressing the COVID-19 crisis and its impact on our community partners. Your support has also led to increased enrollment by eligible immigrants in state-funded Medicaid. The improved access to Medicaid has had life-changing and often life-saving effects on the lives of our clients. In October of 2020, we expanded our reach and launched on DocuCare TGNCI Plus, a project that aims to break down two major barriers to accessing healthcare. First, lack of immigration status, and second, risk of detention. Following NOPI's holistic approach to accessing healthcare through immigration advocacy, on DocuCare TGNCI Plus provides direct legal services to transgender folks, gender nonconforming folks, and intersex folks. Um, I see I'm running short on time. So I just wanted to emphasize, you know, thank you Chairperson Stephen Levin and the committee members for giving us the opportunity to present this testimony today and for this tremendous assistance. And we ask that the funding continue into fiscal year 2022 for the Immigrant Health Initiative um, for Thanks, NOPI Scott. and for our partners. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. We will now go back to Ron, if you're able. I am able. Okay. Can you hear me? I begin. Great. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Chairman Levin and members of the committee. My name is Ron Rasmussen, and I'm the Executive Director of Legal Services NYC. Our staff of 600 advocates and support staff fights poverty by providing free civil legal services to more than 110,000 New Yorkers every year. This pandemic has stripped New York City families and children of their jobs, their incomes, their education, their health, and in all too many cases, their lives. Most tragically, this crisis has highlighted the compounding impacts that systemic racism and endemic poverty have on the communities we serve. Financial impacts, health impacts, and education impacts have all fallen disproportionately and devastatingly on communities of color. To add insult to injury, many of our clients have been unable to access or use the very technologies that would enable them to apply for public benefits or access their remote learning classes. Since mid-March, when we closed the doors to our 16 offices, our staff have worked to help our clients get and keep the benefits and services they desperately need to meet their most basic needs, food, healthcare, cash assistance, safety, and shelter that's safe and affordable. We've educated and represented thousands of New Yorkers to help them get unemployment benefits. We're helping kids with special needs get the educational services they need so they don't fall further behind. 
Our immigration advocates are making sure our clients don't get deported or lose their rights to legal status. Our housing and foreclosure advocates are fighting illegal evictions and predatory lending scams. And our family law advocates are helping survivors of domestic violence who can't find the privacy from their batterer to make the calls needed to find safety. That's why it's critical for the council to increase funding for the broad range of services that we provide through the Legal Services for Low Income New Yorkers program. In fiscal year 21, with the pandemic raging, the impact on the state and local economy potentially devastating, and no end in sight, we fully understood the need to cut back on our funding, as you had to do for so many others. But with significant federal funding soon to arrive, we ask that you reverse that cut and restore funding for the Legal Services for Low Income New Yorkers program to fiscal year 20 level of 6.3 million. We also ask that you restore funding for Legal Services NYC's Veterans Justice Program to $150,000, also a return to fiscal year 2020 levels. And finally, one of the most devastating impacts of the pandemic, because it is potentially life altering in the long term, is the way New York City's children's educations have been adversely hurt. We're working hard to address these issues and ask that you provide $500,000 to support our Access to Education project, which will deliver legal services designed to help children catch up and keep up with their educations so that they are not left struggling by this pandemic. These services will help kids with special needs and disabilities, will provide language access advocacy for English language learner students and their limited English proficient parents, and will work with the schools to implement restorative healing programs so that children who've been traumatized by sexual harassment or violence in the schools can be responded to with measures that are supportive and not punitive. We'll be testifying this at the Education Committee hearing next week, but I wanted to raise it with you here because there's nothing more important to our city's welfare than the education of, your, of our children. Thanks for your continued support. We look forward to our continued work together in this moment of greatest challenge. Thank you very much for your testimony, Ron. We will now go to Leslie Throp. Leslie, you may begin when prompted by the sergeant. Clock is ready. Good afternoon and thank you Chair Levin and the committee and staff for taking the time to hear our testimony. My name is Leslie Throp and I am the Executive Director of Housing Conservation Coordinators, one of the five members of the Legal Services for the Working Poor Coalition that includes Campbell Legal Services, Mobilization for Justice, NIMIC, and Take Root Justice. The coalition was created 17 years ago with the support of the city council to address the civil legal needs of working poor and other low income New Yorkers whose income is slightly higher than the poorest New Yorkers, thus rendering them ineligible for free, free legal services, yet they are often are one missed paycheck away from facing eviction or other dire consequences. Legal services for the working poor services are critical in allowing working New Yorkers to maintain financial independence and preserving economic stability in communities across New York City. In fiscal year 20, the, the initiative was funded at 3,205,000 from the city council with each of the five coalition members receiving $455,000. That was cut last year, uh, reduced in the time of, co of the COVID-19 fiscal crisis, by approximately 15%. Working poor New Yorkers who often barely make ends meet can face catastrophic consequences as a, result, as a result of a civil legal problem, such as not being paid for their work or not being paid over time, identity theft, the freezing of bank accounts as a result of collection lawsuits they don't even know about or being denied public benefits in which they are entitled. The consequence of these problems can lead to other problems, including increased risk of eviction or foreclosure. These working New Yorkers can end up spiraling downward to join the ranks of the poor if they do not have access to lawyers to assist them. Our legal services organizations represent these New Yorkers in all five boroughs in housing, consumer, foreclosure, immigration benefits, and employment matters in state appellate and federal courts and other various administrative agencies. As a result of the COVID-19 crisis, working poor New Yorkers have and will continue to disproportionately face legal problems in unprecedented numbers. Even before the COVID-19 crisis, tens of thousands of New Yorkers were hanging on by a thread to their homes, their families, their well-being, and their dignity. As the crisis is laid bare, neighborhoods of color and immigrant communities across the city have been especially hit hard by health and economic disparities. 
The crisis has resulted in unprecedented problems related to unemployment insurance, as well as workplace safety concerns, issuing of stimulus payments, price gouging and scams, and has caused many New Yorkers to incur unexpected debt, which will mean an increase in debt collection litigation and for some bankruptcy. These working poor who are adversely affected will need members of our coalition to advise them, help them navigate various complex legal processes and fight their legal battles by representing them. Let me provide you with just a few examples of the real clients that, that um, we serve with this critical funding. Um, I'll just give you a few. There's more, in, uh, more examples in the written testimony. Client CJ is a 47-year-old Nepali man who works and resides in the Elmhurst section of Queens. He arrived in the US in 2016 through the Mexican border seeking asylum from a dangerous political climate in India. He was detained by ICE for six months in a detention center. And during this time there, he was given a phone number by other detainees to call for bond assistance. He contacted that company called Libre by Nexus and paid $15,000, who paid a $15,000 bond to ICE for his release. As a condition of his release, he had to wear a Nexus sponsored GPS bracelet and pay a non-refundable $4,500 fee for, um, as a result of them paying off the bond. He was told that he had to pay $420 a month to Nexus as a fee for the GPS bracelet and to continue to wear that GPS bracelet until he paid off the $15,000. He diligently paid and in uh, 2017, he paid the debt in full. His asylum application was approved in October, 2018, which signaled the return of the bond money and subsequently the return of the $15,000. Um, money that he would use to continue to build his life in New York City with his new status. They had him sign a refund authorization form, which he promptly did and returned to them. It, they said it would take 90 to 120 days for a refund. This was in 2018. Two years later, he had not received that funding, that money. In November, he came to um, take root justice and they were handling his matter uh, with, with the goal of getting his $15,000 returned to him promptly. Another example, just one last example. In September, 2020, in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, Mr. S, a 56 year old man sought assistance from housing conservation coordinators to return to the apartment he was illegally locked out of in the midst of a crisis just two days after the death of his term, terminally ill mother. He had been living in the apartment with his mother and was her primary caretaker. Upon the lockout, Mr. S filed a pro se order to show cause. And after sleeping in his car for two days while trying to plan his mother's funeral, he was convinced by the landlord mm -hmm. to enter an agreement surrendering the rights to the apartment in exchange for letting him back in the apartment to retrieve his belongings and address to bury his mother in. HCC filed a motion to vacate the stipulation and judgment and successfully ne negotiated a settlement vacating the stipulation and returning him to the same posture he had before the illegal lockout. These are the clients we serve with life-threatening problems. This council's funding for legal services for the working poor is the only funding that specifically targets the civil legal needs of working people to ensure continued self-sufficiency for families struggling to survive in New York City. We ask that you um, restore the funding to the, 21, to the 21 levels, to the 20 levels which we had received as we consider the choices that we will have to make in representing uh, the working poor. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie, for your testimony. Before we get to the last member of this group, I want to announce the next panel for their awareness. We have Jen Kwok, Elaine Rita, and Yasmin Harris for our next panel. Um, before we get there, though, we have Kevin Jones. Kevin, you can begin when prompted by the sergeant. Clock is ready. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Levin and members of the City Council Committee on General Welfare. My name is Kevin Jones, and I'm the Associate State Director of Advocacy for AARP New York representing 750,000 members of the 50 plus community in New York City. I wanna thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to testify today. Over the course of the past decade, New York City's population of older adults has become one of the fastest growing demographics in New York City. According to the Center for Urban Future, there are 1.7 million residents in New York City above age 60. Among that group, 
141,000 residents are above age 85, over 136,000 individuals are homebound, and nearly one in five are living below the federal poverty line. As aging residents continue to make up a greater share of the city's total population in the coming years, the city will need to pay more attention to the needs and livelihoods of this group. All of us at this hearing already know the COVID-19 pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on the health and well-being of New York City's aging community and has created new and unprecedented challenges for the livelihoods of the 50 plus, of 50 plus New Yorkers. Throughout the pandemic, AARP has heard countless stories from older adults who have struggled to access meals and groceries, healthcare and caregiving services, broadband and other programming opportunities that reduce social isolation and help them through the crisis. As New York begins to enter the recovery phase of the pandemic in the months ahead, the city will be required to address a number of looming challenges, especially in the areas of housing stability, rental arrears, employment opportunities, and access to vital social services. AARP New York calls on the city to make the following investments into critical social services, uh, so social service programs that will protect the well-being of older adults, as well as ensure the 50 plus, that 50 plus New Yorkers can age with dignity in their communities all across New York City. First, AARP New York encourages the city to expand funding for the HR, for HRA administered programs that protect the well-being of vulnerable adults, specifically the community guardian, uh, guardianship program, adult protective services, and the home care services program. As the demand for these critical services has increased over the pandemic, the city needs to ensure that senior providers are properly supported and have the staffing levels needed to meet the increase in demand for services, as well as guarantee that more aging residents can receive services and continue living in their communities safely after the pandemic concludes. Second, we recommend that the city increase funding for the Right to Counsel program in order to protect 50 plus New Yorkers from the threat of evictions and displacement. As the status and timeline of New York's eviction moratorium remains unclear, the city needs to ensure that all New Yorkers who have fallen behind on their rent as a result of the pandemic have access to a lawyer in the event that they're brought to housing court in the coming months. Given that right to counsel has been proven to be an effective tool in addressing New York City's eviction crisis, the, the city should continue to invest more resources into the program in order to keep New Yorkers in their homes and prevent a massive wave of evictions in the year ahead. Third, we urge the city to maintain full funding for the construction of new units of supportive housing. Although the city's funding alloca uh, allocated for the creation of new units of supporting housing has been threatened by budget cuts throughout this pandemic, uh, we believe it's imperative for the city to continue this investment. And lastly, we call on uh, uh, the city to maintain full funding for all HR administered housing voucher and rental assistance programs. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify today and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Kevin, for your testimony. We will now go to our next panel. Our first panelist will be Jin Kwok. Jin, you can begin when prompted by the sergeant. Kwok is ready. Good afternoon, committee chairs. My name is Jin Kwok, and I'm an outreach worker for LGBTQ people of the sex trades for the New York City Anti-Violence Project, also known as AVP. AVP empowers lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and HIV-affected communities and allies to end all forms of violence through organizing, education, counseling, and advocacy. Yesterday at the public safety hearing, my colleagues spoke about how resources must be diverted from policing to support services for sex workers. Today, I am advocating for resources to continue to go to the important work that AVP does with the LGBTQ people in the sex trades. LGBTQ people, especially trans, gender nonconforming, and non-binary people, disproportionately participate in the sex trades by choice, circumstance, and coercion. LGBTQ youth in the New York City in New York City enter the sex trades at seven to eight times the rate of their cisgender and heterosexual peers. Nearly 40% of Black trans respondents in a national survey said that they have participated in the sex trades. Many LGBTQ sex workers are also survivors of violence. Poverty, criminalization, and stigma make LGBTQ people in the sex trades extremely vulnerable to violence. Since the COVID-19 pandemic, many LGBTQ people in the sex trades have lost work and have seen an increase in violence against them in person and on the streets during this pandemic. AVP supports survivors of violence with services that attend to emotional, legal, and social needs as they heal from violence and develop strategies to move forward. As an outreach worker at AVP, I have, I have deep roots in this community and work with LGBTQ sex workers in connecting them to services and resources. This work is important because this community is hyper-criminalized and already lacks resources. 
People in the sex trades need resources such as legal services, housing services, medical services, childcare services, and other important and other support and resources. We at AVP strive to offer free social services to LGBTQ sex workers, which includes legal services, counseling services, and connects to other resources. We know the city is in a challenging financial position, but we strongly urge the city council to restore the funding to a fiscal year to at fiscal year 2020 levels. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen, for your testimony. We will now go to Elaine Rita. Elaine, you can begin when prompted by the sergeant. Um, I begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, committee chairs. My name is Elaine Rita Mendes, and I'm a community member of the New York City Antiviolence Project. As you know, AVP empowers lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and HIV affected communities and allies to end all forms of violence through organizing, education, counseling, and advocacy. Generally, and especially this past year though, homeless New Yorkers have been left out of conversations when it comes to offering resources that are accessible and that offer long-term impact on their lives. New York City is facing a problem of growing homelessness crisis that is getting worse as the pandemic winds down and the eviction moratoriums put in place by the state face their end. Our city and state have been on their knees praying to the golden calf of real estate for years now. Gentrification has been consistently ignored and many neighborhoods are being cleared out of local residents while landlords can sit on property and speculate value. Our shelter system is notorious as a place of violence, so much so that many choose to exploit the MTA and use it as a rolling homeless shelter. The transit workers, community, commuters, and law enforcement officers of our city are not mental health professionals and they are not equipped for handling this situation. I'd like to underscore that the LGBTQ plus community, especially trans people, are especially vulnerable to homelessness. For many in our community, New York City is a place that is a beacon and hope in a sea of doubt. As a formerly homeless transgender woman, I was warned very early on to avoid DHS shelters. And I knew many who felt safer in private facilities or on a rattling subway car. New York City needs to work for New Yorkers, regardless of their income bracket. We need more shelter spaces prioritized specifically for LGBTQ people that are immediate and permanent. And we need some designated, sorry, stop forcing our transit workers to moonlight as social workers. Our police are not therapists and our residents are not caregivers. If you feel that this is a burdensome request, perhaps now is the time that City Hall will finally stop giving handouts to developers and landlords. We have a crisis that is waiting to boil over further. As soon as these eviction moratoriums end that have been put in place by Albany, many tenants will be evicted. Therefore, it is imperative that City Hall works to not only provide safe shelters, it must work to provide actual and affordable housing. Stop giving the real estate cartel all that it asks for. I yield my time. Thank you very much for your testimony, Elaine. Before we get to our last panelist of this group, I would like to announce the next batch of panelists. We have next up Bill Bacalini, Lakshmi Sanuganathan, Becca Asaki, and Mon Yuk Yu. Before we get to our next group of panelists, we have Yasmin Harris. Yasmin, you can begin when prompted by the sergeant. Ak is ready. Good afternoon, committee chairs and members. My name is Yasmin Harris, and I am a community member of the New York City Anti-Violence Project. ABP empowers lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and HIV-affected communities and allies to end all forms of violence through organizing, education, counseling, and advocacy. Today, I am advocating for more resources to go to address violence against our community. Many forms of violence are increasing during the pandemic, including hate violence. Violence against LGBTQ New Yorkers has not stopped during the pandemic. In fact, 2020 was one of the deadliest years for hate violence against the trans, gender non-conforming, and non-binary community, especially Black trans women. Yet in the middle of the pandemic last year, the council cut the hate violence prevention initiative despite rising violence against Black, Brown, Asian, and LGBTQIA plus communities. The initiative focused on community-based approaches to building safety, including rapid response mobilization after violent incidents, community education, community reporting, and bystander intervention training. 
having many community members and friends and loved ones being affected by hate violence. I understand the importance of this initiative and its necessity to help combat hate violence that my community faces. Many of our communities do not, members do not feel safe going to the police when they face violence. We need to be diverting and reinvesting the NYPD's enormous $6 billion budget, especially eliminating the $18 million budget for vice to fund community-based solutions. That's why it is important to have alternative safety approaches like the Hate Crime Prevention Initiative that fund organizations like AVP to build safe ways to report and mobilize members to combat hate violence in the community. We know the city is in a challenging financial position, but we strongly urge the city council to restore this funding to a fiscal year 2020 level. We, ap we appreciate past support and look forward to working with you. And thank you. Thank you, Yasmin and this whole panel for your testimony. We will now go to our next group of panelists, beginning with Bill Baccalini. Bill, you can begin when prompted. The clock is ready. Mr. Baccalini, we do not hear you. You're still muted. You have to accept the okay. there you go. Um, Chair 11, committee members, thank you for this opportunity. I am testifying today as president and CEO of the New York Foundling. But 20 years ago, I was looking at these issues from a different perspective as director of planning and policy development for the State Office of Children and Family Services. What we were seeing back then was a system that had been in place for years that was not producing the results we all wanted. There were too many children in foster care, too many adolescents caught up in the juvenile justice system, too many families torn apart, too many communities suffering. We believe that if we changed our approach and pushed resources into preventive services, we would have a better shot at moving the needle and getting better results for children and families. I am proud to say that I was the lead architect and led the development of a new funding formula, ultimately approved by the legislature, through which the state would match local spending at 65 cents on the dollar for preventive services. Our intent and hope was that this enhanced state share would incentivize localities to spend more on preventive, and it worked. The change still in place today marked the beginning of a major shift toward preventive services. Now, looking back, we now looking back, we find that um, if we had predicted that the number of children in foster care in the city of New York could be reduced by more than 80 percent, people would have shaken their heads and called this unrealistic. But that is exactly what has happened with the foster care population having dropped from a high of 50,000 in the 1990s to as low as 7,000 today. And it's been done by strengthening families, strengthening communities, keeping kids in their homes and getting them the support they need to succeed. Through a comprehensive community and home-based system of preventive services led by the Administration for Children's Services and implemented by not-for-profit agencies, families in New York City are eligible for a range of services including housing support, job training, medical care, therapeutic and treatment services. These programs include safeguards to protect the privacy of the families family seeking assistance. The overwhelming success of ACS's primary preventive services is something New York City should be proud of, particularly the family enrichment centers and community partnerships that are located throughout the five boroughs and are helping to protect children and keep families together. I strongly believe the reduction in spending on preventive services that is currently being proposed in Albany is a serious mistake. These cuts, on top of the cuts made a few years ago to 62 cents on the dollar, will place more children and families at risk. There are thousands of children and families who will undoubtedly go unserved because of a lack of funding. Tens of thousands of children who a generation ago would have been taken from their homes and placed in foster care, possibly for extended periods of time, are now staying in their homes with their family. Tens of thousands of families have benefited from evidence-based therapies that made them stronger, more self-sufficient, and better able to take care of their children. Could we do better? Always. But ACS is always, already working hard to rid the child welfare system of the unconscious preju prejudices that may lead to over-reporting of families of car color. We must remember that our primary mission is to keep children safe and to place their well-being front and center. ACS and its not-for-profit not partners take that mission very seriously and the preventive services they are spearheading have proven most successful. I urge the council to support ACS in this important work. I would be remiss 
if I concluded without mentioning another program, Fair Futures, which is one of the most exciting, game-changing programs I have ever seen. It has the potential to change the trajectory of children's lives using a very simple but effective method, providing a coach and a tutor to every child in foster care beginning in middle school. The 60 ent entities that are part of the Fair Futures, Futures Coalition represent some of the leading organizations and experts in the field. We have accepted for too long that it is okay, even normal, for youth in foster care to drop out of high school, rarely go to college, College and enter adulthood without any of the social supports okay. most of us take for granted. We accepted for too long that poor outcomes are a result of their individual capacity rather than systemic shortcomings. Fair Futures has proven itself. Now we need to expand it to reach more children, and we can only do that by government funding. I strongly urge the council to support fully funding Fair Futures and to make sure that it is baseline in the city's 21-22 budget. Only by doing so will our young people realize we as a city are committed to their successful transition to adulthood and their long-term well-being. Thank you very much for placing this focus on two aspects of our child welfare system that are so crucially important. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you so much for your testimony, Bill. We will now go to our next panelist. Lakshmi Sanmuganathan. Lakshmi, you can begin when prompted by the sergeant. Um, starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Lakshmi Shamaganathan. I am the policy fellow from the Coalition of Asian American Children and Families, CACF. I want to thank you, Chairman Levin and esteemed members of the General Welfare Committee for um, providing us this opportunity to testify at this important hearing today. Since 1986, CACF has been the nation's only pan-Asian children and families advocacy organization. We lead the fight for improved and equitable policies, systems, funding, and services to support our most vulnerable community members. CACF also leads the fight um, for the 15% and growing campaign, which brings together over 45 Asian-led and serving organizations across New York City to advocate for a fair and equitable New York City budget that will protect our most vulnerable APA community members. Our campaign members employ thousands of New Yorkers and serve hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers every single year. The Asian Pacific American population in New York City also comprises over 1.3 million people and more than 15% of New York City's population. We are the fastest growing group in New York City and our population has nearly doubled every single decade since 1970. Unfortunately, current levels of public funding for the Asian Pacific American community remains disproportionate to our community's expansive growth and needs. For example, um, in fiscal year 2021, the Asian land and serving organizations only received a roughly 4.65% of all discretionary dollars and less than 1.5% of all social um, service contract dollars. COVID-19 over the past year has also left a devastating impact on our APA New Yorkers by exacerbating systemic inequities that have already been facing our communities prior to the pandemic, but have only increased and become more challenging during this time. We as Asian Pacific Americans in New York are constantly fighting the harmful impacts of the model minority myth, which presents our community members from being acknowledged and understood. And oftentimes that means that our communities as well as the organizations that serve them uh, lack the resources to provide critical services for those in need. For example, in the past year alone, Asian Americans have experienced the largest increase in joblessness of, of all major racial groups in New York City, with an unemployment rate of nearly 26% as of May of 2020. Nearly 50% of all APAs in New York City are also living in the hardest hit areas during the pandemic. Asian Americans are also two times more likely to test positive for COVID-19 than white patients, yet less likely to be tested at all. And of course, over the past year, we've seen a large increase in anti-Asian related hate crimes. In New York City alone, there's been a 1900% increase in these hate crimes. Um, these statistics are even more painful to acknowledge and speak upon given the recent shooting in Atlanta that took place last night that took the lives of eight women and six of which were Asian American women. As we can see, people in our community are dying, our community is grieving, and we as a community are just trying to survive and stay afloat during this critical time. So with that in mind, we're urging City Council to stand with us in solidarity, to acknowledge our experiences and our strife, and to provide this tangible support by supporting the discretionary asks of Asian-led and certain community-based organizations in order to sustain the critically, culturally competent and linguistically accessible services that we provide to our community members. These services have the most impact on addressing the unique needs of our communities. And during this time, we've seen the need for our community-based organizations to step up and to step in in order to fill gaps in services 
that previously were not available to our community members due to issues of cultural competence and language accessibility. So with that in mind, we're, we're just urging city council to provide us tangible support, tangible support by supporting our discretionary asks in this upcoming budget. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. We will now go to Becca Osaki. Becca, you can begin when prompted by the sergeant. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, and thank you, Chairperson um, Levin and to the committee who's all here. Um, and uh, my name is Becca Asaki, and I am uh, the New York City organizer for NAPOF, that's the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum. Uh, and I'm also here as a part of the 15% and growing campaign that Lakshmi just spoke about. Uh, NAPOF is an organization dedicated to building the power of Asian American and Pacific Islander women, trans and non-binary folks to gain full agency over our lives, our families and our communities using a reproductive justice framework. Um, our New York City chapter is made up of over 100 members from across the five boroughs. And like many members of the AAPI community, we've been hit really hard uh, by both the health and economic crisis caused by COVID-19. Um, but in the face of this crisis and in response to it, NAPOF members began holding community conversations and launched a survey um, in six API languages to reach far beyond our membership to help identify the needs of our community. And from these meetings and the survey um, and individual conversations, we are seeing that many of our community members are desperately seeking life-saving support for food, money, to help cover rent, uh, legal support and information uh, and medical care, but face huge barriers um, like not having someone who speaks their language or can help them navigate applying for these services or helping to understand if they're eligible at all. Um, just to give an example, um, we had a community meeting in Burmese and nearly all of the participants were um, immigrant women who had lost work at restaurants or other service jobs and were struggling to pay rent and feed their families. Um, so many rely on other family members to help them access help but they often didn't know what was available to them, especially in this unprecedented crisis and what they were eligible for. So folks were asking us, is there anything like rent relief? Um, are we eligible for these benefits uh, if they exist? Um, they asked for navigators that can help explain to them in Burmese how to fill out forms for things like food stamps. Um, they, and we're also asking for legal help to be able to do things like drafting a will, because um, as Lakshmi was sharing, our communities have really been devastated um, by this pandemic. Um, you know, uh, the pandemic has meant lost work, dipping into our savings or borrowing money to cover our living expenses, wondering if there is support or if we're eligible uh, for things like Medicaid, rent relief, food stamps, um, and our family members uh, helping out you know, each other and neighbors to navigate these complex systems. Um, COVID-19 has uh, had a devastating impact on the API immigrant New Yorkers uh, by exacerbating the systemic inequities that were already facing our communities prior to the pandemic. But because of language barriers, our community relies heavily on our API um, led and serving organizations to fill these gaps in services. Uh, and so that's why our members are calling for a significant increase investment in API led and serving organizations through discretionary Sounds funding fun. and also key uh, citywide initiatives such as support for our seniors, emergency food, mental health services for vulnerable populations in order to sustain the critical services um, that they provide and including in particular in language outreach and benefits navigation to address the growing need for immigrant New Yorkers um, amid the pandemic. Thanks. Thank you very much for your testimony, Becca. We will now go to the last member of this panel, Mon Yu Kyu. Mon, you can begin when prompted by the sergeant. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Manya Kyu, Executive Vice President at the Academy of Medical and Public Health Services, AMPS. Thank you, Chair Levin, for the opportunity to testify. AMPS is a not-for-profit organization in Sunset Park that works to bridge a health equity gap among communities of color by providing free clinical screenings and bilingual mental health therapy integrated with individualized health education and social services to the immigrant populations of New York City, free of cost in regards of immigration status. We work primarily with undocumented immigrants within the Latino and Chinese communities who suffer high risks of chronic infectious and behavioral health issues due to their lack of health insurance, um, health insurance access, offering wrap around services that address social determinants of health, 
Um, and 83.3% of people in our Santa Park community is low English proficient. Across the city, 78% of the APAs in New York City are foreign born. During COVID-19, our work has become more important than ever, reaching over 400,000 people through our outreach and education efforts. Our community health workers offer interpretation in Spanish, Arabic, and three Chinese dialects to help community members navigate our healthcare and social assistance systems. Every month, we are holding in-language workshops and distributing thousands of pieces of literature to community members and over 100,000 pieces of PPE. Now we are helping 250 to 300 people make appointments for COVID-19 vaccinations every week in their language. And on a weekly basis, our team also distributes 7,500 pounds of food to families struggling with food insecurity, a completely new program area that we have been running for the past year. We're helping community members navigate accessing unemployment and rental arrears assistance through systems that are complicated and often not available in other languages. Ms. Wong is an ESL student who initially came to us for help with her daughter's behavioral issues. She was undocumented and unemployed, did not speak English, and did not qualify for insurance. Because of a tenuous relationship with her daughter and the isolation experience from being undocumented, she had been contemplating under her life. Her our team counseled her, helped her get connected to in-language family therapy services in Chinese, as well as NYC Well. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we have provided Ms. Wong's family with weekly food deliveries, and she is one of the 250 families that received cash assistance from the $150,000 that we distributed to date. She is also attending our adult literacy classes weekly, which, besides serving as an educational space, has become a space for solidarity and support. Our Chinese-speaking community health workers also checks in with her and offers health coaching. We would like to thank the city council for our historical support of our funding through the Immigrant Mental Health Initiative and Adult Literacy Initiative, which have supported this type of work. And I would like to urge the city council to restore funding for both initiatives, which was cut by 15% in FY21. And in particular, advocate for restoring state article six funds, which has been cut from 20% to 10%. Cuts of funding over the past year have been detrimental, while demand for services have tripled. Many of our staff are stressed thin, and unfortunately, we have not been able to hire new staff to meet the demand. Furthermore, we are requesting restoration and funding for mental health services for vulnerable populations to support this work. What has been a mental health stressor in the past has now been exacerbated. And as we, as we previously discussed, Asian communities are feeling the stress of racism and harassment every day when they ride the subway or walk the streets. Anxieties will increase if events like yesterday's painful land of shootings continue to occur. Unemployment and lack of work has also created financial hurdles and fears of eviction. Families with a history of domestic violence are now facing even more tension. And community members experience heightened levels of fear and anxiety and depression with the loss of loved ones and financial instability. We have a waiting list of nearly 100 individuals seeking support from our free mental health services in both Chinese and Spanish, which we cannot be meet with our current funding levels. And we are one of few organizations offering bilingual therapy services and need is high. Um, funding from this past year has meant we weren't able to fund two of our therapist positions and is limiting our ability to conduct outreach to address mental stigma. And currently, this initiative only supports mental services in one agent serving organization, while other organizations doing this work have not been uh, funded for additional increases. Secondly, we urge the City Council to restore and baseline the $12 million in adult literacy funding, expand the digital inclusion and literacy initiative. During the pandemic, our adult literacy classes have served as a lifeline for community members during the pandemic to not only secure the language skills necessary, but as a platform for COVID-19 information and resource dissemination, as well as a community and solidarity and a source for mental support. And this way, even loan device, devices to community members that could not afford to access the internet, which dipped into our reserves. Seeing a new need for knowledge and technology, we have integrated digital literacy classes into our adult literacy curricula, but this is not enough to, uh, without focus funding, given the majority of programming benefits applications are now done in a virtual space. And finally, City Council must restore $5.659 million for emergency food pantries like CBOs, um, that CBOs like AMPS have stood up during the pandemic, which feeds over 1,500 residents every week through donated food boxes, a mobile hot a food unit and food deliveries for homebound individuals that is completely unfunded at this time. We need culturally sensitive produce and staples that our communities feel comfortable eating that can only be met by CBOs that know their communities best. This is not being met by the Get Food program at this time, which often delivers food that does not meet dietary requirements and is not culturally appropriate. Many undocumented community members also feel uncomfortable giving their information to government-run programs. 
I humbly thank the city council for supporting organizations like AMS working on providing the on the ground culturally competent services during this challenging time. And we will look forward to working together to ensure that healthcare is not a privilege, but a basic human right. Thank you. Thank you to this panel for your testimony and your patience. We have now heard from everyone that has signed up to testify. We appreciate your time, your testimony, and your presence here today. If we have inadvertently missed anyone that would like to testify, please use the raise hand function in Zoom and I will call on you in the order of hands raised. Okay. I see Terry Lawson. Terry, you can begin when prompted by the sergeant. Time starts now. Good afternoon, and my name is Terry Lawson. I am the executive director of Unlocal. Unlocal is a community-centered nonprofit organization that provides direct community education, outreach, and legal representation to New York City's undocumented immigrant communities. I'm also the co-founder and steering committee member of the Bronx Immigration Partnership, a coordinated safety net of legal and social services providers assisting Bronx residents with their immigration related needs. I'm here today to ask the city council to expand funding for immigration legal services, community education, outreach and organizing. Unlocal provides free high quality legal services for New York's most vulnerable immigrants, many of whom are essential workers or ineligible for benefits who are seeking employment authorization, asylum, DACA, SIG, lawful permanent residency, relief from, from removal, and much more. Last year, our legal team handled 1,000 cases for people across New York City and in parts of Long Island and upstate. Our Queer Immigrant Justice Project works with LGBTQ plus immigrants who are seeking asylum, and the director of that project was just named one of the best LGBTQ plus lawyers under 40 by the National LGBT Bar Association. Unlocal is also part of the Rapid Response Legal Collaborative, along with Make the Road New York and NILAG, and the lawyers, paralegal, and social worker who serve on our rapid response team have been fighting tireless, tirelessly during this pandemic to stop deportations and get people out of de detention where their physical and mental health are threatened every day. Our rapid response work shows us just how entangled ICE and law enforcement are and continue to be despite the efforts of advocates and community members to explain to this city's lawmakers how local policing feeds the deportation pipeline. We have been raising the alarm about the dangers and continued harms of city officials collaborating with ICE by telling the story of one of our clients, Javier Castillo Maradiaga, a 27-year-old Bronx man who came here when he was seven years old, was turned over to ICE by this city, and after tireless community organizing and legal strategizing, was finally released from ICE custody one week ago today. Over the past year, our education and outreach team has been busier than ever, partnering with 140 community-based organizations and schools throughout the city, hosting monthly partner calls on rapidly changing law and policy, conducting 68 community events, 47 of which were virtual, that reached 8,000 attendees, and posting online resources in wide-ranging topics such as DACA, stimulus relief, unemployment, taxes, the census, and more. Unlocal recognizes that only by providing accurate, up-to-date information are we able to counteract the predatory practices of those taking advantage of the confusion and anti-immigrant rhetoric pervading our culture. Under the new administration, laws and policies continue to change at a dizzying pace, and our education and outreach team keeps the public informed about these changes and their impacts on immigrant New Yorkers. In an era where the Biden administration continues to deport people, I'm sorry. With 70 removal flights in February alone, detaining asylum seekers in so-called migrant facilities and simultaneously increasing avenues for affirmative immigration relief, Unlocal calls on the city council to expand funding for immigration legal services and community education, and specifically ask the city council to enhance funding for the Immigration Opportunities Initiative to allow additional legal services providers to partner with the city council to provide vital services for our clients and community members. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Um, I'm going to do one last call um, using the Zoom raise hand function. If there's anyone that we inadvertently missed, please raise your hand now and we'll make sure to get to you. Okay, seeing no one else, I would like to note that written testimony, which will be reviewed in full by committee staff can be submitted to the record up to 72 hours after the close of this hearing 
by emailing it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Chair Levin, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, I want to thank you, um, uh, Aminta Kilowan, Crystal Pond, um, finance staff, uh, Frank Sarno, Julia Haramis, uh, Daniel Krupp, Dohini Sampora, uh, uh, Regina Pareto Ryan, uh, our, our um, finance director, Latanya McKinney, um, and uh, members of the administration who testified, and, um, and especially members of the public who testified. Um, uh, this is uh, my eighth and final preliminary budget hearing chairing the General Welfare Committee. Um, this is every year the most important hearing we do um, out of this committee. This is the hearing that um, we get um, the most in-depth um, picture of what social services are looking like in our city. Right now we are um, you know, facing um, a, a challenge that uh, 13 months ago was absolutely unimaginable. Um, and um, this has been um, a year filled with um, tragedy and sorrow um, and grief. Um, tens, tens of thousands of New Yorkers have lost their lives. Um, uh, many, many thousands more have lost loved ones. Um, uh, we have seen and we continue to see um, our fellow New Yorkers succumb to this virus. Um, and I want to encourage everybody to continue to be safe, um, continue to social distance and mask up. Um, the variants that are out there right now are, are scary. Um, uh, just, just in the last few days, I've seen um, a number of colleagues and, and uh, candidates for council and, and council staffers uh, have, have fallen ill with, with COVID. And so um, uh, be aware out there and, and make sure to continue your social distancing. Um, and, um, you know, this is, again, it's, this is, uh, I always feel the most informative uh, hearing that we do every year because um, it is a snapshot of what we've been able to do, but more importantly, what we could be doing better. And, um, and, and it's, it's always a, a time to rededicate ourselves to the important work that you all do um, in the communities day in and day out. Um, and so I commend everybody uh, that participated today. Uh, I thank you. Um, and um, one last thing, um, you know, the, the, in the last week or so, we've heard a number of times that um, the American Rescue Plan um, Act um, is is changing. Um, you know, it's changing. It's the most impactful piece of legislation coming out of the federal government in a generation. That's that's true, um, 100%. Um, uh, just the um, the ITC uh, uh, change alone will be bringing. Um, tens and th tens of thousands of children, um, hundreds of thousands of children out of out of poverty in New York City and across the country. But the but we have this opportunity in our city um, to utilize uh, the American Rescue Plan funding um, to have a huge impact locally above uh, above those kind of direct actions from the federal government. But be through the state and local aid, we have this opportunity to make sure that that funding goes to the people that need it. And um, I'm very grateful to my colleagues in Congress for, uh, for their uh, uh, delivering that funding to New York City. Um, but now is this, uh, we absolutely can have, must get this right. And um, we need to make sure that um, we're delivering funding to um, expand services, um, for legal services or children's services, um, homeless services, um, making sure that it gets to the people that need it because um, we are gonna recover as a city, but that recover, recovery has to be equitable. 
and it can't be, um, you know, we can't be leaving people behind. And so um, that's going to take a lot of work and, and it's going to take a lot of work for, uh, by the people who are testifying at this hearing today. Um, and, and I, you know, and I, I thank you for that. And I, I, I'm here with you 100%. Um, and again, I want to thank uh, staff. I want to thank the sergeants uh, at arms for, um, and, and all of the council staff that, that get, that, that have um, Joanna Castro and, um, and Rebecca Chasen, uh, who, who have these Zoom hearings, um, have got it down to a, a science. Um, it's been um, remarkable, the work that they've done. So, um, and thank you, Natalie, for, uh, for, for, um, uh, uh, for directing this hearing. Uh, and thank you to Minta as well for directing the, the earlier part of the hearing. And, um, and with that, um, I adjourn the preliminary budget hearing for fiscal year 2021 in the General Welfare Committee.